Chapter twenty of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter twenty Tact or Common Sense. Who is stronger than thou? asked Braham, and Force replied, Address. Victor Hugo. Address makes opportunities. The want of it gives them. Bovee. He'll suit his bearing to the hour. Laugh, listen, learn, or teach. Eliza Cook. A man who knows the world will not only make the most of everything he does know, but of many things he does not know, and will gain more credit by his adroit mode of hiding his ignorance than the pedant by his awkward attempt to exhibit his erudition. Colton The art of using moderate abilities to advantage wins praise, and often acquires more reputation than actual brilliancy. Roach for cold Tact clinches the bargain, sails out of the bay, gets the vote in the Senate, spite of Webster or Clay. I never will surrender to a nigger, said a Confederate officer, when a colored soldier chased and caught him. Very sorry, massa, said the negro, leveling his rifle. Must kill you den. Ain't time to go back and get a white man. The officer surrendered. When God endowed human beings with brains, says Montesquieu, he did not intend to guarantee them. When Abraham Lincoln was running for the legislature the first time, on the platform of the improvement of the Sangamon River, he went to secure the votes of thirty men who were cradling a wheat field. They asked no questions about internal improvements but only seemed curious to know whether he had muscle enough to represent them in the legislature. Lincoln took up a cradle and led the gang around the field. The whole thirty voted for him. "'I do not know how it is,' said Napoleon, in surprise, to his cook. "'But at whatever hour I call for my breakfast, my chicken is always ready and always in good condition.' This seemed to him the more strange, because sometimes he would breakfast at eight, and at other times as late as seven. Sire, said the cook, the reason is that every quarter of an hour I put a fresh chicken down to roast, so that your majesty is sure always to have it at perfection. Talent in this age is no match for tact. We see its failure everywhere. Tact will manipulate one talent so as to get more out of it in a lifetime than ten talents will accomplish without it. Talent lies abed till noon. Tact is up at six. Talent is power. Tact is skill. Talent knows what to do. Tact knows how to do it. Talent is something, but tact is everything. It is not a sixth sense but it is like the life of all the five. It is the open eye, the quick ear, the judging taste, the keen smell and lively touch. It is the interpreter of all riddles, the surmounter of all difficulties, the remover of all obstacles. The world is full of theoretical, one-sided, impractical men who have turned all the energies of their lives into one faculty until they have developed not a full-orbed symmetrical man, but a monstrosity, while all their other faculties have atrophied and died. We often call these one-sided men geniuses, and the world excuses their impractical and almost idiotic conduct in most matters, because they can perform one kind of work that no one else can do as well. A merchant is excused if he is a giant in merchandise though he may be an imbecile in the drawing-room. Adam Smith could teach the world economy in his Wealth of Nations, 
but he could not manage the finances of his own household. Many great men are very impractical, even in the ordinary affairs of life. Isaac Newton could read the secret of creation, but, tired of rising from his chair to open the door for a cat and her kitten, he had two holes cut through the panels for them to pass at will, a large hole for the cat and a small one for the kitten. Beethoven was a great musician, but he sent three hundred florins to pay for six shirts and a half a dozen handkerchiefs. He paid his tailor as large a sum in advance, and yet he was so poor at times that he had only a biscuit and a glass of water for dinner. He did not know enough of business to cut the coupon from a bond when he wanted money, but sold the whole instrument. Dean Swift nearly starved in a country parish where his more practical classmate Stafford became rich. One of Napoleon's marshals understood military tactics as well as his chief, but he did not know men so well and lacked the other's skill and tact. Napoleon might fall, but like a cat he would fall upon his feet. For his argument in the Florida case, a fee of one thousand dollars in crisp new bills of large denomination was handed to Daniel Webster as he sat reading in his library. The next day he wished to use some of the money, but could not find any of the bills. Years afterward, as he turned the page of a book, he found a bank bill without a crease on it. On turning the next leaf, he found another, and so on, until he took the whole amount lost from the places where he had deposited them thoughtlessly, as he read. Learning of a new issue of gold pieces at the treasury, he directed his secretary, Charles Landman, to obtain several hundred dollars' worth. A day or two after, he put his hand in his pocket for one, but they were all gone. Webster was at first puzzled, but on reflection remembered that he had given them away, one by one, to friends who seemed to appreciate their beauty. A professor in mathematics in a New England college, a bookworm, was asked by his wife to bring home some coffee. "'How much will you have?' asked the merchant. "'Well, I declare, my wife did not say. But I guess a bushel will do.' Many a great man has been so absent-minded at times as to seem to void of common sense. "'The professor is not at home,' said his servant who looked out of a window in the dark and failed to recognize Lessing when the latter knocked at his own door in a fit of absent-mindedness. "'Oh, very well,' replied Lessing. "'No matter. I'll call it another time.'" Louis Philippe said he was the only sovereign in Europe fit to govern, for he could black his own boots. The world is full of men and women apparently splendidly endowed and highly educated, yet who can scarcely get a living. Not long ago, three college graduates were found working on a sheep farm in Australia, one from Oxford, one from Cambridge, and the other from a German university. College men tending brutes. Trained to lead men, they drove sheep. The owner of the farm was an ignorant, coarse sheep raiser. He knew nothing of books or theories, but he knew sheep. His three hired graduates could speak foreign languages and discuss theories of political economy and philosophy, but he could make money. He could talk about nothing but sheep and farm, but he had made a fortune, while the college men could scarcely get a living. Even the university could not supply common sense. It was culture against ignorance the college against the ranch, and the ranch beat every time. Do not expect too much from books. Bacon said that studies teach not their own use, but that there is a practical wisdom without them, one by observation. The use of books must be found outside their own lids. It was said of a great French scholar. He was drowned in his talents. Over culture without practical experience, 
weakens a man and unfits him for real life. Book education alone tends to make a man too critical, too self-conscious, timid, distrustful of his abilities, too fine for the mechanical drudgery of practical life, too highly polished, and too finely cultured for everyday use. The culture of books and colleges refines, yet it is often but an ethical culture, and is gained at the cost of vigor and rugged strength. Book culture alone tends to paralyze the practical faculties. The bookworm loses his individuality. His head is filled with theories and saturated with other men's thoughts. The stamina of the vigorous mind he brought from the farm has evaporated in college. And when he graduates, he is astonished to find that he has lost the power to grapple with men and things, and is therefore outstripped in the race of life by the boy who has had no chance, but who, in the fierce struggle for existence, has developed hard common sense and practical wisdom. The college graduate often mistakes his crutches for strength. He inhabits an ideal realm, where common sense rarely dwells. The world cares little for his theories or his encyclopedic knowledge. The cry of the age is for practical men. We have been among you several weeks, said Columbus to the Indian chiefs, and, although at first you treated us like friends, you are now jealous of us and are trying to drive us away. You brought us food in plenty every morning, but now you bring very little and the amount is less with each succeeding day. The great spirit is angry with you for not doing as you agreed in bringing us provisions. To show his anger, he will cause the sun to be in darkness. He knew that there was to be an eclipse of the sun, and told the day and hour it would occur. But the Indians did not believe him, and continued to reduce the supply of food. On the appointed day the sun rose without a cloud, and the Indians shook their heads, beginning to show signs of open hostility, as the hours passed without a shadow on the face of the sun. But at length a dark spot was seen on one margin, and, as it became larger, the natives grew frantic and fell prostrate before Columbus to entreat for help. He retired to his tent, promising to save them if possible. About the time for the eclipse to pass away, he came out and said that the great spirit had pardoned them, and would soon drive away the monster from the sun, if they would never offend him again. They readily promised, and when the sun had passed out of the shadow they leaped and danced and sang for joy. Thereafter the Spaniards had all the provisions they needed. Common sense, said Wendell Phillips, bows to the inevitable and makes use of it. When Caesar stumbled in landing on the beach of Britain, he instantly grasped a handful of sand and held it aloft as a signal of triumph, hiding forever from his followers the ill omen of his threatened fall. Goethe, speaking of some comparisons that had been instituted between himself and Shakespeare, said, Shakespeare always hits the right nail on the head at once, but I have to stop and think which is the right nail before I hit. It has been said that a few pebbles from a brook in the sling of a David, who knows how to send them to the mark, are more effective than a Goliath's spear and a Goliath's strength with a Goliath's clumsiness. Get ready for the redskins! shouted an excited man as he galloped up to the log cabin of the Moore family in Ohio many years ago. And give me a fresh horse as soon as you can. They killed a family down the river last night, and nobody knows where they'll turn up next. What shall we do? asked Mrs. Moore, with a pale face. My husband went away yesterday to buy our winter supplies, and will not be back until morning. Husband away? Whew! That's bad. Well, shut up as tight as you can. Cover up your fire, and don't strike a light tonight. 
Then, springing upon the horse the boys had brought, he galloped away to warn other settlers. Mrs. Moore carried the younger children to the loft of the cabin, and left Obed and Joe to watch, reluctantly yielding the post of danger to them at their urgent request. "'They're coming, Joe!' whispered Obed, early in the evening, as he saw several shadows moving across the fields. "'Stand by that window with the axe, while I get the rifle pointed at this one!' Opening the bullet pouch, he took out a ball, but nearly fainted as he found it was too large for the rifle. His father had taken the wrong pouch. Obed felt around to see if there were any smaller balls in the cupboard, and almost stumbled over a very large pumpkin, one of the two which he and Joe had been using to make jack-o'-lanterns when the messenger alarmed them. Pulling off his coat, he flung it over the vegetable lantern, made to imitate a gigantic grinning face with open eyes, nose, and mouth, and with a live coal from the ashes, he lighted the candle inside. "'I'll sound the war-whoop in a minute, if I give them time,' he whispered, as he raised the covered lantern to the window. "'Now for it,' he added, pulling the coat away. An unearthly yell greeted the appearance of the grinning monster, and the Indians fled wildly to the woods. "'Quick, Joe, light up the other one! "'Don't you see that's what scared him so?' demanded Obed, and at the appearance of the second fiery face, the savages gave a final yell and vanished in the forest. Mr. Moore and Daylight came together, but the Indians did not return. Thurlow Weed earned his first quarter by carrying a trunk on his back from a sloop in New York Harbor to a Broad Street Hotel. He had very few chances such as are now open to the humblest boy, but he had tact and intuition. He could read men as an open book and mould them to his will. He was unselfish. By three presidents whom his tact and shrewdness had helped to elect, he was offered the English mission and scores of other important positions, but he invariably declined. Lincoln selected Weed to attempt the reconciliation of the New York Herald, which had a large circulation in Europe, and was creating a dangerous public sentiment abroad and at home by its articles in sympathy with the Confederacy. Though Weed and Bennett had not spoken to each other before for thirty years, the very next day after their interview, the Herald became a strong Union paper. Weed was then sent to Europe to counteract the pernicious influence of secession agents. The Emperor of France favored the South. He was very indignant because Charleston Harbor had been blockaded, thus shutting off French manufacturers from large supplies of cotton. But Weed's rare tact modified his views and induced him to change to friendliness the tone of a hostile speech prepared for delivery at the National Assembly. England was working night and day preparing for war when Weed arrived upon the scene, and soon changed largely the current of public sentiment. On his return to America, the city of New York extended public thanks to him for his inestimable services. He was equally successful in business, and acquired a fortune of a million dollars. "'Tell me the breadth of this stream,' said Napoleon to his chief engineer, as they came to a bridgeless river which the army had to cross. "'Sire, I cannot. My scientific instruments are with the army, and we are ten miles ahead of it.' "'Measure the width of this stream instantly. "'Sire, be reasonable.' Ascertain at once the width of this river, or you shall be deposed. The engineer drew the cap piece of his helmet down until the edge seemed just in line between his eye and the opposite bank. Then, holding himself carefully erect, he turned on his heel and noticed where the edge seemed to touch the bank on which he stood, which was on the same level as the other. He paced the distance to the point last noted and said, this is the approximate width of the stream. He was promoted. Mr. Webster, said the mayor of a western city, 
when it was learned that the great statesman, although weary with travel, would be delayed for an hour by a failure to make close connections. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. James, one of our most distinguished citizens. How do you do, Mr. James? asked Webster mechanically, as he glanced at a thousand people waiting to take his hand. The truth is, Mr. Webster, replied Mr. James in a most lugubrious tone, I am not very well. I hope nothing serious is the matter, thundered the godlike Daniel in a tone of anxious concern. Well, I don't know that, Mr. Webster. I think it's rheumatiz, but my wife... Mr. Webster, this is Mr. Smith, broke in the mayor, leaving poor Mr. James to enjoy his bad health in the pitiless solitude of a crowd. His total want of tact had made him ridiculous. Address yourself to the jury, sire, said a judge to a witness, who insisted upon imparting his testimony in a confidential tone to the court direct. The man did not understand, and continued as before. Speak to the jury, sir. The men sitting behind you on the raised benches. Turning, the witness bowed low in awkward solvity and said, Good morning, gentlemen. What are these? asked Napoleon, pointing to twelve silver statues in a cathedral. The twelve apostles, was the reply. Take them down, said Napoleon. Melt them, coin them into money, and let them go about doing good, as their master did. I don't think the proverbs of Solomon show very great wisdom, said a student at Brown University. I could make as good ones myself. Very well, replied President Wayland. Bring in two tomorrow morning. He did not bring them. Will you lecture for us, for fame? Was the telegraph young Henry Ward Beecher received from a young men's Christian association in the West? Yes. F. A. M. E. Fifty and my expenses, was the answer the shrewd young preacher sent back. Montagna tells of a monarch who, on the sudden death of an only child, showed his resentment against providence by abolishing the Christian religion throughout his dominions for a fortnight. The triumphs of tact, or common sense, over talent and genius are seen everywhere. Walpole was an ignorant man, and Charlemagne could hardly write his name so that it could be deciphered. But these giants knew men and things it possessed that practical wisdom and tact which have ever moved the world. Tact, like Alexander, cuts the knots it cannot untie and leads its forces to glorious victory. A practical man not only sees, but seizes the opportunity. There is a certain getting-on quality difficult to describe, but which is the great winner of the prizes of life. Napoleon could do anything in the art of war with his own hands, even to the making of gunpowder. Paul was all things to all men, that he might save some. The palm is among the hardest and least yielding of all woods, yet rather than be deprived of the rays of the life-giving sun in the dense forests of South America, it is said to turn into a creeper and climb the nearest trunk. To the light. A farmer who could not get a living sold one half of his farm to a young man who made enough money on the half to pay for it and buy the rest. You have not tact, was his reply, when the old man asked how one could succeed so well where the other had failed. According to an old custom, a Cape Cod minister was called upon in April to make a prayer over a piece of land. No, said he, when shown the land, this does not need a prayer, it needs manure. To see a man as he is, 
you must turn him round and round until you get him at the right angle. Place him in a good light, as you would a picture. The excellences and defects will appear if you get the right angle. How our old schoolmates have changed places in the ranking of actual life. The boy who led his class and was the envy of all has been distanced by the poor dunce who was called slow and stupid, but who had a sort of dull energy in him which enabled him to get on in the world. The class leader had only a theoretical knowledge and could not cope with the stern realities of the age. Even genius, however rapid its flight, must not omit a single essential detail and must be willing to work like a horse. Shakespeare had marvellous tact. He worked everything into his plays. He ground up the king and his vassal, the fool and the fop, the prince and the peasant, the black and the white, the pure and the impure, the simple and the profound, passions and characters, honour and dishonour, everything within the sweep of his vision he ground up into paint and spread it upon his mighty canvas. Some people show want of tact in resenting every slight or petty insult, however unworthy their notice. Others make Don Quixote's mistake of fighting a windmill by engaging in controversies with public speakers and editors who are sure to have the advantage of the final word. One of the greatest elements of strength in the character of Washington was found in his forbearance when unjustly attacked or ridiculed. Artemis Ward touches this bubble with a pretty, sharp-pointed pen. It was in a certain town in Virginia, the mother of presidents and things, that I was shamefully abused by an editor in human form. He set my sharp steep and called me the urbane and gentlemanly manager. But when I, for the purpose of showing fair play all round, went to another office to get my handbills printed, what does this pusillanimous editor do but change his tune and abuse me like a injun? He said my waxworks was a humbug and called me a hoary-headed itinerant vagabond. I thought at first I'd polish him or if I la Benneke boy, but on reflecting that he could polish me much was in his paper, I give it up, and I would hear occasion to advise people when they run again, as they sometimes will, these miserable papers, do not pay no attention to em. Above all, don't assault an editor of this kind. It only gives him a notoriety, which is just what he wants. And don't do you no more good than it would to jump into any other mud puddle. Editors are generally fine men, but there must be black sheep in every flock. John Jacob Astor had practical talent in a remarkable degree. During a storm at sea, on his voyage to America, the other passengers ran about the deck in despair, expecting every minute to go down. But young Astor went below and coolly put on his best suit of clothes, saying that if the ship should founder and he should happen to be rescued, he would at least save his best suit of clothes. Their trading talent is bringing the Jews to the front in America as well as in Europe said a traveller to one of that race, and it has gained for them an ascendancy, at least in certain branches of trade, from which nothing will ever displace them. They are coming to the front most certainly, replied his companion. But why do you speak of their trade and talent all the time? But don't you regard it as a talent? A talent? No. It is a genius. I will tell you what is the difference in trade between talent and genius. When one goes into a man's store and manages to seal him vada once, that is talent. But when another man goes into that man's store and sells him what he don't want, that is genius. And that is the genius of what my race has got. End of chapter 20 Tact or common sense. Recording by Luke Sartor.
Brisbane, Queensland. Chapter 21 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 21 Enamored of Accuracy. Antonio Stradivari has an eye that winces at false work and loves the true. Accuracy is the twin brother of honesty. C. Simmons Genius is the infinite art of taking pains. Carlyle I hate a thing done by halves. If it be right, do it boldly. If it be wrong, leave it undone. Gilpin If I were a cobbler, it would be my pride, the best of all cobblers to be. If I were a tinker, no tinker beside should mend an old kettle like me. Old Song If a man can write a better book, preach a better sermon, or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, though he build his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. Emerson Sir, it is a watch which I have made and regulated myself, said George Graham of London, to a customer who asked how far he could depend upon its keeping correct time. Take it with you wherever you please. If after seven years you come back to see me, and can tell me there has been a difference of five minutes, I will return you your money. Seven years later the gentleman returned from India. Sir, said he, I bring you back your watch. I remember our conditions, said Graham. Let me see the watch. Well, what do you complain of? Why, said the man, I have had it seven years, and there is a difference of more than five minutes. Indeed, in that case I return you your money. I will not part with the watch, said the man, for ten times the sum I paid for it. And I would not break my word for any consideration, replied Graham. So he paid the money and took the watch, which he used as a regulator. He learned his trade of Tampion, the most exquisite mechanic in London, if not in the world, whose name on a timepiece was considered proof positive of its excellence. When a person once asked him to repair a watch, upon which his name was fraudulently engraved, Tampion smashed it with a hammer and handed the astonished customer one of his own masterpieces, saying, Sir, here is a watch of my making. Graham invented the compensatory mercury pendulum, the deep escapement, and the orrery, none of which have been much improved since. The clock which he made for Greenwich Observatory has been running 150 years, yet it needs regulating but once in 15 months. Tampion and Graham lie in Westminster Abbey because of the accuracy of their work. To ensure safety, a navigator must know how far he is from the equator, north or south, and how far east or west of some known point as Greenwich, Paris, or Washington. He could be sure of this knowledge when the sun is shining, if he could have an absolutely accurate timekeeper. But such a thing has not yet been made. In the 16th century, Spain offered a prize of a thousand crowns for the discovery of an approximately correct method of determining longitude. About two hundred years later, the English government offered five thousand pounds for a chronometer by which a ship six months from home could get her longitude within sixty miles, seven thousand five hundred pounds if within forty miles, ten thousand pounds if within thirty miles, and in another clause, twenty thousand pounds for correctness within thirty miles, 
a careless repetition. The watchmakers of the world contested for the prizes, but 1761 came, and they had not been awarded. In that year, John Harrison asked for a test of his chronometer. In a trip of 147 days from Portsmouth to Jamaica and back, it varied less than two minutes, and only four seconds on the outward voyage. In a round trip of 156 days to Barbados, the variation was only 15 seconds. The 20,000 pounds was paid to the man who had worked and experimented for 40 years, and whose hand was as exquisitely delicate in its movement as the mechanism of his chronometer. "'Make me as good a hammer as you know how,' said a carpenter to the blacksmith in a New York village before the first railroad was built. Six of us have come to work on the new church, and I've left mine at home.' "'As good a one as I know how?' asked David May Doyle, doubtfully. "'But perhaps you don't want to pay for as good a one as I know how to make.' "'Yes, I do,' said the carpenter. "'I want a good hammer.' It was indeed a good hammer that he received, the best, probably, that had ever been made. By means of a longer hole than usual, David had wedged the handle in its place, so that the head could not fly off, a wonderful improvement in the eyes of the carpenter, who boasted of his prize to his companions. They all came to the shop next day, and each ordered just such a hammer. When the contractor saw the tools, he ordered two for himself, asking that they be made a little better than those of his men. "'I can't make any better ones,' said May Doyle, when I make a thing, I make it as well as I can, no matter whom it is for. The storekeeper soon ordered two dozen, a supply unheard of in his previous business career. A New York dealer in tools came to the village to sell his wares, and bought all the storekeeper had, and left a standing order for all the blacksmith could make. David might have grown very wealthy by making goods of the standard already attained, but throughout his long and successful life, he never ceased to study still further to perfect his hammers in the minutest detail. They were usually sold without any warrant of excellence, the word Maydoyle stamped on the head being universally considered a guarantee of the best article the world could produce. Character is power and is the best advertisement in the world. We have no secret, said the manager, of an iron works employing thousands of men. We always try to beat our last batch of rails. That is all the secret we've got, and we don't care who knows it. I don't try to see how cheap a machine I can produce, but how good a machine, said the late John C. Witten of Northbridge, Massachusetts to a customer who complained of the high price of some cotton machinery. Businessmen soon learned what this meant, and when there was occasion to advertise any machinery for sale, New England cotton manufacturers were accustomed to state the number of years it had been in use, and add as an all-sufficient guarantee of Northbridge products, wit and make. Madame, said the sculptor H.K. Brown, as he admired a statue in alabaster made by a youth in his teens. This boy has something in him. It was the figure of an Irishman who worked for the Ward family in Brooklyn years ago, and gave with minutest fidelity not merely the man's features and expression, but even the patches in his trousers, the rent in his coat, and the creases in his narrow-brimmed stove-pipe hat. Mr. Brown saw the statue at the house of a lady living at Newburg on the Hudson. Six years later, he invited her brother, J. Q. A. Ward, to become a pupil in his studio. Today, the name of Ward is that of the most prosperous of all American sculptors. "'Paint me just as I am, warts and all,' said Oliver Cromwell to the artist, who, 
thinking to please the great man, had omitted a mole. "'I can remember when you blacked my father's shoes,' said one member of the House of Commons to another in the heat of debate. "'True enough,' was the prompt reply. "'But did I not black them well?' It is easy to tell good indigo, said an old lady. Just take a lump and put it into water, and if it is good, it will either sink or swim. I am not sure which, but never mind. You can try it for yourself. John B. Goff told of a colored preacher who, wishing his congregation to fresco the recess back of the pulpit, suddenly closed his Bible and said, there, my brethren, the gospel will not be dispensed with any more from this pulpit to the collection of sufficient to fricassee this abscess. When troubled with deafness, Wellington consulted a celebrated physician who put strong caustic into his ear, causing an inflammation which threatened his life. The doctor apologized, expressed great regrets, and said that the blunder would ruin him. No, said Wellington, I will never mention it. But you will allow me to attend you, so that people will not withdraw their confidence? No, said the Iron Duke, that would be lying. Father, said a boy, I saw an immense number of dogs, five hundred, I am sure, in our street last night. Surely not so many, said the father. Well, there were one hundred, I'm quite sure. It could not be, said the father. I don't think there are a hundred dogs in our village. Well, sir, it could not be less than ten. This I am quite certain of. I will not believe you saw ten even, said the father. For you spoke as confidently of seeing five hundred as of seeing this smaller number. You have contradicted yourself twice already and now I cannot believe you. Well, sir, said the disconcerted boy, I saw at least our dash and another one. We condemned the boy for exaggerating in order to tell a wonderful story, but how much more truthful are they who never saw it rain so before, or who called day after day the hottest of the summer or the coldest of the winter? There is nothing which all mankind venerate and admire so much as simple truth, exempt from artifice, duplicity, and design. It exhibits at once a strength of character and integrity of purpose, in which all are willing to confide. To say nice things merely to avoid giving offence, to keep silent rather than speak the truth, to equivocate, to evade, to dodge, to say what is expedient rather than what is truthful, to shirk the truth, to face both ways, to exaggerate, to seem to concur with another's opinions when you do not, to deceive by a glance of the eye, a nod of the head, a smile, a gesture, to lack sincerity, to assume to know or think or feel what you do not. All these are but various manifestations of hollowness and falsehood resulting from want of accuracy. We find no lying, no inaccuracy, no slipshod business in nature. Roses blossom and crystals form with the same precision of tint and angle, today, as in Eden on the morning of creation. The rose in the Queen's garden is not more beautiful, more fragrant, more exquisitely perfect than that which blooms and blushes unheeded amid the fern-decked brush by the roadside or in some far-off glen, where no human eye ever sees it. The crystal found deep in the earth is constructed with the same fidelity as that formed above ground. Even the tiny snowflake, whose destiny is to become an apparently insignificant and a wholly unnoticed part of an enormous bank, assumes its shape of ethereal beauty as faithfully as though preparing for some grand exhibition. Planets rush with dizzy sweep through almost limitless courses, yet return to equinox or solstice at the appointed second, their very movement being the uniform manifestation 
of the will of God. The marvelous resources and growth of America have developed an unfortunate tendency to overstate, overdraw, and exaggerate. It seems strange that there should be so strong a temptation to exaggerate in a country where the truth is more wonderful than fiction. The positive is stronger than the superlative, but we ignore this fact in our speech. Indeed, it is really difficult to ascertain the exact truth in America. How many American fortunes are built on misrepresentation that is needless, for nothing else is half so strong as truth. Does the devil lie? was asked of Sir Thomas Brown. No, for then even he could not exist. Truth is necessary to permanency. In Siberia, a traveller found men who could see the satellites of Jupiter with the naked eye. These men have made little advance in civilization, yet they are far superior to us in their accuracy of vision. It is a curious fact that not a single astronomical discovery of importance has been made through a large telescope. The men who have advanced our knowledge of that science, the most working, with ordinary instruments, backed by most accurately trained minds and eyes. A double convex lens, three feet in diameter, is worth $60,000. Its adjustment is so delicate that the human hand is the only instrument thus far known suitable for giving the final polish. And one sweep of the hand, more than is needed, Alvin Clark says, would impair the correctness of the glass. During the test of the great glass which he made for Russia, the workmen turned it a little with their hands. Wait, boys, let it cool before making another trial, said Clark. The poise is so delicate that the heat from your hands affects it. Mr. Clark's love of accuracy has made his name a synonym of exactness the world over. No, I can't do it. It is impossible, said Webster when urged to speak on a question soon to come up, toward the close of a congressional session. I am so pressed with other duties that I haven't time to prepare myself to speak upon that theme. Ah, but Mr. Webster, you always speak well upon any subject. You never fail. But that's the very reason, said the orator, because I never allow myself to speak upon any subject without first making that subject thoroughly my own. I haven't time to do that in this instance. Hence, I must refuse. Rufus Choate would plead before a shoemaker, justice of the peace, in a petty case, with all the fervor and careful attention to detail with which he addressed the United States Supreme Court. Whatever is right to do, said an eminent writer, should be done with our best care, strength, and faithfulness of purpose. We have no scales by which we can weigh our faithfulness to duties or determine their relative importance in God's eyes. That which seems a trifle to us may be the secret spring which shall move the issues of life and death. There goes a man that has been to hell, the Florentines would say when Dante passed. So realistic seemed to them his description of the netherworld. There is only one real failure in life possible, said Canon Farrar, and that is not to be true to the best one knows. It is quite astonishing, Grove said of Beethoven to find the length of time during which some of the best-known instrumental melodies remained in his thoughts, till they were finally used, or the crude, vague, commonplace shape in which they were first written down. The more they are elaborated, the more fresh and spontaneous they become. Leonardo da Vinci would walk across Milan to change a single tint or the slightest detail in his famous picture of the Last Supper. 
Every line was then written twice over by Pope, said his publisher, Dodsley, of manuscript brought to be copied. Gibbon wrote his memoir nine times, and the first chapters of his history eighteen times. Of one of his works, Montesquieu said to a friend, You will read it in a few hours, but I assure you it has cost me so much labor that it has whitened my hair. He had made it his study by day and his dream by night, the alpha and omega of his aims and objects. He who does not write as well as he can on every occasion, said George Ripley, will soon form the habit of not writing well on any occasion. An accomplished entomologist thought he would perfect his knowledge by a few lessons under Professor Agassiz. The latter handed him a dead fish and told him to use his eyes. Two hours later he examined his new pupil, but soon remarked, You haven't really looked at the fish yet. You'll have to try again. After a second examination he shook his head, saying, You do not show that you can use your eyes. This roused the pupil to earnest effort, and he became so interested in things he had never noticed before that he did not see Agassiz when he came for the third examination. That will do, said the great scientist. I now see that you can use your eyes. Reynolds said he could go on retouching a picture forever. The captain of a Nantucket whaler told the man at the wheel to steer by the North Star, but was awakened towards morning by a request for another star to steer by, as they had sailed by the other. Stephen Gerard was precision itself. He did not allow those in his employ to deviate in the slightest degree from his ironclad orders. He believed that no great success is possible without the most rigid accuracy in everything. He did not vary from a promise in the slightest degree. People knew that his word was not pretty good, but absolutely good. He left nothing to chance. Every detail of business was calculated and planned to a nicety. He was as exact and precise even in the smallest trifles as Napoleon. Yet his brother merchants attributed his superior success to good luck. In 1805, Napoleon broke up the great camp he had formed on the shores of the English Channel, and gave orders for his mighty host to defile towards the Danube. Vast and various as were the projects fermenting in his brain, however, he did not content himself with giving the order and leaving the elaboration of its details to his lieutenants, to details and minutia, which inferior captains would have deemed too microscopic for their notice, he gave such exhaustive attention that before the bugle had sounded for the march, he had planned the exact route which every regiment was to follow, the exact day and hour it was to leave that station, and the precise moment when it was to reach its destination. These details, so thoroughly premediated, were carried out to the letter, and the result of that memorable march was the victory of Austerlitz, which sealed the fate of Europe for ten years. When a noted French preacher speaks in Notre Dame, the scholars of Paris throng the cathedral to hear his fascinating, eloquent, polished discourses. This brilliant finish is the result of most patient work, as he delivers but five or six sermons a year. When Sir Walter Scott visited a ruined castle about which he wished to write, he wrote in a notebook the separate names of grasses and wild flowers growing near, saying that only by such means can a writer be natural. The historian, Macaulay, never allowed a sentence to stand until it was as good as he could make it. Besides his scrapbooks, Garfield had a large case of some fifty pigeonholes, labelled anecdotes, 
electoral laws and commissions, French spoliation, general politics, Geneva Award, parliamentary decisions, public men, state politics, tariff, the press, United States history, etc. Every valuable hint he could get, being preserved in the cold exactness of black and white. When he chose to make careful preparation on a subject, no other speaker could command so great an array of facts. Accurate people are methodical people, and method means character. Am offered ten thousand bushels wheat on your account at one dollar. Shall I buy, or is it too high? Telegraphed a San Francisco merchant to one in Sacramento. No price too high, came back over the wire, instead of, no, price too high, as was intended. The omission of a period cost the Sacramento dealer one thousand dollars. How many thousands have lost their wealth or lives? And how many frightful accidents have occurred through carelessness in sending messages? The accurate boy is always the favoured one, said President Tuttle. Those who employ men do not wish to be on the constant lookout, as though they were rogues or fools. If a carpenter must stand at his journeyman's elbow to be sure his work is right, or if a cashier must run over his bookkeeper's columns, he might as well do the work himself as employ another to do it in that way and it is very certain that the employer will get rid of such a blunderer as soon as he can. If you make a good pin, said a successful manufacturer, you will earn more than if you make a bad steam engine. There are women, said Fields, whose stitches always come out, and the buttons they sew on fly off on the mildest provocation. There are other women who use the same needle and thread, and you may tug away at their work on your coat or waistcoat, and you can't start a button in a generation. Carelessness, indifference, slouchiness, slipshod financiering could truthfully be written over the graves of thousands who have failed in life. How many clerks, cashiers, clergymen, editors, and professors in college have lost position and prestige by carelessness and inaccuracy. You would be the greatest man of your age, Gratan, said Curan, if you would buy a few yards of red tape and tie up your bills and papers. Curan realized that methodical people are accurate and, as a rule, successful. Berg tells of a man beginning business who opened and shut his shop regularly at the same hour every day for weeks, without selling two cents worth, yet whose application attracted attention and paved the way to fortune. A. T. Stewart was extremely systematic and precise in all his transactions. Method ruled in every department of his store, and for every delinquency a penalty was rigidly enforced. His eye was upon his business in all its ramifications, he mastered every detail and worked hard. From the time Jonas Chickering began to work for a piano maker, he was noted for the pains and care with which he did everything. To him there were no trifles in the manufacturing of pianos. Neither time nor labor was of any account to him, compared with accuracy and knowledge. He soon made pianos in a factory of his own, he determined to make an instrument yielding the fullest and richest volume of melody with the least exertion to the player, withstanding atmospheric changes and preserving its purity and truthfulness of tone. He resolved that each piano should be an improvement upon the one which preceded it. Perfection was his aim. To the end of his life he gave the finishing touch to each of his instruments and would trust it to no one else. He permitted no irregularity in workmanship or sales, and was characterized by simplicity, transparency, 
and straightforwardness. He distanced all competitors. Shickering's name was such a power that one piano maker had his name changed to Shickering by the Massachusetts legislature and put it on his pianos. But Jonas Shickering sent a petition to the legislature and the name was changed back. Character has a commercial as well as an ethical value. Joseph M. W. Turner was intended by his father for a barber, but he showed such a taste for drawing that a reluctant permission was given for him to follow art as a profession. He soon became skillful, but as he lacked means, he took anything to do that came in his way, frequently illustrating guidebooks and almanacs. But although the pay was very small, the work was never careless. His labor was worth several times what he received for it. But the price was increased, and work of higher grade given him simply because men seek the services of those who are known to be faithful, and employ them in as lofty work as they seem able to do. And so he toiled upward, until he began to employ himself, his work sure of a market at some price, and the price increasing as other men began to get glimpses of the transcendent art revealed in his paintings, an art not fully comprehended even in our day. He surpassed the acknowledged masters in various fields of landscape work, and left matchless studies of natural scenery in lines never before attempted. What Shakespeare is in literature, Turner is in his special field, the greatest name on record. The demand for perfection in the nature of Wendell Phillips was wonderful. Every word must exactly express the shade of his thought. Every phrase must be of due length and cadence. Every sentence must be perfectly balanced before it left his lips. Exact precision characterized his style. He was easily the first forensic orator America has produced. The rhythmic fullness and poise of his periods are remarkable. Alexandre Dumas prepared his manuscript with the greatest care. When consulted by a friend whose article had been rejected by several publishers, he advised him to have it handsomely copied by a professional penman, and then changed the title. The advice was taken, and the article eagerly accepted by one of the very publishers who had refused it before. Many able essays have been rejected because of poor penmanship. We must strive after accuracy, as we would after wisdom, or hidden treasure, or anything we would attain. Determine to form exact business habits. Avoid slipshod financiering, as you would the plague. Careless and indifferent habits would soon ruin a millionaire. Nearly every very successful man is accurate and painstaking. Accuracy means character, and character is power. End of chapter 21 Enamoured of Accuracy Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 22 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 22 Do It to a Finish. Years ago, a relief lifeboat at New York sprung a leak, and while being repaired, a hammer was found in the bottom that had been left there by the builders thirteen years before. From the constant motion of the boat, the hammer had worn through the planking, clear down to the plating. Not long since, it was discovered that a girl had served twenty years for a twenty months sentence in a southern prison, because of the mistake of a court clerk who wrote years instead of months in the record of the prisoner's sentence. 
The history of the human race is full of the most horrible tragedies caused by carelessness and the inexcusable blunders of those who never formed the habit of accuracy, of thoroughness, of doing things to a finish. Multitudes of people have lost an eye, a leg or an arm, or are otherwise maimed because dishonest workmen wrought deception into the articles they manufactured, slighted their work covered up defects and weak places with paint and varnish. How many have lost their lives because of dishonest work, carelessness, criminal blundering in railroad construction? Think of the tragedies caused by lies packed in car wheels, locomotives, steamboat boilers, and engines, lies in defective rails, ties, or switches, lies in dishonest labor put into manufactured material by workmen who said it was good enough for the meager wages they got because people were not conscientious in their work there were flaws in the steel which caused the rail or pillar to snap the locomotive or other machinery to break the steel shaft broke in mid-ocean and the lives of a thousand passengers were jeopardized because of somebody's carelessness. Even before they are completed, buildings often fall and bury the workmen under their ruins because somebody was careless, dishonest, either employer or employee, and worked lies, deceptions into the building. The majority of railroad wrecks, of disasters on land and sea, which cause so much misery, and costs so many lives, are the result of carelessness, thoughtlessness, or half-done, botched, blundering work. They are the evil fruit of the low ideals of slovenly, careless, indifferent workers. Everywhere over this broad earth we see the tragic results of botched work. Wooden legs, armless sleeves, numberless graves, fatherless and motherless homes everywhere speak of somebody's carelessness somebody's blunders somebody's habit of inaccuracy the worst crimes are not punishable by law carelessness slipshodness lack of thoroughness are crimes against self against humanity that often do more harm than the crimes that make the perpetrator an outcast from society, when a tiny flaw or the slightest defect may cost a precious life. Carelessness is as much a crime as deliberate criminality. If everybody put his conscience into his work, did it to a complete finish, it would not only reduce the loss of human life, the mangling and maiming of men and women, to a fraction of what it is at present, but it would also give us a higher quality of manhood and womanhood. Most young people think too much of quantity, and too little of quality in their work. They try to do too much, and do not do it well. They do not realize that the education, the comfort, the satisfaction, the general improvement, and bracing up of the whole man that comes from doing one thing absolutely right, from putting the trademark of one's character on it, far outweighs the value that attaches to the doing of a thousand botched or slipshod jobs. We are so constituted that the quality which we put into our life work affects everything else in our lives and tends to bring our whole conduct to the same level. The entire person takes on the characteristics of one's usual way of doing things, the habit of precision and accuracy strengthens the mentality, improves the whole character. On the contrary, doing things in a loose-jointed, slipshod, careless manner deteriorates the whole mentality, demoralizes the mental processes, and pulls down the whole life. Every half-done or slovenly job that goes out of your hands leaves its trace of demoralization behind. After slighting your work, after doing a poor job, you are not quite the same man you were before. You are not so likely to try to keep up the standard of your work, not so likely to regard your word as sacred as before. 
the mental and moral effect of half-doing, or carelessly doing things. Its power to drag down, to demoralize, can hardly be estimated because the processes are so gradual, so subtle. No one can respect himself who habitually botches his work, and when self-respect drops, confidence goes with it, and when confidence and self-respect have gone, excellence is impossible. It is astonishing how completely a slovenly habit will gradually, insidiously fasten itself upon the individual, and so change his whole mental attitude as to thwart absolutely his life purpose, even when he may think he is doing his best to carry it out. I know a man who was extremely ambitious to do something very distinctive, and who had the ability to do it. When he started on his career, he was very exact and painstaking. He demanded the best of himself, would not accept his second best in anything. The thought of slighting his work was painful to him, but his mental processes have so deteriorated, and he has become so demoralized by the habit which, after a while, grew upon him, of accepting his second best, that he now slights his work without a protest, seemingly without being conscious of it. He is today doing quite ordinary things, without apparent mortification or sense of humiliation, and the tragedy of it all is, he does not know why he has failed. One's ambition and ideals need constant watching and cultivation in order to keep up to the standards. Many people are so constituted that their ambition wanes and their ideals drop when they are alone or with careless indifferent people. They require the constant assistance, suggestion, prodding, or example of others to keep them up to standard. How quickly a youth of high ideals who has been well trained in thoroughness, often deteriorates when he leaves home and goes to work for an employer with inferior ideals and slipshod methods. The introduction of inferiority into our work is like introducing subtle poison into the system. It paralyzes the normal functions. Inferiority is an infection which, like leaven, affects the entire system. It dulls ideals pulses the aspiring faculty, stupefies the ambition, and causes deterioration all along the line. The human mechanism is so constituted that whatever goes wrong in one part affects the whole structure. There is a very intimate relation between the quality of the work and the quality of the character. Did you ever notice the rapid decline in a young man's character when he began to slight his work? to shirk, to slip in rotten hours, rotten service. If you should ask the inmates of our penitentiaries what had caused their ruin, many of them could trace the first signs of deterioration to shirking, clipping their hours, deceiving their employers, to indifferent, dishonest work. We were made to be honest. Honesty is our normal expression and any departure from it demoralizes and taints the whole character. Honesty means integrity in everything. It not only means reliability in your word, but also carefulness, accuracy, honesty in your work. It does not mean that if only you will not lie with your lips, you may lie and defraud in the quality of your work. Honesty means wholeness, completeness, it means truth in everything, in deed and in word. Merely not to steal another's money or goods is not all there is to honesty. You must not steal another's time. You must not steal his goods or ruin his property by half finishing or botching your work, by blundering through carelessness or indifference. Your contract with your employer means that you will give him your best and not your second best. What a fool you are, said one workman to another, to take so much pains with that job when you don't get much pay for it. Get the most money for the least work, is my rule, and I get twice as much money as you do. 
That may be, replied the other. But I shall like myself better. I shall think more of myself. And that is more important to me than money. You will like yourself better when you have the approval of your conscience. That will be worth more to you than any amount of money you can pocket through fraudulent, skimped, or botched work. Nothing else can give you the glow of satisfaction, the electric thrill and uplift which come from a superbly done job. Perfect work harmonizes with the very principles of our being, because we were made for perfection. It fits our very natures. Someone has said, It is a race between negligence and ignorance as to which can make the more trouble. Many a young man is being kept down by what probably seems a small thing to him. Negligence, lack of accuracy. He never quite finishes anything he undertakes. He cannot be depended upon to do anything quite right. His work always needs looking over by someone else. Hundreds of clerks and bookkeepers are getting small salaries in poor positions today because they have never learned to do things absolutely right. A prominent businessman says that the carelessness, inaccuracy, and blundering of employees cost Chicago one million dollars a day. The manager of a large house in that city says that he has to station pickets here and there throughout the establishment in order to neutralize the evils of inaccuracy and the blundering habit. One of John Wanamaker's partners says that unnecessary blunders and mistakes cost that firm $25,000 a year. The dead letter department of the post office in Washington received in one year seven million pieces of undelivered mail. Of these, more than 80,000 bore no address whatever. A great many of them were from business houses. Are the clerks who are responsible for this carelessness likely to win promotion? Many an employee who would be shocked at the thought of telling his employer a lie with his lips is lying every day in the quality of his work, in his dishonest service, in the rotten hours he is slipping into it, in shirking, in his indifference to his employer's interests. It is just as dishonest to express deception in poor work, in shirking, as to express it with the lips, yet I have known office boys who could not be induced to tell their employer a direct lie, to steal his time when on an errand, to hide away during working hours to smoke a cigarette or take a nap, not realizing, perhaps, that lies can be acted as well as told and that acting a lie may be even worse than telling one. The man who botches his work, who lies or cheats in the goods he sells or manufactures, is dishonest with himself as well as with his fellow men, and must pay the price in loss of self-respect, loss of character, of standing in his community. Yet on every side we see all sorts of things selling for a song, because the maker put no character, no thought into them. Articles of clothing that look stylish and attractive when first worn, very quickly get out of shape, and hang and look like old, much-worn garments. Buttons fly off, seams give way at the slightest strain. Dropped stitches are everywhere in evidence and often the entire article goes to pieces before it is worn half a dozen times. Everywhere we see furniture which looks all right, but which in reality is full of blemishes and weaknesses, covered up with paint and varnish. Glue starts at joints. Chairs and bedsteads break down at the slightest provocation. Casters come off. Handles pull out. Many things go to pieces altogether even while practically new. Made to sell, not for service, would be a good label for the great mass of manufactured articles in our markets today. It is difficult to find anything that is well and honestly made, that has character, individuality, and thoroughness wrought into it. Most things are just thrown together. This slipshod, Dishonest manufacturing is so general 
that concerns which turn out products based upon honesty and truth often win for themselves a worldwide reputation and command the highest prices there is no other advertisement like a good reputation some of the world's greatest manufacturers have regarded their reputation as their most precious possession, and under no circumstances would they allow their names to be put on an imperfect article. Vast sums of money are often paid for the use of a name, because of its great reputation for integrity and square dealing. There was a time when the names of Graham and Tampion on timepieces were guarantees of the most exquisite workmanship and of unquestioned integrity. Strangers from any part of the world could send their purchase money and order goods from those manufacturers without a doubt that they would be squarely dealt with. Tampion and Graham lie in Westminster Abbey because of the accuracy of their work, because they refused to manufacture and sell lies. When you finish a thing, you ought to be able to say to yourself, There, I am willing to stand for that piece of work. It is not pretty well done. It is done as well as I can do it. Done to a complete finish. I will stand for that. I am willing to be judged by it. Never be satisfied with fairly good, pretty good, good enough, Accept nothing short of your best. Put such a quality into your work that anyone who comes across anything you have ever done will see character in it, individuality in it, your trademark of superiority upon it. Your reputation is at stake in everything you do, and your reputation is your capital. You cannot afford to do a poor job, to let botched work or anything that is inferior go out of your hands. Every bit of your work, no matter how unimportant or trivial it may seem, should bear your trademark of excellence. You should regard every task that goes through your hands, every piece of work you touch, as Tampion regarded every watch that went out of his shop. It must be the very best you can do, the best that human skill can produce. It is just the little difference between the good and the best that makes the difference between the artist and the artisan. It is just the little touches after the average man would quit that make the master's fame. Regard your work as Stradivarius regarded his violins, which he made for eternity, and not one of which was ever known to come to pieces or break. Stradivarius did not need any patent on his violins, for no other violin maker would pay such a price for excellence as he paid, would take such pains to put his stamp of superiority upon his instrument. Every Stradivarius now in existence is worth from three to ten thousand dollars, or several times its weight in gold. Think of the value such a reputation for thoroughness as that of Stradivarius or Tampion, such a passion to give quality to your work would give you. There is nothing like being animated of accuracy, being grounded in thoroughness as a life principle, of always striving for excellence. No other characteristic makes such a strong impression upon an employer as the habit of painstaking, carefulness, accuracy. He knows that if a youth puts his conscience into his work from principle, not from the standpoint of salary or what he can get for it, but because there is something in him which refuses to accept anything from himself but the best, that he is honest and made of good material. I have known many instances where advancement hinged upon the little overplus of interest, of painstaking an employee put into his work, on his doing a little better than was expected of him. Employers do not say all they think, but they detect very quickly the earmarks of superiority. They keep their eye on the employee, who has the stamp of excellence upon him, who takes pains with his work, who does it to a finish. 
they know he has a future. John D. Rockefeller, Jr., says that the secret of success is to do the common duty uncommonly well. The majority of young people do not see that the steps which lead to the position above them are constructed little by little by the faithful performance of the common, humble, everyday duties of the position they are now filling. The thing which you are now doing will unlock or bar the door to promotion. Many employees are looking for some great thing to happen that will give them an opportunity to show their mettle. What can there be, they say to themselves, in this dry routine, in doing these common, ordinary things to help me along? But it is the youth who sees a great opportunity hidden in just these simple services, who sees a very uncommon chance in a common situation, a humble position, who gets on in the world. It is doing things a little better than those about you do them, being a little neater, a little quicker, a little more accurate, a little more observant. It is ingenuity in finding new and more progressive ways of doing old things. It is being a little more polite, a little more obliging, a little more tactful, a little more cheerful, optimistic, a little more energetic, helpful, than those about you that attract the attention of your employer and other employers also. Many a boy is marked for a higher position by his employer long before he is aware of it himself. It may be months, or it may be a year before the opening comes, but when it does come, the one who has appreciated the infinite difference between good and better, between fairly good and excellent, between what others call good and the best that can be done, will be likely to get the place. If there is that in your nature which demands the best and will take nothing less, if you insist on keeping up your standards in everything you do, you will achieve distinction in some line, provided you have the persistence and determination to follow your ideal. But if you are satisfied with the cheap and shoddy, the botched and slovenly, if you are not particular about quality in your work, or in your environment, or in your personal habits, then you must expect to take second place, to fall back to the rear of the procession. People who have accomplished work worth while have had a very high sense of the way to do things. They have not been content with mediocrity. They have not confined themselves to the beaten tracks. They have never been satisfied to do things just as others do them, but always a little better. They always pushed things that came to their hands a little higher up, a little farther on. It is this little higher up, this little farther on, that counts in the quality of life's work. It is the constant effort to be first class in everything one attempts that conquers the heights of excellence. It is said that Daniel Webster made the best chowder in his state on the principle that he would not be second class in anything. This is a good resolution with which to start out in your career, never to be second class in anything. No matter what you do, try to do it as well as it can be done. Have nothing to do with the inferior. Do your best in everything. Deal with the best. Choose the best. Live up to your best. Everywhere we see mediocre or second-class men, perpetual clerks who will never get away from the yardstick, mechanics who will never be anything but bunglers, all sorts of people who will never rise above mediocrity, who will always fill very ordinary positions because they do not take pains, do not put conscience into their work, do not try to be first class. Aside from the lack of desire or effort to be first class, there are other things that help to make second class men. Dissipation, bad habits, neglect of health, failure to get an education, all make second class men. A man weakened by dissipation, whose understanding has been dulled, 
whose growth has been stunted by self-indulgences, is a second-class man, if indeed he is not third-class. A man who, through his amusements in his hours of leisure, exhausts his strength and vitality, vitiates his blood, wears his nerves till his limbs tremble like leaves in the wind, is only half a man, and could in no sense be called first class. Everybody knows the things that make for second class characteristics. Boys imitate older boys and smoke cigarettes in order to be smart. Then, they keep on smoking, because they have created an appetite as unnatural as it is harmful. Men get drunk for all sorts of reasons, but, whatever the reason, they cannot remain first-class men and drink. Dissipation in other forms is pursued because of pleasure to be derived, but the surest consequence is that of becoming second-class, below the standard of the best men for any purpose. Every fault you allow to become a habit, to get control over you, helps to make you second class, and puts you at a disadvantage in the race for honour, position, wealth and happiness. Carelessness as to health fills the ranks of the inferior. The submerged classes that the economists talk about are those that are below the high water mark of the best manhood and womanhood. Sometimes they are second-rate or third-rate people, because those who are responsible for their being and their care during their minor years were so before them. But more and more is it becoming one's own fault if, all through life, he remains second-class. Education of some sort, and even a pretty good sort, is possible to practically everyone in our land. Failure to get the best education available whether it be in books or in business training, is sure to relegate one to the ranks of the second class. There is no excuse for incompetence in this age of opportunity, no excuse for being second class when it is possible to be first class, and when first class is in demand everywhere. Second class things are wanted only when first class can't be had. You wear first class clothes if you can pay for them, you eat first-class butter, first-class meat, and first-class bread. Or, if you don't, you wish you could. Second-class men are no more wanted than any other second-class commodity. They are taken and used when the better article is scarce, or is too high-priced for the occasion. For work that really amounts to anything, first-class men are wanted. If you make yourself first-class in anything... No matter what your condition or circumstances, no matter what your race or color, you will be in demand. If you are a king in your calling, no matter how humble it may be, nothing can keep you from success. The world does not demand that you be a physician, a lawyer, a farmer, or a merchant. But it does demand that whatever you do undertake, you will do it right will do it with all your might, and with all the ability you possess. It demands that you be a master in your line. When Daniel Webster, who had the best brain of his time, was asked to make a speech on some question at the close of a congressional session, he replied, I never allow myself to speak on any subject until I have made it my own. I haven't time to do that in this case. Hence, I must refuse to speak on the subject. Dickens would never consent to read before an audience until he had thoroughly prepared his selection. Balzac, the great French novelist, sometimes worked a week on a single page. Macready, when playing before scant audiences in country theatres in England, Ireland and Scotland, always played as if he were before the most brilliant audiences in the great metropolises of the world. Thoroughness characterizes all successful men. Genius is the art of taking infinite pains. The trouble with many Americans is that they seem to think they can put any sort of poor, slipshod, 
half-done work into their careers and get first-class products. They do not realize that all great achievement has been characterized by extreme care, infinite painstaking, even to the minutest detail. No youth can ever hope to accomplish much who does not have thoroughness and accuracy indelibly fixed in his life habit. Slipshodness, inaccuracy, the habit of half-doing things, would ruin the career of a youth with the Napoleon's mind. If we were to examine a list of the men who have left their mark on the world, we should find that, as a rule, it is not composed of those who were brilliant in youth, or who gave great promise at the outset of their careers, but rather of the plodding young men who, if they have not dazzled by their brilliancy, have had the power of a day's work in them, who could stay by a task until it was done, and well done, who have had grit, persistence, common sense, and honesty. The thorough boys are the boys that are heard from, and usually from posts far higher up than those filled by the boys who were too smart to be thorough. One such boy is Elihu Root, now United States Senator. When he was a boy in the grammar school at Clinton, New York, he made up his mind that anything he had to study he would keep at until he mastered it. Although not considered one of the bright boys of the school, his teacher soon found that when Elihu professed to know anything, he knew it through and through. He was fond of hard problems requiring application and patience. Sometimes the other boys called him a plotter, but Elihu would only smile pleasantly, for he knew what he was about. On winter evenings, while the other boys were out skating, Elihu frequently remained in his room with his arithmetic or algebra, Mr. Root recently said that if his close application to problems in his boyhood did nothing else for him, it made him careful about jumping at conclusions. To every problem there was only one answer, and patience was the price to be paid for it. Carrying the principle of doing everything to a finish into the law, he became one of the most noted members of the New York Bar, entrusted with vast interests and then a member of the President's Cabinet. William Ellery Channing, the great New England divine, who in his youth was hardly able to buy the clothes he needed, had a passion for self-improvement. I wanted to make the most of myself, he says. I was not satisfied with knowing things superficially and by halves but tried to get comprehensive views of what I studied. The quality which, more than any other, has helped to raise the German people to their present commanding position in the world is their thoroughness. It is giving young Germans a great advantage over both English and American youths. Every employer is looking for thoroughness, and German employees, owing to their preeminence in this respect, the superiority of their training and the completeness of their preparation for business are in great demand today in England, especially in banks and large mercantile houses. As a rule, a German who expects to engage in business takes a four years course in some commercial school and after graduation serves three years apprenticeship without pay to his chosen business. Thoroughness and reliability, the Germans' characteristics, are increasing the power of Germany throughout the civilized world. Our great lack is want of thoroughness. How seldom you find a young man or woman who is willing to prepare for his life work. A little education is all they want, a little smattering of books, and then they are ready for business. Can't wait! Haven't time to be thorough, is characteristic of our country, and is written on everything, on commerce, on schools, on society, on churches. We can't wait for a high school, seminary, or college education. The boys can't wait to become a youth, nor the youth to become a man. Young men rush into business with no great reserve of education or drill, 
Of course, they do poor, feverish work, and break down in middle life, while many die of old age in the forties. Perhaps there is no other country in the world where so much poor work is done as in America. Half-trained medical students perform bungling operations and butcher their patients because they are not willing to take time for thorough preparation. Half-trained lawyers stumble through their cases and make their clients pay for experience which the law school should have given. Half-trained clergymen bungle away in the pulpit and disgust their intelligent and cultured parishioners. Many an American youth is willing to stumble through life half prepared for his work, and then blame society because he is a failure. A young man, armed with letters of introduction from prominent men, one day presented himself before Chief Engineer Parsons of the Rapid Transit Commission of New York as a candidate for a position. "'What can you do? Have you any specialty?' asked Mr. Parsons. I can do almost anything, answered the young man. Well, remarked the chief engineer, rising to end the interview, I have no use for anyone who can almost do anything. I prefer someone who can actually do one thing thoroughly. There is a great crowd of human beings just outside the door of proficiency. They can half do a great many things, but can't do any one thing well to a finish. They have acquisitions which remain permanently unavailable, because they were not carried quite to the point of skill. They stopped just short of efficiency. How many people almost know a language or two, which they can neither write nor speak? A science or two, whose elements they have not fully mastered. An art or two, which they cannot practice with satisfaction or profit. The patent office at Washington contains hundreds, yes, thousands, of inventions which are useless simply because they are not quite practical, because the men who started them lacked the staying quality, the education, or the ability necessary to carry them to the point of practicability. The world is full of half-finished work, failures which require only a little more persistence, a little finer mechanical training, a little better education, to make them useful to civilization. Think what a loss it would be if such men as Edison and Bell had not come to the front and carried to a successful termination the half-finished work of others. Make it a life rule to give your best to whatever passes through your hands. Stamp it with your manhood. Let superiority be your trademark. Let it characterize everything you touch. This is what every employer is looking for. It indicates the best kind of brain. It is the best substitute for genius. It is better capital than cash. It is a better promoter than friends, or pulls with the influential. A successful manufacturer says, If you make a good pin, you will earn more money than if you make a bad steam engine. If a man can write a better book, preach a better sermon, or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, says Emerson, though he build his house in the woods, the world will make a path to his door. Never allow yourself to dwell too much upon what you are getting for your work. You have something of infinitely greater importance, greater value at stake. Your honor, your whole career, your future success will be affected by the way you do your work, by the conscience or lack of it which you put into your job. Character, manhood, and womanhood are at stake, compared with which salary is nothing. Everything you do is a part of your career. If any work that goes out of your hands is skimped, shirked, bungled, or botched, your character will suffer. If your work is badly done, if it goes to pieces, if there is shoddy or sham in it, if there is dishonesty in it, there is shoddy, sham, dishonesty in your character. We are all of a piece. We cannot have an honest character, a complete, 
untarnished career, when we are constantly slipping rotten hours, defective material, and slipshod service into our work. The man who has dealt in shams and inferiority, who has botched his work all his life, must be conscious that he has not been a real man. He cannot help feeling that his career has been a botched one. To spend a life buying and selling lies, dealing in cheap, shoddy shams, or botching one's work, is demoralizing to every element of nobility. Beecher said he was never again quite the same man after reading Ruskin. You are never again quite the same man after doing a poor job, after botching your work. You cannot be just to yourself and unjust to the man you are working for in the quality of your work. For, if you slight your work, you not only strike a fatal blow at your efficiency, but also smirch your character. If you would be a full man, a complete man, a just man, you must be honest to the core in the quality of your work. No one can be really happy who does not believe in his own honesty. We are so constituted that every departure from the right, from principle, causes loss of self-respect and makes us unhappy. Every time we obey the inward law of doing right, we hear an inward approval, the Amen of the soul, and every time we disobey it, a protest or condemnation. There is everything in holding a high ideal of your work, for whatever model the mind holds, the life copies. Whatever your vocation, let quality be your life slogan. A famous artist said, he would never allow himself to look at an inferior drawing or painting, to do anything that was low or demoralizing, lest familiarity with it should taint his own ideal, and thus be communicated to his brush. Many excuse poor, slipshod work on the plea of lack of time, but in the ordinary situations of life there is plenty of time to do everything as it ought to be done. There is an indescribable superiority added to the character and fibre of the man who always and everywhere puts quality into his work. There is a sense of wholeness, of satisfaction, of happiness in his life, which is never felt by the man who does not do his level best every time. He is not haunted by the ghosts or tail ends of half-finished tasks, of skipped problems, is not kept awake by a troubled conscience. When we are trying with all our might to do our level best, our whole nature improves. Everything looks down when we are going downhill. Aspiration lifts the life. Groveling lowers it. Don't think you will never hear from a half-finished job, a neglected or botched piece of work. It will never die. It will bob up farther along in your career at the most unexpected moments, in the most embarrassing situations. It will be sure to mortify you when you least expect it. Like Banquo's ghost, it will arise at the most unexpected moments to mar your happiness. A single broken thread in a web of cloth is traced back to the girl who neglected her work in the factory, and the amount of damage is deducted from her wages. Thousands of people are held back all their lives and obliged to accept inferior positions because they cannot entirely overcome the handicap of slipshod habits formed early in life. Habits of inaccuracy, of slovenliness, of skipping difficult problems in school, of slurring their work, shirking or half-doing it, Oh, that's good enough. What's the use of being so awfully particular? Has been the beginning of a lifelong handicap in many a career. I was much impressed by this motto, which I saw recently in a great establishment. Where only the best is good enough. What a life motto this would be! How it would revolutionize civilization if everyone were to adopt it and use it. To resolve that, 
whatever they did, only the best they could do would be good enough, would satisfy them. Adopt this motto as yours. Hang it up in your bedroom, in your office, or place of business. Put it into your pocketbook. Weave it into the texture of everything you do, and your life work will be what everyone's should be, a masterpiece. End of chapter 22. Do it to a finish. Recording by Luke Sartor. Brisbane, Queensland. Chapter 23 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 23 The Reward of Persistence. Every noble work is at first impossible, Carlyle. Victory belongs to the most persevering, Napoleon. Success in most things depends on knowing how long it takes to succeed, Montesquieu. Perpetual pushing and assurance put a difficulty out of countenance and make a seeming impossibility give way. Jeremy Collier Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. The nerve that never relaxes, the eye that never blanches, the thought that never wanders, these are the masters of victory. Burke The pit rose at me exclaimed Edmund Keane, in a wild tumult of emotion, as he rushed home to his trembling wife. Mary, you shall ride in your carriage yet, and Charles shall go to Eden. He had been so terribly in earnest with the study of his profession that he had at length made a mark on his generation. He was a little dark man with a voice naturally harsh, but he determined, when young, to play the character of Sir Giles Overreach in Massinger's drama, and no other man had ever played it. By a persistency that nothing seemed able to daunt, he so trained himself to play the character that his success, when it did come, was overwhelming, and all London was at his feet. "'I am sorry to say that I don't think this is in your line,' said Woodfall, the reporter, after Sheridan had made his first speech in Parliament. You would better have stuck to your former pursuits. With head on his hand, Sheridan mused for a time, then looked up and said, It is in me, and it shall come out of me. From the same man came that harangue against Warren Hastings, which the orator Fox called the best speech ever made in the House of Commons. I had no other books than heaven and earth, which are open to all, said Bernard Palissy, who left his home in the south of France in 1828, at the age of 18. Though only a glass painter, he had the soul of an artist. The sight of an elegant Italian cup disturbed his whole existence, and from that moment the determination to discover the animal with which it was glazed possessed him like a passion. For months and years he tried all kinds of experiments to learn the materials of which the animal was composed. He built a furnace, which was a failure, and then a second, burning so much wood, spoiling so many drugs and pots of common earthenware, and losing so much time, that poverty stared him in the face, and he was forced, from lack of ability to buy fuel, to try his experiments in a common furnace. Flat failure was the result, but he decided on the spot to begin all over again, and soon had three hundred pieces baking, one of which came out covered with beautiful enamel. To perfect his invention, 
he next built a glass furnace, carrying the bricks on his back. At length the time came for a trial, but, though he kept the heat up six days, his enamel would not melt. His money was all gone, but he borrowed some, and bought more pots and wood, and tried to get a better flux. When next he lighted his fire, he attained no result until his fuel was gone. Tearing off the palings of his garden fence, he fed them to the flames, but in vain. His furniture followed to no purpose. The shelves of his pantry were then broken up and thrown into the furnace, and the great burst of heat melted the enamel. The grand secret was learned. Persistence had triumphed again. If you work hard two weeks without selling a book, wrote a publisher to an agent, you will make a success of it. Know thy work and do it said Carlyle, and work at it like a Hercules. Whoever is resolved to excel in painting, or indeed in any other art, said Reynolds, must bring all his mind to bear upon that one object from the moment that he rises till he goes to bed. I have no secret but hard work, said Turner, the painter. The man who is perpetually hesitating which of two things he will do first, said William Wirt, will do neither. The man who resolves but suffers his resolution to be changed by the first counter-suggestion of a friend, who fluctuates from opinion to opinion, from plan to plan, and veers like a weathercock to every point of the compass, with every breath of caprice that blows, can never accomplish anything great or useful. Instead of being progressive in anything, he will be at best stationary, and, more probably, retrograde in all. Perseverance built the pyramids on Egypt's plains, erected the gorgeous temple at Jerusalem, enclosed in adamant, the Chinese Empire, scaled the stormy, cloud-capped Alps, opened a highway through the watery wilderness of the Atlantic, leveled the forests of the New World, and reared in its steed a community of states and nations. Perseverance has wrought from the marble block the exquisite creations of genius, painted on canvas the gorgeous mimicry of nature, and engraved on a metallic surface the viewless substance of the shadow. Perseverance has put in motion millions of spindles, winged as many flying shuttles, harnessed thousands of iron steeds to as many freighted cars, and set them flying from town to town and nation to nation, tunneled mountains of granite, and annihilated space with the lightning's speed. It has whitened the waters of the world with the sails of a hundred nations, navigated every sea and explored every land. It has reduced nature in her thousand forms to as many sciences, taught her laws, prophesied her future movements, measured her untrodden spaces, counted her myriad hosts of worlds, and computed their distances, dimensions, and velocities. The slow penny is surer than the quick dollar. The slow trotter will out-travel the fleet racer. Genius darts, flutters, and tires, but perseverance wears and wins. The all-day horse wins the race. The afternoon man wears off the laurels. The last blow drives home the nail. Are your discoveries often brilliant intuitions? Asked a reporter of Thomas A. Edison. Do they come to you while you are lying awake nights? I never did anything worth doing by accident, was the reply. 
nor did any of my inventions come indirectly through accident, except the phonograph. No, when I have fully decided that a result is worth getting, I go ahead on it and make trial after trial until it comes. I have always kept strictly within the lines of commercially useful inventions. I have never had any time to put on electrical wonders, valuable simply as novelties to catch the popular fancy. I like it, continued the inventor. I don't know any other reason. Anything I have begun is always on my mind, and I am not easy while away from it until it is finished. A man who thus gives himself wholly to his work is certain to accomplish something and if he have ability and common sense, his success will be great. How Bulwer wrestled with the fates to change his apparent destiny! His first novel was a failure, his early poems were failures, and his youthful speeches provoked the ridicule of his opponents. But he fought his way to eminence through ridicule and defeat, Gibbon worked twenty years on his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Noah Webster spent thirty-six years on his dictionary. What a sublime patience he showed in devoting a life to the collection and a definition of words. George Bancroft spent twenty-six years on his History of the United States. Newton rewrote his Chronology of ancient nations, fifteen times. Titian wrote to Charles V, I send your majesty the last supper, after working on it almost daily, for seven years. He worked on his Pietro Martin eight years. George Stevenson was fifteen years perfecting his locomotive. What, twenty years on his condensing engine? Harvey labored eight long years before he published his discovery of the circulation of the blood. He was then called a crack-brained impostor by his fellow physicians. Amid abuse and ridicule, he waited twenty-five years before his great discovery was recognized by the profession. Newton discovered the law of gravitation before he was twenty-one, but one slight error in a measurement of the earth's circumference interfered with a demonstration of the correctness of his theory. Twenty years later he corrected the error and showed that the planets roll in their orbits as a result of the same law which brings an apple to the ground. Southern, the great actor, said that the early part of his theatrical career was spent in getting dismissed for incompetency. Never depend upon your genius, said John Ruskin, in the words of Joshua Reynolds. If you have talent, industry will improve it. If you have none, industry will supply the deficiency. Savages believe that when they conquer an enemy, his spirit enters into them and fights for them ever afterwards. So the spirit of our conquests enters us and helps us to win the next victory. Blucher may have been routed at Ligny yesterday, but today you hear the thunder of his guns at Waterloo hurling dismay and death among his former conquerors. Opposing circumstances create strength. Opposition gives us greater power of resistance. To overcome one barrier gives us greater ability to overcome the next. In February 1492, a poor grey-haired man, his head bowed with discouragement almost to the back of his mule, rode slowly out through the beautiful gateway of the Alhambra. From boyhood he had been haunted with the idea that the earth is round. He believed that the piece of carved wood picked up 400 miles at sea, and the bodies of two men unlike any other human beings known found on the shores of Portugal, had drifted from unknown lands in the west. 
but his last hope of obtaining aid for a voyage of discovery had failed. King John of Portugal, while pretending to think of helping him, had sent out secretly an expedition of his own. He had begged bread, drawn maps and charts to keep from starving. He had lost his wife, his friends had called him crazy, and forsaken him. The council of wise men, called by Ferdinand and Isabella, ridiculed his theory of reaching the east by sailing west. "'But the sun and moon are round,' said Columbus. "'Why not the earth?' "'If the earth is a ball, what holds it up?' asked the wise men. "'What holds the sun and moon up?' inquired Columbus. "'But how can men walk with their heads down?' and their feet up, like flies on a ceiling, asked a learned doctor. How can trees grow with their roots in the air? The water would run out of the ponds and we should fall off, said another philosopher. This doctrine is contrary to the Bible, which says, The heavens are stretched out like a tent. Of course it is flat. It is rank heresy to say it is round said a priest. Columbus left the Alhambra in despair, intending to offer his services to Charles the Seventh, but he heard a voice calling his name. An old friend had told Isabella that it would add great renown to her reign at a trifling expense if what the sailor believed should prove true. It shall be done, said Isabella. I will pledge my jewels to raise the money. Call him back. Columbus turned, and with him turned the world. Not a sailor would go voluntarily, so the king and queen compelled them. Three days out, in his vessels, scarcely larger than fishing schooners, the pinta floated a signal of distress for a broken rudder. Terror seized the sailors, but Columbus calmed their fears with pictures of gold and precious stones from India. Two hundred miles west of the Canaries, the compass ceased to point to the North Star. The sailors are ready to mutiny, but he tells them the North Star is not exactly north. Twenty-three hundred miles from home, though he tells them it is but seventeen hundred, a bush with berries floats by. Land birds fly near, and they pick up a piece of wood curiously carved. On October 12th, Columbus raised the banner of Castile over the Western world. How hard I worked at that tremendous shorthand, and all improvement appertaining to it, said Dickens. I will only add to what I have already written of my perseverance at this time of my life, and of a patient and continuous energy which then began to be matured. Cyrus W. Field had retired from business with a large fortune when he became possessed with the idea that by means of a cable laid upon the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, telegraphic communication could be established between Europe and America. He plunged into the undertaking with all the force of his being. The preliminary work included the construction of a telegraph line 1,000 miles long, from New York to St. John's, Newfoundland. Through 400 miles of almost unbroken forest, they had to build a road, as well as a telegraph line, across Newfoundland another stretch of 140 miles across the island of Cape Breton involved a great deal of labor, as did the laying of a cable across the St. Lawrence. By hard work, he secured aid for his company from the British government, but in Congress he encountered such bitter opposition from a powerful lobby that his measure only had a majority of one in the Senate. The cable was loaded upon the Agamemnon, the flagship of the British fleet, 
at Sebastopol, and upon the Niagara, a magnificent new frigate of the United States Navy. But when five miles of cable had been paid out, it caught in the machinery and parted. On a second trial, when two hundred miles at sea, the electric current was suddenly lost, and men paced the decks nervously and sadly, as if in the presence of death. Just as Mr. Field was about to give the order to cut the cable, the current returned as quickly and mysteriously as it had disappeared. The following night, when the ship was moving but four miles an hour, and the cable running out at the rate of six miles, the brakes were applied too suddenly just as the steamer gave a heavy lurch, breaking the cable. Field was not the man to give up. Seven hundred miles more of cable were ordered, and a man of great skill was set to work to devise a better machine for paying out the long line. American and British inventors united in making a machine. At length, in mid-ocean, the two halves of the cable were spliced and the steamers began to separate. The one headed for Ireland, the other for Newfoundland, each running out the precious thread, which it was hoped would bind two continents together. Before the vessels were three miles apart, the cable parted. Again it was spliced, but when the ships were eighty miles apart, the current was lost. A third time the cable was spliced, and about two hundred miles paid out, when it parted some twenty feet from the Agamemnon, and the vessels returned to the coast of Ireland. Directors were disheartened. The public skeptical. Capitalists were shy. And, but for the indomitable energy and persuasiveness of Mr. Field, who worked day and night, almost without food or sleep, the whole project would have been abandoned. Finally, a third attempt was made, with such success that the whole cable was laid without a break, and several messages were flashed through nearly seven hundred leagues of ocean, when suddenly the current ceased. Faith now seemed dead, except in the breast of Cyrus W. Field and one or two friends. Yet with such persistence did they work that they persuaded men to furnish capital for yet another trial, even against what seemed their better judgment. A new and superior cable was loaded upon the Great Eastern, which steamed slowly out to sea, paying out as she advanced. Everything worked to a charm, until within six hundred miles of Newfoundland, when the cable snapped and sank. After several attempts to raise it, the enterprise was abandoned for a year. Not discouraged by all these difficulties, Mr. Field went to work with a will, organized a new company, and made a new cable far superior to anything before used. And on July 13, 1866, was begun the trial which ended with the following message sent to New York. Heart's Content, July 27. We arrived here at nine o'clock this morning. All well. Thank God, the cable is laid and is in perfect working order. Cyrus W. Field The old cable was picked up, spliced, and continued to Newfoundland, and the two are still working, with good prospects for usefulness for many years. In Revelation we read, He that overcometh, I will give him to sit down with me on my throne. Successful men, it is said, owe more to their perseverance than to their natural powers, their friends, or the favorable circumstances around them. Genius will falter by the side of labor. Great powers will yield 
to great industry. Talent is desirable, but perseverance is more so. How long did it take you to learn to play? asked a young man of Gerardini. Twelve hours a day for twenty years, replied the great violinist. Lyman Beecher, when asked how long it took him to write his celebrated sermon on the government of God, replied, About forty years. A Chinese student, discouraged by repeated failures, had thrown away his book in despair when he saw a poor woman rubbing an iron bar on a stone to make a needle. This example of patience sent him back to his studies with a new determination, and he became one of the three greatest scholars of China. Malibran said, If I neglect my practice a day, I see the difference in my execution. If for two days... My friends see it, and if, for a week, all the world knows my failure. Constant, persistent struggle she found to be the price of her marvellous power. When an East India boy is learning archery, he is compelled to practice three months drawing the string to his ear before he is allowed to touch an arrow. Benjamin Franklin had this tenacity of purpose in a wonderful degree. When he started in the printing business in Philadelphia, he carried his material through the streets on a wheelbarrow. He hired one room for his office, workroom, and sleeping room. He found a formidable rival in the city and invited him to his room. Pointing to a piece of bread from which he had just eaten his dinner, he said, Unless you can live cheaper than I can, you cannot starve me out. All are familiar with the misfortune of Carlyle while writing his History of the French Revolution. After the first volume was ready for the press, he loaned the manuscript to a neighbor who left it lying on the floor, and the servant girl took it to kindle the fire. It was a bitter disappointment, but Carlyle was not the man to give up. After many months of poring over hundreds of volumes of authorities and scores of manuscripts, he reproduced that which had burned in a few minutes. Audubon, the naturalist, had spent two years with his gun and notebook in the forests of America, making drawings of birds he nailed them all up securely in a box and went off on a vacation. When he returned, he opened the box, only to find a nest of Norwegian rats in his beautiful drawings. Everyone was ruined. It was a terrible disappointment. But Audubon took his gun and notebook and started for the forest. He reproduced his drawings, and they were even better than the first. When Dickens was asked to read one of his selections in public, he replied that he had not time, for he was in the habit of reading the same piece every day for six months before reading it in public. My own invention, he says, such as it is, I assure you, would never have served me, as it has but for the habit of commonplace, humble, patient, toiling attention. Addison amassed three volumes of manuscript before he began the Spectator. Everyone admires a determined, persistent man. Marcus Morton ran sixteen times for governor of Massachusetts. At last, his opponents voted for him from admiration of his pluck, and he was elected by a majority of one. Such persistence always triumphs. Webster declared that when a pupil at Phillips Exeter Academy, he never could declaim before the school. He said he committed piece after piece and rehearsed them in his room, but when he heard his name called in the academy and all eyes turned towards him, 
the room became dark, and everything he ever knew fled from his brain. But he became the great orator of America. Indeed, it is doubtful whether Demosthenes himself surpassed his great reply to Hayne in the United States Senate. Webster's tenacity was illustrated by a circumstance which occurred in the academy. The principal punished him for shooting pigeons by compelling him to commit one hundred lines of Virgil. He knew the principal was to take a certain train that afternoon, so he went to his room and learned seven hundred lines. He went to recite them to the principal just before train time. After repeating the hundred lines, he continued, until he had recited two hundred. The principal anxiously looked at his watch and grew nervous, but Webster kept right on. The principal finally stopped him and asked him how many more he had learned. About five hundred more, said Webster, continuing to recite. You can have the rest of the day for pigeon shooting, said the principal. Great writers have ever been noted for their tenacity of purpose. Their works have not been flung off from minds aglow with genius, but have been elaborated and elaborated into grace and beauty until every trace of their efforts has been obliterated. Bishop Butler worked twenty years incessantly on his analogy, and even then was so dissatisfied that he wanted to burn it. Rousseau says he obtained the ease and grace of his style only by ceaseless inquietude, by endless blotches and erasures. Virgil worked eleven years on the Aenid. The notebooks of great men like Hawthorne and Emerson are tell-tales of the enormous drudgery of the years put into a book which may be read in an hour. Montesquieu was twenty-five years writing his Esprit des Louis, yet you can read it in sixty minutes. Adam Smith spent ten years on his Wealth of Nations. A rival playwright once laughed at Euripides for spending three days on three lines, when he had written five hundred lines. But your five hundred lines in three days will be dead and forgotten while my three lines will live forever, he replied. Ariosto wrote his Description of a Tempest in sixteen different ways. He spent ten years on his Orlando Furioso and only sold one hundred copies at fifteen pence each. The proof of Burke's Letters to a Noble Lord one of the sublimest things in all literature, went back to the publisher so changed and blotted with corrections that the printer absolutely refused to correct it, and it was entirely reset. Adam Tucker spent eighteen years on the light of nature. Thoreau's New England pastoral, a week on the Concord and Merrimack rivers, was an entire failure. 700 of the 1,000 copies printed were returned from the publishers. Thoreau wrote in his diary, I have some 900 volumes in my library, 700 of which I wrote myself. Yet he took up his pen with as much determination as ever. The rolling stone gathers no moss. The persistent tortoise outruns the swift but fickle hare. An hour a day for twelve years more than equals the time given to study in a four years course at a high school. The reading and re-reading of a single volume has been the making of many a man. Patience, says Bulwer, is the courage of the conqueror. It is the virtue par excellence of man against destiny, of the one against the world and of the soul against matter. Therefore, this is the courage of the gospel, and its importance in a social view, its importance to races and institutions, 
cannot be too earnestly inculcated. Want of constancy is the cause of many a failure, making the millionaire of today a beggar tomorrow. Show me a really great triumph that is not the reward of persistence. One of the paintings which made Titian famous was on his easel eight years, another seven. How came popular writers famous? By writing for years without any pay at all, by writing hundreds of pages as mere practice work, by working like galley slaves at literature for half a lifetime with no other compensation than fame. Never despair, says Burke, but if you do, work on in despair. The head of the god Hercules is represented as covered with a lion's skin with claws joined under the chin to show that when we have conquered our misfortunes, they become our helpers. Oh, the glory of an unconquerable will! End of chapter 23 The Reward of of persistence. Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland. Chapter 24 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 24 Nerve Grip Pluck Never give up, for the wisest is boldest, knowing that providence mingles the cup, and of all maxims the best as the oldest, is the stern watchword of never give up, be firm, one constant element of luck is genuine solid old Teutonic pluck. Stick to your aim, the mongrel's hold will slip, but only crowbars lose the bulldog's grip. Small though he looks, the jaw that never yields drags down the bellowing monarch of the fields. Holmes Soldiers, you are Frenchmen, said Napoleon coolly walking among his disaffected generals when they threatened his life in the Egyptian campaign. You are too many to assassinate, and too few to intimidate me. How brave he is, exclaimed the ringleader, as he withdrew, completely cowed. General Taylor never surrenders, said old Rough and Ready at Buena Vista when Santa Anna, with 20,000 men, offered him a chance to save his 4,000 soldiers by capitulation. The battle was long and desperate, but at length the Mexicans were glad to avoid further defeat by flight. When Lincoln was asked how Grant impressed him as a general, he replied, The greatest thing about him is cool persistency of purpose. He has the grip of a bulldog. When he once gets his teeth in, nothing can shake him off. It was on to Richmond, and I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer that settled the fate of the rebellion. My sword is too short, said a Spartan youth to his father. Add a step to it, then, was the only reply. It is said that the snapping turtle will not release his grip even after his head is cut off. He is resolved, if he dies, to die hard. It is just such grit that enables men to succeed. For what is called luck is generally the prerogative of valiant souls. It is the final effort that brings victory. 
it is the last pull of the oar with clenched teeth and knit muscles that shows what oxford boatmen call the beefiness of the fellow after grant's defeat at the first battle of shiloh nearly every newspaper of both parties in the north almost every member of congress and a public sentiment everywhere demanded his removal friends of the president pleaded with him to give the command to someone else for his own sake as well as for the good of the country lincoln listened for hours one night speaking only at rare intervals to tell a pithy story until the clock struck one then after a long silence he said i can't spare this man he fights it was lincoln's marvelous insight and sagacity that saved grant from the storm of popular passion and gave us the greatest hero of the civil war it is this keeping right on that wins in the battle of life grant never looked backward once after several days of hard fighting without definite result he called a council of war one general described the route by which he would retreat another thought it better to retire by a different road and a general after general told how he would withdraw or fall back or seek a more favorable position in the rear at length all eyes were turned upon grant who had been a silent listener for hours he rose took a bundle of papers from an inside pocket handed one to each general and said gentlemen at dawn you will execute those orders every paper gave definite directions for an advance and with the morning sun the army moved forward to victory messania's army of eighteen thousand men in genoa had been reduced by fighting and famine to eight thousand they had killed and captured more than fifteen thousand austrians but their provisions were completely exhausted starvation stared them in the face the enemy outnumbered them four to one and they seemed at the mercy of their opponents general ott demanded a discretionary surrender but Massena replied my soldiers must be allowed to march out with colors flying and arms and baggage not as prisoners of war but free to fight when and where we please if you do not grant this i will sally forth from genoa sword in hand with eight thousand famished men i will attack your camp and i will fight till i cut my way through it ott knew the temper of the great soldier and agreed to accept the terms if he would surrender himself or if he would depart by sea so as not to be quickly joined by reinforcements Massena's only reply was take my terms or i will cut my way through your army ott at last agreed when Massena said i give you notice that ere fifteen days are past i shall be once more in genoa and he kept his word napoleon said of this man who was orphaned in infancy and cast upon the world to make his own way in life when defeated Massena was always ready to fight a battle over again as though he had been the conqueror the battle is completely lost said Desay, looking at his watch when consulted by napoleon at marengo but it is only two o'clock and we shall have time to gain another he then made his famous cavalry charge and won the field although a few minutes before the french soldiers all along the line were momentarily expecting an order to retreat well said barnum to a friend in eighteen forty one i am going to buy the american museum buy it exclaimed the astonished friend who knew that the showman had not a dollar what do you intend buying it with 
brass, was the prompt reply. For silver and gold have I none. Everyone interested in public entertainments in New York knew Barnum, and knew the condition of his pocket. But Francis Olmsteed, who owned the museum building, consulted numerous references, all telling of a good showman who would do as he agreed, and accepted a proposition to give security for the purchaser. Mr. Olmsted was to appoint a money-taker at the door, and credit Barnum towards the purchase with all above expenses, and an allowance of fifty dollars per month to support his wife and three children. Mrs. Barnum assented to the arrangement, and offered to cut down the household expenses to a little more than a dollar a day. Six months later, Mr. Olmsted entered the ticket office at noon, and found Barnum eating for dinner a few slices of bread and some corned beef. "'Is this the way you eat your dinner?' he asked. "'I have not eaten a warm dinner since I bought the museum, except on the Sabbath, and I intend never to eat another until I get out of debt. "'Ah, you are safe, and will pay for the museum before the year is out,' said Mr. Olmsted slapping the young man approvingly on the shoulder. He was right, for in less than a year, Barnum had paid every cent out of the profits of the establishment. "'Hard pounding, gentlemen,' said Wellington at Waterloo to his officers. "'But we will see who can pound the longest.' "'It is very kind of them to sand our letters for us,' said young do you know, coolly, as an Austrian shell scattered earth over the dispatch he was writing at the dictation of his commander-in-chief. The remark attracted Napoleon's attention and led to the promotion of the scrivener. "'There is room enough up higher,' said Webster, to a young man hesitating to study law because the profession was so crowded. "'This is true in every department of activity.' The young man who succeeds must hold his ground and push hard. Whoever attempts to pass through the door to success will find it labelled push. There is another big word in the English language. The perfection of grit is the power of saying no, with emphasis that cannot be mistaken. Learn to meet hard times with a harder will and more determined pluck. The nature which is all pine and straw is of no use in times of trial. We must have some oak and iron in us. The goddess of fame or of fortune has been won by many a poor boy who had no friends, no backing, or anything but pure grit and invincible purpose. A good character, good habits, and iron industry are impregnable to the assault of the ill luck that fools are dreaming of. There is no luck, for all practical purposes, to him who is not striving, and whose senses are not all eagerly attent. What are called accidental discoveries are almost invariably made by those who are looking for something. A man incurs about as much risk of being struck by lightning as by accidental luck. There is perhaps an element of luck in the amount of success which crowns the efforts of different men. But even here it will usually be found that the sagacity with which the efforts are directed and the energy with which they are prosecuted measure pretty accurately the luck contained in the results achieved. Apparent exceptions will be found to relate almost wholly to single undertakings while in the long run the rule will hold good. Two pearl divers, equally expert, dive together and work with equal energy. One brings up a pearl, while the other returns empty-handed. But let both persevere, and at the end of five, ten, or twenty years, 
it will be found that they succeeded almost in exact proportion to their skill and industry. Varied experience of men has led me, the longer I live, says Huxley, to set less value on meek cleverness, to attach more and more importance to industry and physical endurance. Indeed, I am much disposed to think that endurance is the most valuable quality of all, for industry, as the desire to work hard, does not come to much if a feeble frame is unable to respond to the desire. No life is wasted unless it ends in sloth, dishonesty, or cowardice. No success is worthy of the name unless it is won by honest industry and brave breasting of the waves of fortune. Has luck ever made a fool speak words of wisdom? An ignoramus utter lectures on science? A dolt write an odyssey, an aenid, a paradise lost, or a hamlet? A loafer become a Gerard or Astor, a Rothschild, Stuart, Vanderbilt, Field, Gould, or Rockefeller? A coward win at Yorktown, Wagram, Waterloo, or Richmond? A careless stone cutter, carve an Apollo, a Minerva, a Venus de Medici, or a Greek slave? Does luck raise rich crops on the land of the sluggard, weeds and brambles on that of the industrious farmer? Does luck make the drunkard sleek and attractive, and his home cheerful, while the temperate man looks haggard and suffers want and misery? Does luck starve honest labor and pamper idleness? Does luck put common sense at a discount, folly at a premium? Does it cast intelligence into the gutter and raise ignorance to the skies? Does it imprison virtue and lord vice? Did luck give what his engine, Franklin his captive lightning, Whitney his cotton gin, Fulton his steamboat, Morse his telegraph, Blancard, his lathe, Howe, his sewing machine, Goodyear, his rubber, Bell, his telephone, Edison, his phonograph. If you are told of the man who, worn out by a painful disorder, tried to commit suicide, but only opened an internal tumor, affecting a cure, of the Persian condemned to lose his tongue, on whom a bungling operation merely removed an impediment of speech, of a painter who produced an effect long desired by throwing his brush at a picture in rage and despair, of a musician who, after repeated failures in trying to imitate a storm at sea, obtained the result desired by angrily running his hands together from the extremities of the keyboard, Bear in mind that even this, luck, came to men as the result of action, not inaction. Luck is ever waiting for something to turn up, says Cobden. Labor with keen eyes and strong will will turn up something. Luck lies in bed and wishes the postman would bring him the news of a legacy. Labor turns out at six o'clock, and with busy pen or ringing hammer lays the foundation of a competence. Luck whines, labor whistles. Luck relies on chance, labor on character. Stick to the thing and carry it through. Believe you were made for the place you fill and that no one else can fill it as well. Put forth your whole energies. Be awake. Electrify yourself. Go forth to the task. Only once learn to carry a thing through 
in all its completeness and proportion, and you will become a hero. You will think better of yourself. Others will think better of you. The world in its very heart admires the stern, determined doer. I like the man who faces what he must, with step triumphant and a heart of cheer, who fights the daily battle without fear, sees his hopes fail, yet keeps unfaltering trust, that God is God, that somehow, true and just, his plans work out for mortals, not a tear, is shed when fortune, which the world holds dear, falls from his grasp, better with love a crust, than living in dishonor, envies not, nor loses faith in man, but does his best, nor even murmurs at his humbler lot, but with a smile and words of hope gives jest to every toiler, he alone is great, who, by a life heroic, conquers fate. End of chapter 24 Nerve, Grit, Pluck Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland. Chapter 25 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon, Sweat, Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 25 Clear Grit. Let fortune empty her whole quiver on me. I have a soul that, like an ample shield, can take in all, and verge enough for more. Dryden There's a brave fellow, there's a man of pluck, a man who's not afraid to say his say, though a whole town's against him. Longfellow Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Goldsmith The barriers are not yet erected which shall say to aspiring talent, Thus far and no farther. Beethoven Friends and comrades, said Pizarro, as he turned toward the south, after tracing with his sword, upon the sand a line from east to west. On that side are toil, hunger, nakedness, the drenching storm, desertion and death. On this side, ease and pleasure. There lies Peru with its riches, here Panama and its poverty. Choose each man what best becomes a brave Castilian. For my part, I go to the south. So saying, he crossed the line and was followed by thirteen Spaniards in armour. Thus, on the little island of Gallo in the Pacific, when his men were clamouring to return to Panama, did Pizarro and his fellow volunteers resolve to stake their lives upon the success of a desperate crusade against the powerful empire of the Incas. At the time, they had not even a vessel, to transport them to the country they wished to conquer. Is it necessary to add that all difficulties yielded at last to such resolute determination? Perseverance is a Roman virtue that wins each godlike act and plucks success even from the spear-proof crest of rugged danger. When you get into a tight place, and everything goes against you, till it seems as if you could not hold on a minute longer, said Harriet Beecher Stowe, never give up, for that's just the place and time that the tide will turn. Charles Sumner said, Three things are necessary to a strong character. First, backbone. Second, backbone. Third, Backbone. While digging among the ruins of Pompeii, 
which was buried by the dust and ashes from an eruption of Vesuvius, A.D. 79. The workmen found the skeleton of a Roman soldier in the sentry box at one of the city's gates. He might have found safety under sheltering rocks close by, but, in the face of certain death, he had remained at his post, a mute witness to the thorough discipline, the ceaseless vigilance and fidelity which made the Roman legionaries masters of the known world. The world admires the man who never flinches from unexpected difficulties, who calmly, patiently, and courageously grapples with his fate, who dies, if need be, at his post. Clear grit always commands respect. It is that quality which achieves, and everybody admires achievement. In the strife of parties and principles, backbone without brains will carry against brains without backbone. You cannot, by tying an opinion to a man's tongue, make him the representative of that opinion. At the close of any battle for principles, his name will be found neither among the dead nor among the wounded, but among the missing. The London Times was an insignificant sheet published by Mr. Walter, and was steadily losing money. John Walter, Jr., then only twenty-seven years old, begged his father to give him full control of the paper. After many misgivings, the father finally consented. The young journalist began to remodel the establishment, and to introduce new ideas everywhere. The paper had not attempted to mould public opinion, and had had no individuality or character of its own. The audacious young editor boldly attacked every wrong, even the government, whenever he thought it corrupt. Thereupon the public customs, printing, and the government advertisements were withdrawn. The father was in utter dismay. His son, he was sure, would ruin the paper and himself. But no remonstrance could swerve the son from his purpose to give the world a great journal which should have weight, character, individuality, and independence. The public soon saw that a new power stood behind the Times, that its articles meant business, that new life and new blood and new ideas had been infused into the insignificant sheet, that a man with brains and push and tenacity of purpose stood at the helm, a man who could make a way when he could not find one. Among other new features, foreign dispatches were introduced, and they appeared in the Times several days before their appearance in the government organs. The leading article also was introduced to stay. The aggressive editor antagonized the government, and his foreign dispatches were all stopped at the outposts, while the ministerial journalists were allowed to proceed, but nothing could daunt this resolute young spirit. At enormous expense, he employed special couriers. Every obstacle put in his way, and all opposition from the government, only added to his determination to succeed. Enterprise, push, grit were behind the times, and nothing could stay its progress. Young Walter was the soul of the paper, and his personality pervaded every detail. In those days, only three hundred copies of the paper could be struck off, in an hour, by the best presses, and Walter had duplicate and even triplicate types set. Then he set his brain to work, and finally the Walter Press, throwing off seventeen thousand copies per hour, both sides printed, was the result. It was the twenty-ninth of November, 1814, that the first steam-printed paper was given to the world. Mean natures always feel a sort of terror before great natures, and many a base thought has been unuttered, many a sneaking vote withheld, through the fear inspired by the rebuking presence of one noble man. As a result, pure grit, character, has the right of way. In the presence of men permeated with grit and sound in character, meanness and baseness slink out of sight. Mean men are uncomfortable, dishonesty trembles, hypocrisy 
is uncertain. Lincoln, being asked by an anxious visitor what he would do after three or four years, if the rebellion were not subdued, replied, Oh, there is no alternative but to keep pegging away. It is in me, and it shall come out, said Sheridan, when told that he would never make an orator as he had failed in his first speech in Parliament. He became known as one of the foremost orators of his day. When a boy, Henry Clay was very bashful and diffident, and scarcely dared recite before his class at school, but he determined to become an orator. So he committed speeches and recited them in the cornfields, or in the barn, with the horse and cows for an audience. If impossibilities ever exist, popularly speaking, they ought to have been found somewhere between the birth and death of Kitto, that deaf pauper and master of oriental learning. But Kitto did not find them there. In the presence of his decision and imperial energy, they melted away. He begged his father to take him out of the poor house, even if he had to subsist like the Hottentots. He told him that he would sell his books and pawn his handkerchief, by which he thought he could raise about twelve shillings. He said he could live upon blackberries, nuts, and field turnips, and was willing to sleep on a hayrick. Here was real grit. What were impossibilities to such a resolute, indomitable will? Grit is a permanent, solid quality, which enters into the very structure, the very tissues of the Constitution. Many of our generals in the Civil War exhibited heroism. They were plucky and often displayed great determination. But Grant had pure grit in the most concentrated form. He could not be moved from his base. He was self-centered, immovable. If you try to wheedle out of him his plans for a campaign, he stolidly smokes. If you call him an imbecile and a blunderer, he blandly lights another cigar. If you praise him as the greatest general living, he placidly returns the puff from his regalia. If you tell him he should run for the presidency, it does not disturb the equanimity with which he inhales and exhales the unsubstantial vapor which typifies the politician's promises. While you are wondering what kind of creature this man without a tongue is, you are suddenly electrified with the news of some splendid victory, proving that behind the cigar and behind the face discharged of all tell-tale expression is the best brain to plan and the strongest heart to dare among the generals of the Republic. Lincoln had pure grit. When the illustrated papers everywhere were caricaturing him, when no epithet seemed too harsh to heap upon him, when his methods were criticized by his own party, and the generals in the war were denouncing his foolish confidence in Grant, and delegations were waiting upon him to ask for that general's removal, the great president sat with crossed legs and was reminded of a story. Lincoln and Grant both had that rare nerve which cares not for ridicule, is not swerved by public clamor, can bear abuse and hatred. There is a mighty force in truth, and in the sublime conviction and supreme self-confidence behind it, in the knowledge that truth is mighty, and the conviction and confidence that it will prevail. Pure grit is that element of character which enables a man to clutch his aim with an iron grip, and keep the needle of his purpose pointing to the star of his hope. Through sunshine and storm, through hurricane and tempest, through sleet and rain, with a leaky ship, with a crew in mutiny, it perseveres. In fact, nothing but death can subdue it, and it dies still struggling. The man of grit carries in his very presence a power which controls and commands. He is spared the necessity of declaring himself, for his grit speaks in his every act. It does not come by fits and starts. It is a part of his life. It inspires a sublime audacity and a heroic courage. Many of the failures of life are due to the want of grit or business nerve. 
it is unfortunate for a young man to start out in business life with a weak yielding disposition with no resolution or backbone to mark his own course and stick to it with no ability to say no with an emphasis obliging this man by investing in hopeless speculation and rather than offend a friend endorsing a questionable note a little boy was asked how he learned to skate oh by getting up every time i fell down he replied whipple tells a story of messenia which illustrates the masterful purpose that plucks victory out of the jaws of defeat after the defeat at esling the success of napoleon's attempt to withdraw his beaten army depended on the character of messenia to whom the emperor dispatched a messenger telling him to keep his position for two hours longer at aspern this order couched in the form of a request required almost an impossibility but napoleon knew the indomitable tenacity of the man to whom he gave it the messenger found messenia seated on a heap of rubbish his eyes bloodshot his frame weakened by his unparalleled exertion during a contest of forty hours and his whole appearance indicating a physical state better befitting the hospital than the field but that steadfast soul seemed altogether unaffected by bodily prostration half dead as he was with fatigue he rose painfully and said courageously tell the emperor that i will hold out for two hours and he kept his word often defeated in battle said macaulay of alexander the great he was always successful in war in the battle of marengo the austrians considered the day won the french army was inferior in numbers and had given way the austrian army extended its wings on the right and on the left to follow up the french then though the french themselves thought that the battle was lost and the austrians were confident it was won napoleon gave the command to charge and the trumpet's blast being given the old guard charged down into the weakened center of the enemy cut it in two rolled the two wings up on either side and the battle was won for france once when marshal ney was going into battle looking down at his knees which were smiting together he said you may well shake you would shake worse yet if you knew where i am going to take you it is victory after victory with the soldier lesson after lesson with the scholar blow after blow with the laborer crop after crop with the farmer picture after picture with the painter and mile after mile with the traveller that secures what all so much desire success a promising harvard student was stricken with paralysis of both legs physicians said there was no hope for him the lad determined to continue his college studies the examiners heard him at his bedside and in four years he took his degree he resolved to make a critical study of dante to which he had to learn italian and german he persevered in spite of repeated attacks of illness and partial loss of sight he was competing for the university prize think of the paralytic lad helpless in bed competing for a prize fighting death inch by inch what a lesson before his manuscript was published or the prize awarded the brave student died but his work was successful congressman william w crapo while working his way through college being too poor to buy a dictionary actually copied one walking from his home in the village of dartmouth massachusetts to new bedford to replenish his store of words and definitions from the town library 
Oh, the triumphs of this indomitable spirit of the conqueror! This it was that enabled Franklin to dine on a small loaf in the printing office with a book in his hand. It helped Locke to live on bread and water in a Dutch garret. It enabled Gideon Lee to go barefoot in the snow, half starved and thinly clad. It sustained Lincoln and Garfield on their hard journeys from the log cabin to the White House. President Chadburn put grit in place of his lost lung, and worked thirty-five years after his funeral had been planned. Henry Fawcett put grit in place of eyesight, and became the greatest postmaster general England ever had. Prescott also put grit in place of eyesight, and became one of America's greatest historians. Francis Parkman put grit in place of health and eyesight, and became the greatest historian of America in his line. Thousands of men have put grit in place of health, eyes, ears, hands, legs, and yet have achieved marvelous success. Indeed, most of the great things of the world have been accomplished by grit and pluck. You cannot keep a man down who has these qualities. He will make stepping stones out of his stumbling blocks and lift himself to success. At fifty, Barnum was a ruined man, owing thousands more than he possessed. Yet he resolutely resumed business once more, fairly wringling success from adverse fortune and paying his notes at the same time. Again and again he was ruined, but phoenix-like, he rose repeatedly from the ashes of his misfortune, each time more determined than before. "'It is all very well,' said Charles J. Fox, "'to tell me that a young man has distinguished himself by a brilliant first speech. "'He may go on, or he may be satisfied with his first triumph. "'But show me a young man who has not succeeded at first, and nevertheless has gone on.' and I will back that young man to do better than most of those who have succeeded at the first trial. Cobden broke down completely the first time he appeared on a platform in Manchester, and the chairman apologized for him. But he did not give up speaking till every poor man in England had a larger, better, and cheaper loaf. See young Disraeli, sprung from a hated and persecuted race, without opportunity pushing his way up through the middle classes, up through the upper classes, until he stands self-poised upon the topmost round of political and social power, scoffed, ridiculed, rebuffed, hissed from the House of Commons, he simply says, The time will come when you will hear me. The time did come, and the boy with no chance swayed the scepter of England for a quarter of a century. One of the most remarkable examples in history is Disraeli, forcing his leadership upon that very party whose prejudices were deepest against his race, and which had an utter contempt for self-made men and interlopers. Imagine England's surprise when she awoke to find this insignificant Hebrew actually Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was easily master of all the tortures supplied by the armory of rhetoric. He could exhaust the resources of the bitterest invective. He could sting Gladstone out of his self-control. He was absolute master of himself and his situation. You could see that this young man intended to make his way in the world. Determined audacity was in his very face. Handsome, with the hated Hebrew blood in his veins, after three defeats in parliamentary elections, he was not the least daunted, for he knew his day would come. Lord Melbourne, the great Prime Minister, when this gay young fop was introduced to him, asked him what he wished to be. Prime Minister of England, was his audacious reply. William H. Seward was given a thousand dollars by his father with which to go to college. This was all he was to have. The son returned at the end of the freshman year with extravagant habits and no money. His father refused to give him more, and told him he could not stay at home. When the youth found the props all taken out from under him, and that he must now sink or swim, 
he left home moneyless, returned to college, graduated at the head of his class, studied law, was elected governor of New York, and became Lincoln's great secretary of state during the Civil War. Garfield said, If the power to do hard work is not talent, it is the best possible substitute for it. The triumph of industry and grit over low birth and iron fortune in America, the land of opportunity, ought to be sufficient to put to shame all grumblers over their hard fortune and those who attempt to excuse aimless, shiftless, successless men because they have no chance. During a winter in the War of 1812, General Jackson's troops, unprovided for and starving, became mutinous and were going home. But the general set the example of living on acorns, and then he rode before the rebellious line and threatened with instant death the first mutineer that should try to leave. The race is not always to the swift. The battle is not always to the strong. Horses are sometimes weighted or hampered in the race, and this is taken into account in the result. So, in the race of life, the distance alone does not determine the prize. We must take into consideration the hindrances, the weights we have carried, the disadvantages of education, of breeding, of training, of surroundings, of circumstances. How many young men are weighted down with debt, with poverty, with the support of invalid parents or brothers and sisters or friends? How many are fettered with ignorance, hampered by inhospitable surroundings, with the opposition of parents who do not understand them? How many a round boy is hindered in the race by being forced into a square hole? How many youths are delayed in their course because nobody believes in them, because nobody encourages them, because they get no sympathy and are forever tortured for not doing that against which every fiber of their being protests and every drop of their blood rebels? How many men have to feel their way to the goal through the blindness of ignorance and lack of experience? How many go bungling along from the lack of early discipline and drill in the vocation they have chosen? How many have to hobble along on crutches because they were never taught to help themselves, but have been accustomed to lean upon a father's wealth or a mother's indulgence? How many are weakened for the journey of life by self-indulgence, by dissipation, by life-sappers? How many are crippled by disease, by a weak constitution, by impaired eyesight or hearing? When the prizes of life shall be finally awarded, the distance we have run, the weights we have carried, the handicaps, will all be taken into account. Not the distance we have run, but the obstacles we have overcome, the disadvantages under which we have made the race, will decide the prizes. The poor wretch who has plotted along against unknown temptations, the poor woman who has buried her sorrows in her silent heart, and sowed her weary way through life, those who have suffered abuse in silence, and who have been unrecognized or despised by their fellow runners, will often receive the greater prize. The wise and active conquer difficulties by daring to attempt them. Sloth and folly shiver and sink at sight of toil and hazard, and make the impossibility they fear. I can't. It is impossible, said a foiled lieutenant to Alexander. Be gone, shouted the conquering Macedonian. There is nothing impossible to him who will try. Were I called upon to express in a word the secret of so many failures among those who started out in life with high hopes, I should say unhesitatingly, they lacked will-power. They could not half-will. What is a man without a will? He is like an engine without steam, a mere sport of chance to be tossed about hither and thither, 
always at the mercy of those who have wills. I should call the strength of will the test of a young man's possibilities. Can he will strong enough and hold whatever he undertakes with an iron grip? It is the iron grip that takes the stronghold on life. What chance is there in this crowding, pushing, selfish, greedy world, where everything is pusher or pushed, for a young man with no will, no grip on life? The truest wisdom, said Napoleon, is a resolute determination. An iron will without principle might produce a Napoleon, but with character it would make a Wellington or a Grant, untarnished by ambition or avarice. The undivided will, tis that compels the elements and wrings a human music from the indifferent air. End of chapter 25 Clear Grit Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 26 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 26 Success Under Difficulties. Victories that are easy are cheap. Those only are worth having which come as the result of hard fighting. Beecher. Little minds are tamed and subdued by misfortunes, but great minds rise above them. Washington Irving I have here three teams that I want to get over to Staten Island, said a boy of twelve one day in 1806 to the innkeeper at South Amboy, New Jersey. If you will put us across, I'll leave with you one of my horses in pawn and if i don't send you back six dollars within forty-eight hours you may keep the horse the innkeeper asked the reason for this novel proposition and learned that the lad's father had contracted to get the cargo of a vessel stranded near sandy hook and take it to new york in lighters the boy had been sent with three wagons six horses and three men to carry the cargo across a sand spit to the lighters the work accomplished, he had started with only six dollars to travel a long distance home over the Jersey sands, and reached South Amboy penniless. I'll do it, said the innkeeper, as he looked into the bright, honest eyes of the boy. The horse was soon redeemed. My son, said this same boy's mother on the 1st of May, 1810, when he asked her to lend him one hundred dollars to buy a boat, having imbibed a strong liking for the sea. On the twenty-seventh of this month you will be sixteen years old. If by that time you will plough, harrow, and plant with corn the eight-acre lot, I will advance you the money. The field was rough and stony, but the work was done in time, and well done. From this small beginning, Cornelius Vanderbilt laid the foundation of a colossal fortune. In 1818, Vanderbilt owned two or three of the finest coasting schooners in New York Harbor, and had a capital of $9,000. Seeing that steam vessels would soon win supremacy over those carrying sails only, he gave up his fine business to become the captain of a steamboat at one thousand dollars a year for twelve years he ran between new york city and new brunswick new jersey in eighteen twenty nine he began business as a steamboat owner in the face of opposition so bitter that he lost his last dollar but the tide turned and he prospered so rapidly that he at length owned over a hundred steamboats he early identified himself with the growing railroad interests of the country, and became the richest man of his day in America. Barnum began the race of business life barefoot, for at the age of fifteen he was obliged to buy on credit the shoes 
he wore at his father's funeral. He was a remarkable example of success under difficulties. There was no keeping him down, no opposition daunted him. Eloquence must have been born with you, said a friend to J. P. Curran. Indeed, my dear sir, it was not, replied the orator. It was born some three and twenty years and some months after me. Speaking of his first attempt at a debating club, he said, I stood up, trembling through every fibre, but remembering that in this I was but imitating Tully, I took courage and had actually proceeded almost as far as Mr. Chairman, when, to my astonishment and terror, I perceived that every eye was turned on me. There were only six or seven present, and the room could not have contained as many more. Yet was it, to my panic-stricken imagination, as if I were the central object in nature, and assembled millions were gazing upon me in breathless expectation. I became dismayed and dumb. My friends cried, Hear him! But there was nothing to hear. He was nicknamed Orator Mum, and well did he deserve the title, until he ventured to stare in astonishment at a speaker who was culminating chronology by the most preposterous anachronisms. I doubt not, said the annoyed speaker, that Orator Mum possesses wonderful talents for eloquence, but I would remind him to show it in future by some more popular method than his silence. Stung by the taunt, Curran rose and gave the man a piece of his mind, speaking fluently in his anger. Encouraged by this success, he took great pains to become a good speaker. He corrected his habit of stuttering by reading favorite passages aloud every day, slowly and distinctly, and spoke at every opportunity. Bonyan wrote his Pilgrim's Progress on the untwisted papers which were used to cork the bottles of milk brought for his meals. Gifford wrote his first copy of a mathematical work when a cobbler's apprentice on small scraps of leather and Rittenhouse the astronomer first calculated eclipses on his plough handle. David Livingstone at ten years of age was put into a cotton factory near Glasgow. Out of his first week's wages, he bought a Latin grammar and studied in the night schools for years. He would sit up and study till midnight, unless his mother drove him to bed. Notwithstanding, he had to be at the factory at six in the morning. He mastered Virgil and Horace in this way, and read extensively, besides studying botany. So eager for knowledge was he, that he would place his book before him on the spinning jenny, and amid the deafening roar of machinery would pour over its pages. All the performances of human art, at which we look with praise and wonder, says Johnson, are instances of the resistless force of perseverance. It is by this that the quarry becomes a pyramid, and that distant countries are united with canals. If a man was to compare the effect of a single stroke of the pickaxe, or of one impression of the spade, with the general design and last result, he would be overwhelmed by the sense of their disproportion. Yet those petty operations, incessantly continued, in time, surmount the greatest difficulties, and mountains are leveled, and oceans bounded, by the slender force of human beings. Great men never wait for opportunities. They make them. Nor do they wait for facilities or favoring circumstances. They seize upon whatever is at hand, work out their problem, and master the situation. A young man determined and willing will find a way or make one. A Franklin does not require elaborate apparatus. 
he can bring electricity from the clouds with a common kite. Great men have found no royal road to their triumph. It is always the old route, by way of industry and perseverance. The farmer boy, Elihu B. Washburn, taught school at ten dollars per month, and early learned the lesson that it takes one hundred cents to make a dollar. In after years he fought steals in Congress, until he was called the watchdog of the treasury. When Elias Howe, harassed by want and woe, was in London completing his first sewing machine, he had frequently to borrow money to live on. He bought beans and cooked them himself. He also borrowed money to send his wife back to America. He sold his first machine for five pounds, although it was worth fifty, and then he pawned his letters patent to pay his expenses home. The boy Arkwright begins barbering in a cellar, but dies worth a million and a half. The world treats his novelties just as it treats everybody's novelties, made infinite objection, mustered all the impediments. But he snapped his fingers at their objections and lived to become honored and wealthy there is scarcely a great truth or doctrine that has had to fight its way to public recognition in the face of detraction calumny and persecution nearly every great discovery or invention that has blessed mankind has had to fight its way to recognition even against the opposition of the most progressive men William H. Prescott was a remarkable example of what a boy with no chance can do. While at college, he lost one eye by a hard piece of bread thrown during a biscuit battle, and the other eye became almost useless. But the boy would not lead a useless life. He set his heart upon being a historian and turned all his energies in that direction. By the aid of others' eyes, he spent ten years studying before he even decided upon a particular theme for his first book. Then he spent ten years more, poring over old archives and manuscripts, before he published his Ferdinand and Isabella. What a lesson is his life for young men! What a rebuke to those who have thrown away their opportunities and wasted their lives. Galileo with an opera glass, said Emerson, discovered a more splendid series of celestial phenomena than anyone since with the great telescopes. Columbus found the new world in an undecked boat. Surroundings which men call unfavorable cannot prevent the unfolding of your powers. From among the rock-ribbed hills of New Hampshire sprang the greatest of American orators and statesmen, Daniel Webster. From the crowded ranks of toil and homes to which luxury is a stranger have often come the leaders and benefactors of our race. Where shall we find an illustration more impressive than in Abraham Lincoln, whose life career and death might be chanted by a greek chorus as at once the prelude and the epilogue of the most imperial theme of modern times born as lowly as the son of god in a hovel of what real parentage we know not reared in penury squalor with no gleam of light nor fair surrounding a young manhood vexed by weird dreams and visions with scarcely a natural grace singularly awkward ungainly even among the uncouth about him it was reserved for this remarkable character late in life to be snatched from obscurity raised to supreme command at a supreme moment and entrusted with the destiny of a nation the great leaders of his party were made to stand aside, the most experienced and accomplished men of the day, men like Seward and Chase and Sumner, statesmen famous and trained, 
were sent to the rear while this strange figure was brought by unseen hands to the front and given the reins of power there is no open door to the temple of success everyone who enters makes his own door which closes behind him to all others not even permitting his own children to pass not in the brilliant salon not in the tapestried library not in ease and competence is genius born and nurtured but often in adversity and destitution amidst the harassing cares of a straitened household in bare and fireless garrets amid scenes unpropitious repulsive wretched have men labored studied and trained themselves until they have at last emanated from the gloom of that obscurity the shining lights of their times have become the companions of kings the guides and teachers of their kind and exercised an influence upon the thought of the world amounting to a species of intellectual legislation what does he know said a sage who has not suffered schiller produced his greatest tragedies in the midst of physical suffering almost amounting to torture handel was never greater than when warned by palsy of the approach of death and struggling with distress and suffering he sat down to compose the great works which have made his name immortal in music mozart composed his great operas and last of all his requiem when oppressed by debt and struggling with a fatal disease beethoven produced his greatest works amidst gloomy sorrow when oppressed by almost total deafness perhaps no one ever battled harder to overcome obstacles which would have disheartened most men than demosthenes he had such a weak voice and such an impediment in his speech and was so short of breath that he could scarcely get through a single sentence without stopping to rest all his first attempts were nearly drowned by the hisses jeers and scoffs of his audiences his first effort that met with success was against his guardian who had defrauded him and whom he compelled to refund a part of his fortune he was so discouraged by his defeats that he determined to give up forever all attempts at oratory one of his auditors however believed the young man had something in him and encouraged him to persevere he accordingly appeared again in public but was hissed down as before as he withdrew hanging his head in great confusion a noted actor satyrus encouraged him still further to try to overcome his impediment he stammered so much that he could not pronounce some of the letters at all and his breath would give out before he could get through a sentence finally he determined to be an orator at any cost he went to the seashore and practised amid the roar of the breakers with small pebbles in his mouth in order to overcome his stammering and at the same time accustom himself to the hisses and tumults of his audience he overcame his short breath by practising while running up steep and difficult places on the shore his awkward gestures were also corrected by long and determined drill before a mirror Columbus was dismissed as a fool from court after court, but he pushed his suit against an incredulous and ridiculing world, rebuffed by kings, scorned by queens. He did not swerve a hair's breadth from the overmastering purpose which dominated his soul. The words, New World, were graven upon his heart, and reputation, ease, pleasure, position life itself if need be must be sacrificed threats ridicule ostracism storms leaky vessels 
mutiny of sailors could not shake his mighty purpose. You cannot keep a determined man from success. Place stumbling blocks in his way and he takes them for stepping stones, and on them will climb to greatness. Take away his money and he makes spurs of his poverty to urge him on. Cripple him and he writes the Waverley novels. All that is great and noble and true in the history of the world is the result of infinite, painstaking, perpetual plodding of common everyday industry. Roger Bacon, one of the profoundest thinkers the world has produced, was terribly persecuted for his studies in natural philosophy, yet he persevered and won success. He was accused of dealing in magic, his books were burned in public, and he was kept in prison for ten years. Even our own revered Washington was mobbed in the streets because he would not pander to the clamor of the people and reject the treaty which Mr. Jay had arranged with Great Britain. But he remained firm, and the people adopted his opinion. The Duke of Wellington was mobbed in the streets of London, and his windows were broken, while his wife lay dead in the house. But the Iron Duke never faltered in his course, or swerved a hair's breadth from his purpose. William Phillips, when a young man, heard some sailors on the street in Boston talking about a Spanish ship wrecked off the Bahama Islands, which was supposed to have money on board. Young Phillips determined to find it. He set out at once, and after many hardships, discovered the lost treasure. He then heard of another ship, which had been wrecked off Port de la Plata many years before. He set sail for England and importuned Charles II for aid. To his delight, the king fitted up the ship, Rose Algier, for him. He searched and searched for a long time, in vain, and at length had to return to England to repair his vessel. James, too, was then on the throne, and Phillips had to wait for four years before he could raise money to return. His crew mutinied and threatened to throw him overboard but he turned the ship's guns on them. One day an Indian diver went down for a curious sea plant and saw several cannons lying on the bottom. They proved to belong to the wreck. He had nothing but dim traditions to guide him, but he returned to England with one million five hundred thousand dollars. A constant struggle a ceaseless battle to win success in spite of every barrier is the price of all great achievements. The man who has not fought his way up to his own loaf and does not bear the scar of desperate conflict does not know the highest meaning of success. The money acquired by those who have thus struggled upward to success is not their only or indeed their chief reward when after years of toil of opposition of ridicule of repeated failure cyrus w field placed his hand upon the telegraph instrument ticking a message under the sea think you that the electric thrill passed no further than the tips of his fingers when Thomas A. Edison demonstrated that the electric light had at last been developed into a commercial success, do you suppose those bright rays failed to illuminate the inmost recesses of his soul? End of chapter 26 Success Under Difficulties Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland.
Chapter twenty seven of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter twenty seven Uses of Obstacles. Nature, when she adds difficulties, adds brains. Emerson. Many men owe the grandeur of their lives to their tremendous difficulties. Spurgeon The good are better made by ill, as odors crushed are sweeter still. Rogers Though losses and crosses be lessons right severe, there's wit there you'll get there, you'll find no other where. Burns. Adversity is the prosperity of the great. Kites rise against, not with, the wind. Many and many a time since, said Harriet Martineau, referring to her father's failure in business, have we said that, but for that loss of money, we might have lived on in the ordinary provincial method of ladies with small means, sewing and economizing and growing narrower every year, whereas by being thrown, while it was yet time, on our own resources, we have worked hard and, usefully, won friends, reputation, and independence, seen the world abundantly, abroad and at home. In short, have truly lived instead of vegetating. Two of the three greatest epic poets of the world were blind, Homer and Milton, while the third, Dante, was in his later years nearly, if not altogether, blind. It almost seems as though some great characters had been physically crippled in certain respects, so that they would not dissipate their energy, but concentrate it all in one direction. A distinguished investigator in science said that when he encountered an apparently insuperable obstacle, he usually found himself upon the brink of some discovery. Returned with thanks has made many an author. Failure often leads a man to success by arousing his latent energy by firing a dormant purpose, by awakening powers which were sleeping. Men of metal turn disappointments into helps, as the oyster turns into pearl the sand which annoys it. Let the adverse breath of criticism be to you only what the blast of the storm-wind is to the eagle, a force against him that lifts him higher. A kite would not fly, unless it had a string tying it down. It is just so in life. The man who is tied down by half a dozen blooming responsibilities, and their mother, will make a higher and stronger flight than the bachelor who, having nothing to keep him steady, is always floundering in the mud. When Napoleon's school companions made sport of him on account of his humble origin and poverty, he devoted himself entirely to books, and, quickly rising above them in scholarship, commanded their respect. Soon he was regarded as the brightest ornament of the class. To make his way at the bar, said an eminent jurist, a young man must live like a hermit and work like a horse. There is nothing that does a young lawyer so much good as to be half-starved. Thousands of men of great native ability have been lost to the world because they have not had to wrestle with obstacles, and to struggle under difficulties sufficient to stimulate into activity their dormant powers. No effort is too dear which helps us along the line of our proper career. Poverty and obscurity of origin may impede our progress but it is only like the obstruction of ice or debris in the river temporarily forcing the water into eddies, where it accumulates strength and a mighty reserve 
which ultimately sweeps the obstruction impetuously to the sea. Poverty and obscurity are not insurmountable obstacles, but they often act as a stimulus to the naturally indolent, and develop a firmer fibre of mind, a stronger muscle and stamina of body. If the germ of the seed has to struggle to push its way up through the stones and hard sod, to fight its way up to sunlight and air, and then to wrestle with storm and tempest, with snow and frost, the fibre of its timber will be all the tougher and stronger. There is good philosophy in the injunction to love our enemies, for they are often our best friends in disguise. They tell us the truth when friends flatter. Their biting sarcasm and scathing rebuke are mirrors which reveal us to ourselves. These unkind stings and thrusts are often spurs which urge us on to grander success and nobler endeavor. Friends cover our faults and rarely rebuke. Enemies drag out to the light all our weaknesses without mercy. We dread these thrusts and exposures as we do the surgeon's knife, but are the better for them. They reach depths before untouched, and we are led to resolve to redeem ourselves from scorn and inferiority. We are the victors of our opponents. We have developed in us the very power by which we overcome them. Without their opposition, we could never have braced and anchored and fortified ourselves, as the oak is braced and anchored for its thousand battles with the tempests. Our trials, our sorrows, and our griefs develop us in a similar way. The man who has triumphed over difficulties bears the signs of victory in his face. An air of triumph is seen in every movement. John Calvin, who made a theology for the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, was tortured with disease for many years, and so was Robert Hall. The great men who have lifted the world to a higher level were not developed in easy circumstances, but were rocked in the cradle of difficulties and pillowed on hardships. The gods look on no grander sight than an honest man struggling with adversity. Then I must learn to sing better, said Anaximander, when told that the very boys laughed at his singing. Strong characters, like the palm tree, seem to thrive best when most abused. Men who have stood up bravely under great misfortune for years are often unable to bear prosperity. Their good fortune takes the spring out of their energy, as the torrid zone enervates races accustomed to a vigorous climate. Some people never come to themselves until baffled, rebuffed, thwarted, defeated, crushed, in the opinion of those around them. Trials unlock their virtues. Defeat is the threshold of their victory. It is defeat that turns bone to flint. It is defeat that turns gristle to muscle. It is defeat that makes men invincible. It is defeat that has made those heroic natures that are now in the ascendancy, and that has given the sweet law of liberty instead of the bitter law of oppression. Difficulties call out great qualities and make greatness possible. How many centuries of peace would have developed a grant? Few knew Lincoln until the great weight of the war showed his character. A century of peace would never have produced a Bismarck. Perhaps Phillips and Garrison would never have been known to history had it not been for slavery. Will he not make a great painter? was asked in regard to an artist fresh from his Italian tour. No, never, replied Northcote. Why not? Because he has an income of six thousand pounds a year. In the sunshine of wealth a man is, as a rule, warped too much to become an artist of high merit. He should have some great, thwarting difficulty to struggle against. A drenching shower of adversity would straighten his fibres out again. 
The best tools receive their temper from fire, their edge from grinding. The noblest characters are developed in a similar way. The harder the diamond, the more brilliant the luster, and the greater the friction necessary to bring it out. Only its own dust is hard enough to make this most precious stone reveal its full beauty. The spark in the flint would sleep forever but for friction. The fire in man would never blaze but for antagonism. Suddenly, with much jarring and jolting, an electric car came to a standstill just in front of a heavy truck that was headed in an opposite direction. The huge truck wheels were sliding uselessly round on the car tracks that were wet and slippery from rain. All the urging of the teamster and the straining of the horses were in vain, until the motorman quietly tossed a shovel full of sand on the track under the heavy wheels, and then the truck lumbered on its way. "'Friction is a very good thing,' remarked a passenger." The philosopher Kant observed that a dove, inasmuch as the only obstacle it has to overcome is the resistance of the air, might suppose that if only the air were out of the way, it could fly with greater rapidity and ease. Yet if the air were withdrawn, and the bird should try to fly in a vacuum, it would fall instantly to the ground, unable to fly at all. The very element that offers the opposition to flying is at the same time the condition of any flight whatever. Emergencies make giant men, but for our civil war the names of its grand heroes would not be written among the greatest of our time. The effort or struggle to climb to a higher place in life has strength and dignity in it, and cannot fail to leave us stronger even though we may never reach the position we desire or secure the prize we seek from an aimless idle and useless brain emergencies often call out powers and virtues before unknown and unsuspected how often we see a young man develop astounding ability and energy after the death of a parent or the loss of a fortune or after some other calamity has knocked the props and crutches from under him the prison has roused the slumbering fire in many a noble mind. Robinson Crusoe was written in prison. The Pilgrim's Progress appeared in Bedford Jail. Sir Walter Raleigh wrote, The History of the World, during his imprisonment of thirteen years. Luther translated the Bible while confined in the castle of Wartburg. For twenty years Dante worked in exile, and even under sentence of death. Take two acorns from the same tree, as nearly alike as possible. Plant one on a hill by itself, and the other in the dense forest, and watch them grow. The oak standing alone is exposed to every storm. Its roots reach out in every direction clutching the rocks and piercing deep into the earth. Every rootlet lends itself to steady the growing giant, as if in anticipation of fierce conflict with the elements. Sometimes its upward growth seems checked for years, but all the while it has been expending its energy in pushing a root across a large rock to gain a firmer anchorage. Then it shoots proudly aloft again, prepared to defy the hurricane. The gales which sport so rudely with its wide branches find more than their match and only serve still further to toughen every minutest fibre from pith to bark. The acorn planted in the deep forest, on the other hand, shoots up a weak, slender sapling. Shielded by its neighbours, it feels no need of spreading its roots far and wide for support. Take two boys as nearly alike as possible. Place one in the country, away from the hothouse culture and refinements of the city, with only the district school, the Sunday school, and a few books. Remove wealth and props of every kind, and if he has the right sort of material in him, he will thrive. 
every obstacle overcome lends him strength for the next conflict. If he falls, he rises with more determination than before. Like a rubber ball, the harder the obstacle he meets, the higher he rebounds. Obstacles and opposition are but apparatus of the gymnasium in which the fibers of his manhood are developed. He compels respect and recognition from those who have ridiculed his poverty. Put the other boy in a Vanderbilt family. Give him French and German nurses. Gratify his every wish. Place him under the tutelage of great masters and send him to Harvard. Give him thousands a year for spending money, and let him travel extensively. The two meet. The city lad is ashamed of his country brother. The plain, threadbare clothes, hard hands, tawny face, and awkward manner of the country boy make sorrow contrast with the genteel appearance of the other. The poor boy bemoans his hard lot, regrets that he has no chance in life and envies the city youth. He thinks that it is a cruel providence that places such a wide gulf between them. They meet again as men. But how changed! It is as easy to distinguish the sturdy, self-made man from the one who has been propped up all his life by wealth, position, and family influence, as it is for the shipbuilder to tell the difference between the plank from the rugged mountain oak and one from the sapling of the forest. When God wants to educate a man, he does not send him to school to the graces, but to the necessities. Through the pit and the dungeon, Joseph came to a throne. We are not conscious of the mighty cravings of our half-divine humanity. We are not aware of the God within us until some chasm yawns which must be filled or till the rending asunder of our affections forces us to become conscious of a need. St. Paul in his Roman cell, John Huss led to the stake at Constance, Tyndale dying in his prison at Amsterdam, Milton amid the incipient earthquake throws a revolution, teaching two little boys in Aldgate Street, David Livingstone, worn to a shadow, dying in a negro hut in Central Africa, alone. What failures they might all have seemed to themselves to be, yet what mighty purposes was God working out by their apparent humiliations? Two highwaymen, chancing once to pass a gibbet, one of them exclaimed, What a fine profession ours would be if there were no gibbets! Tut, you blockhead, replied the other, gibbets are the making of us, for if there were no gibbets, every one would be a highwayman. Just so with every art, trade, or pursuit, it is the difficulties that scare and keep out unworthy competitors. Success grows out of struggles to overcome difficulties, says Smiles. If there were no difficulties, there would be no success. In this necessity for exertion, we find the chief source of human advancement, the advancement of individuals as of nations. It has led to most of the mechanical inventions and improvements of the age. Stick your claws into me, said Mendelssohn, to his critics when entering the Birmingham Orchestra. Don't tell me what you like, but what you don't like. John Hunter said that the art of surgery would never advance until professional men had the courage to publish their failures as well as their successes. Young men need to be taught not to expect a perfectly smooth and easy way to the objects of their endeavor or ambition, says Dr. Peabody. Seldom does one reach a position with which he has reason to be satisfied without encountering difficulties, and what might seem discouragements. But if they are properly met, they are not what they seem, and may prove to be helps, not hindrances. There is no more helpful and profiting exercise than surmounting obstacles. 
It was in the Madrid jail that Cervantes wrote Don Quixote. He was so poor that he could not even get paper during the last of his writing, and had to write on scraps of leather. A rich Spaniard was asked to help him, but replied, Heaven forbid that his necessities should be relieved. It is his poverty that makes the world rich. He has the stuff in him to make a good musician, said Beethoven of Rossini. If he had only been well flogged when a boy, but he is spoiled by the ease with which he composes. We do our best while fighting desperately to attain what the heart covets. Waters says that the struggle to obtain knowledge and to advance oneself in the world strengthens the mind, disciplines the faculties, matures the judgment, promotes self-reliance, and gives one independence of thought and force of character. Kossuth called himself a tempest-tossed soul whose eyes have been sharpened by affliction. As soon as young eagles can fly, the old birds tumble them out and tear the down and feathers from their nest. The rude and rough experience of the eaglet fits him to become the bold king of birds, fierce and expert in pursuing his prey. Boys who are bound out, crowded out, kicked out, usually turn out while those who do not have these disadvantages frequently fail to come out. It was not the victories, but the defeats of my life which have strengthened me, said the aged Sydenham Poyntis. Almost from the dawn of history, oppression has been the lot of the Hebrews, Yet they have given the world its noblest songs, its wisest proverbs, its sweetest music. With them persecution seems to bring prosperity. They thrive where others would starve. They hold the purse-strings of many nations. To them hardship has been like spring mornings, frosty but kindly, the cold of which will kill the vermin, but will let the plant live. In one of the battles of the Crimea, a cannonball struck inside the fort, crashing through a beautiful garden. But from the ugly chasm there burst forth a spring of water which ever afterward flowed a living fountain. From the ugly gashes which misfortunes and sorrows make in our hearts, perennial fountains of rich experience and new joys often spring. Don't lament and grieve over lost wealth. The Creator may see something grand and mighty, which even He cannot bring out, as long as your wealth stands in the way. You must throw away the crutches of riches and stand upon your own feet and develop the long unused muscles of manhood. God may see a rough diamond in you which only the hard hits of poverty can polish. God knows where the richest melodies of our lives are, and what drill and what discipline are necessary to bring them out. The frost, the snows, the tempests, the lightnings are the rough teachers that bring the tiny acorn to the sturdy oak. Fierce winters are as necessary to it as long summers. It is its half-century's struggle with the elements for existence, wrestling with the storm, fighting for its life from the moment that it leaves the acorn until it goes into the ship that gives its value. Without this struggling, it would have been characterless, staminaless, nerveless, and its grain would have never been susceptible of high polish. The most beautiful, as well as the strongest woods, are found not in tropical climates, but in severe climates where they have to fight the frosts and the winter's cold. Many a man has never found himself until he has lost his all. Adversity stripped him only to discover him. Obstacles, hardships, 
are the chisel and mallet which shape the strong life into beauty the rough ledge on the hillside complains of the drill of the blasting which disturbs its peace of centuries it is not pleasant to be rent with powder to be hammered and squared by the quarrymen but look again behold the magnificent statue the monument chiselled into grace and beauty telling its grand story of valour in the public square for centuries the statue would have slept in the marble forever but for the blasting the chiselling and the polishing the angel of our higher and nobler selves would remain forever unknown in the rough quarries of our lives but for the blastings of affliction the chiselling of obstacles and the sandpapering of a thousand annoyances who has not observed the patience the calm endurance the sweet loveliness chiselled out of some rough life by the reversal of fortune or by some terrible affliction how many business men have made their greatest strides toward manhood and developed their greatest virtues when reverses of fortune have swept away everything they had in the world when disease had robbed them of all they held dear in life often we cannot see the angel in the quarry of our lives the statue of manhood until the blasts of misfortune have rent the ledge and difficulties and obstacles have squared and chiselled the granite blocks into grace and beauty many a man has been ruined into salvation the lightning which smote his dearest hopes opened up a new rift in his dark life and gave him glimpses of himself which until then he had never seen the grave buried his dearest hopes but uncovered in his nature possibilities of patience endurance and hope which he never before dreamed he possessed adversity is a severe instructor says edmund burke set over us by one who knows us better than we do ourselves as he loves us better too he that wrestles with us strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill our antagonist is our helper this conflict with difficulty makes us acquainted with our object and compels us to consider it in all its relations it will not suffer us to be superficial men who have the right kind of material in them will assert their personality and rise in spite of a thousand adverse circumstances you cannot keep them down every obstacle seems only to add to their ability to get on the greatest men will ever be those who have risen from the ranks it is said that there are ten thousand chances to one that genius talent and virtue shall issue from a farmhouse rather than from a palace adversity exasperates fools dejects cowards but draws out the faculties of the wise and industrious puts the modest to the necessity of trying their skill awes the opulent and makes the idle industrious the storms of adversity like those of the ocean rouse the faculties and excite the invention prudence skill and fortitude of the voyager a man upon whom continuous sunshine falls is like the earth in august he becomes parched and dry and hard and close-grained men have drawn from adversity the elements of greatness beethoven was almost totally deaf and burdened with sorrow when he produced his greatest works schiller wrote his best books in great bodily suffering he was not free from pain for fifteen years milton wrote his leading productions when blind poor and sick who best can suffer said he best can do bunyan said that if it were lawful he could even pray for greater trouble for the greater comfort's sake not until the breath of the plague had blasted a hundred thousand lives and the great fire had licked up cheap shabby wicked london did she arise phoenix-like 
from her ashes and ruin, a grand and mighty city. True salamanders live best in the furnace of persecution. Many of our best poets are cradled into poetry by wrong, and learn in suffering what they teach in song. Byron was stung into a determination to go to the top by a scathing criticism of his first book, Hours of Idleness, published when he was but nineteen years of age. Macaulay said, There is scarce an instance in history of so sudden a rise to so dizzy an eminence as Byron reached. In a few years he stood by the side of such men as Scott, Southey, and Campbell, and died at thirty-seven, that age so fatal to genius. Many an orator, like stuttering Jack Curran, or Orator Mum, as he was once called, has been spurred into eloquence by ridicule and abuse. This is the crutch age. Helps and aids are advertised everywhere. We have institutes, colleges, universities, teachers, books, libraries, newspapers, magazines. Our thinking is done for us. Our problems are all worked out in explanations and keys. Our boys are too often tutored through college with very little study. Short roads and abridged methods are characteristic of the century. Ingenious methods are used everywhere to get the drudgery out of the college course. Newspapers give us our politics and preachers our religion. Self-help and self-reliance are getting old-fashioned. Nature, as if conscious of delayed blessings, has rushed to man's relief with her wondrous forces and undertakes to do the world's drudgery and emancipate him from Eden's curse. But do not misinterpret her edict. She emancipates from the lower only to call to the higher. She does not bid the world go and play while she does the work. She emancipates the muscles only to employ the brain and heart. The most beautiful, as well as the strongest characters, are not developed in warm climates, where man finds his bread ready-made on trees, and where exertion is a great effort, but rather in a trying climate, and on a stubborn soil. It is not chance that returns to the Hindu riot a penny, and to the American laborer a dollar for his daily toil, that makes Mexico with its mineral wealth poor and New England with its granite and ice, rich. It is rugged necessity. It is the struggle to obtain. It is poverty, the priceless spur that develops the stamina of manhood and calls the race out of barbarism. Intelligent labor found the world a wilderness and has made it a garden. As the sculptor thinks only of the angel imprisoned in the marble block, so nature cares only for the man or woman shut up in the human being. The sculptor cares nothing for the block as such. Nature has little regard for the mere lump of breathing clay. The sculptor will chip off all unnecessary material to set free the angel. Nature will chip and pound us remorselessly, to bring out our possibilities. She will strip us of wealth, humble our pride, humiliate our ambition, let us down from the ladder of fame, will discipline us in a thousand ways, if she can develop a little character. Everything must give way to that. The hero is not fed on sweets, Daily his own heart he eats. Chambers of the great are jails, And headwinds right for royal sails. Then welcome each rebuff That turns earth's smoothness rough, Each sting that bids not sit nor stand, But go.
Browning. End of chapter 27 Uses of Obstacles Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 28 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 28 Decision Resolve, and thou art free. Longfellow. The heaviest charge words in our language are those briefest ones, yes and no. One stands for the surrender of the will, the other for denial. One stands for gratification, the other for character. A stout no means a stout character. The ready yes, a weak one. Gild it as we may. T. T. Munger the world is a market where everything is marked at a set price. And whatever we buy with our time, labor, or ingenuity, whether riches, ease, fame, integrity, or knowledge, we must stand by our decision, and not like children, when we have purchased one thing, repine that we do not possess another we did not buy. Matthews a man must master his undertaking, and not let it master him. He must have the power to decide instantly on which side he is going to make his mistakes. P. D. Armour When Rome was besieged by the Gauls in the time of the Republic, the Romans were so hard-pressed that they consented to purchase immunity with gold. They were in the act of weighing it, a legend tells us, when Camillus appeared on the scene, threw his sword into the scales in place of the ransom, and declared that the Romans should not purchase peace, but would win it with the sword. This act of daring and prompt decision so roused the Romans that they triumphantly swept from the sacred soil the enemy of their peace. In an emergency, the arrival of a prompt, decided, positive man who will do something, although it may be wrong, changes the face of everything. Such a man comes upon the scene like a refreshing breeze blown down from the mountain top. He is a tonic to the hesitating, bewildered crowd. When Antiochus Epiphanes invaded Egypt, which was then under the protection of Rome. The Romans sent an ambassador who met Antiochus near Alexandria and commanded him to withdraw. The invader gave an evasive reply. The brave Roman swept a circle around the king with his sword and forbade his crossing the line until he had given his answer. By the prompt decision of the intrepid ambassador, the invader was led to withdraw, and war was prevented. The prompt decision of the Romans won them many a battle, and made them masters of the world. All the great achievements in the history of the world are the results of quick and steadfast decision. Men who have left their mark upon their century have been men of great and prompt decision. An undecided man, a man who is ever balancing between two opinions, forever debating which of two courses he will pursue, proclaims by his indecision that he cannot control himself, that he was meant to be possessed by others. He is not a man, only a satellite. The decided man, the prompt man, does not wait for favorable circumstances. He does not submit to events. Events must submit to him. The vacillating man is ever at the mercy of the opinion of the man who talked with him last. 
He may see the right, but he drifts toward the wrong. If he decides upon a course, he only follows it until somebody opposes it. When Julius Caesar came to the Rubicon, which formed the boundary of Italia, the sacred and inviolable, even his great decision wavered at the thought of invading a territory which no general was allowed to enter without the permission of the Senate. But his alternative was, destroy myself or destroy my country. And his intrepid mind did not waver long. The die is cast, he said, as he dashed into the stream at the head of his legions. The whole history of the world was changed by that moment's decision. The man who said, I came, I saw, I conquered, could not hesitate long. He, like Napoleon, had the power to choose one course and sacrifice every conflicting plan on the instant. When he landed with his troops in Britain, the inhabitants resolved never to surrender. Caesar's quick mind saw that he must commit his soldiers to victory or death. In order to cut off all hope of retreat, he burned all the ships which had borne them to the shores of Britain. There was no hope of return. It was victory or death. This action was the key to the character and triumphs of this great warrior. Satan's sublime decision in Paradise Lost, after his hopeless banishment from heaven, excites a feeling akin to admiration. After a few moments of terrible suspense, he resumes his invincible spirit and expresses that sublime line, What matter where, if I be still the same? The power to decide instantly the best course to pursue and to sacrifice every opposing motive, and, when once sacrificed, to silence them forever, and not allow them continually to plead their claims and distract us from our single decided course, is one of the most potent forces in winning success. To hesitate is sometimes to be lost. In fact, the man who is forever twisting and turning backing and filing, hesitating and dawdling, shuffling and parlaying, weighing and balancing, splitting hairs over non-essentials, listening to every new motive which presents itself, will never accomplish anything. There is not positiveness enough in him. Negativeness never accomplishes anything. The negative man creates no confidence. He only invites distrust. But the positive man... The decided man is a power in the world and stands for something. You can measure him, gauge him. You can estimate the work that his energy will accomplish. It is related of Alexander the Great that, when asked how it was that he had conquered the world, he replied, By not wavering. When the packet ship Stephen Whitney struck at midnight on an Irish cliff and clung for a few moments to the cliff. All the passengers who leaped instantly upon the rock were saved. The positive step landed them in safety. Those who lingered were swept off by the returning wave and engulfed forever. The vacillating man is never a prompt man, and without promptness no success is possible. Great opportunities not only come seldom into the most fortunate life, but also are often quickly gone. A man without decision, says John Foster, can never be said to belong to himself, since if he dared to assert that he did, the puny force of some cause, about as powerful as a spider, may make a seizure of the unhappy boaster the very next minute and contemptuously exhibit the futility of the determination by which he was to have proved the independence of his understanding and will. He belongs to whatever can make capture of him, and one thing after another vindicates its right to him by arresting him while he is trying to go on, 
as twigs and chips floating near the edge of a river are intercepted by every weed and whirled into every little eddy. The decided man not only has the advantage of the time saved from dilly-dallying and procrastination, but he also saves the energy and vital force which is wasted by the perplexed man who takes up every argument on one side and then on the other, and weighs them until the two sides hang in equipoise, with no prepondering motive to enable him to decide. He is in stable equilibrium, and so does not move at all of his own volition, but moves very easily at the slightest volition of another. Yet there is not a man living who might not be a prompt and decided man, if he would only learn always to act quickly. The punctual man, the decided man, can do twice as much as the undecided and dawdling man who never quite knows what he wants. Prompt decision saved Napoleon and Grant and their armies many a time when delay would have been fatal. Napoleon used to say that although a battle might last an entire day, yet it generally turned upon a few critical minutes in which the fate of the engagement was decided. His will, which subdued nearly the whole of Europe, was as prompt and decisive in the minutest detail of command as in the greatest battle. Decision of purpose and promptness of action enabled him to astonish the world with his marvellous successes. He seemed to be everywhere at once. What he could accomplish in a day surprised all who knew him. He seemed to electrify everybody about him. His invincible energy thrilled the whole army. He could rouse to immediate and enthusiastic action the dullest troops and inspire with courage the most stupid men. The ifs and buts, he said, are at present out of season, and above all it must be done with speed. He would sit up all night, if necessary, after riding thirty or forty leagues, to attend to correspondence, dispatches, and details. What a lesson to dawdling, shiftless, half-hearted men. The doubt of Charles V., says Motley, changed the destinies of the civilized world. So powerful were President Washington's views in determining the actions of the people, that when Congress adjourned, Jefferson wrote to Monroe at Paris, You will see by their proceedings the truth of what I always told you, namely, that one man outweighs them all in influence, who supports his judgment against their own and that of their representatives. Republicanism resigns the vessel to the pilot. There is no vocation or occupation which does not present many difficulties, at times almost overwhelming and the young man who allows himself to waver every time he comes to a hard place in life will not succeed. Without decision there can be no concentration, and to succeed a man must concentrate. The undecided man cannot bring himself to a focus. He dissipates his energy, scatters his forces, and executes nothing. He cannot hold to one thing long enough to bring success out of it. One vocation or occupation presents its rosy side to him. He feels sure it is the thing he wants to do, and, full of enthusiasm, adopts it as his life's work. But in a few days the thorns begin to appear. His enthusiasm evaporates, and he wonders why he is so foolish as to think himself fitted for that vocation. The one which his friend adopted is much better suited to him. He drops his own and adopts the other. So he vacillates through life, captured by any new occupation, which happens to appeal to him, as the most desirable at the time, never using his judgment or common sense, 
but governed by his impressions and his feelings at the moment. Such people are never led by principle. You never know where to find them. They are here today and there tomorrow, doing this thing and that thing, throwing away all the skill they had acquired in mastering the drudgery of the last occupation. In fact, they never go far enough in anything to get beyond the drudgery stage to the remunerative and agreeable stage the skillful stage. They spend their lives at the beginning of occupations, which are always most agreeable. These people rarely reach the stage of competency, comfort, and contentment. There is a legend of a powerful genius who promised a lovely maiden a gift of rare value if she would go through a field of corn and, without pausing, going backward or wandering hither and thither, select the largest and ripest ear. The value of the gift was to be in proportion to the size and perfection of the ear. She passed by many magnificent ones, but was so eager to get the largest and most perfect that she kept on without plucking any until the ears she passed were successively smaller and smaller and more stunted. Finally, they became so small that she was ashamed to select one of them, and, not being allowed to go backward, she came out on the other side without any. Alexander, his heart throbbing with a great purpose, conquers the world. Hannibal, impelled by his hatred to the Romans, even crosses the Alps to compass his design while other men are bemoaning difficulties and shrinking from dangers and obstacles and preparing expedients, the great soul, without fuss or noise, takes the step, and lo, the mountain has been leveled and the way lies open. Learn, then, to will strongly and decisively. Thus fix your floating life and leave it no longer to be carried hither and thither, like a withered leaf, by every wind that blows. An undecided man is like the turnstile at a fair, which is in everybody's way, but stops no one. The secret of the whole matter was, replied Amos Lawrence, we had formed the habit of prompt acting, thus taking the top of the tide, while the habit of some others was to delay till about half-tide, thus getting on the flats. Most of the young men and women who are lost in our cities are ruined because of their inability to say no to the thousand allurements and temptations which appeal to their weak passions. If they would only show a little decision at first, one emphatic no might silence their solicitors forever. But they are weak. They are afraid of offending. They don't like to say no, and thus they throw down the gauntlet and are soon on the broad road to ruin. A little resolution early in life will soon conquer the right to mind one's own business. An old legend says that a fool and a wise man were journeying together and came to a point where two ways opened before them, one broad and beautiful the other narrow and rough. The fool desired to take the pleasant way. The wise man knew that the difficult one was the shortest and safest, and so declared. But at last the urgency of the fool prevailed. They took the more inviting path, and were soon met by robbers who seized their goods and made them captives. A little later, both they and their captors were arrested by officers of the law and taken before the judge. Then the wise man pleaded that the fool was to blame because he desired to take the wrong way. The fool pleaded that he was only a fool, and no sensible man should have heeded his counsel. The judge punished them both equally. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. There is no habit that so grows on the soul as irresolution. Before a man knows what he has done, 
he has gambled his life away, and all because he has never made up his mind what he would do with it. On many of the tombstones of those who have failed in life could be read between the lines. He dawdled. Behind time. Procrastination. Listlessness. Shiftlessness. Nervelessness. Always behind. Oh, the wrecks strewn along the shores of life. Just behind success. Just this side of happiness above which the words of warning are flying. Webster said of such an undecided man that he is like the irresolution of the sea at the turn of tide. This man neither advances nor recedes. He simply hovers. Such a man is at the mercy of any chance occurrence that may overtake him. His days are lost lamenting over lost days. He has no power to seize the facts which confront him and compel them to serve him. To indolent, shiftless, listless people, life becomes a mere shuffle of expedience. They do not realize that the habit of putting everything off puts off their manhood, their capacity, their success, their contagion infects their whole neighborhood. Scott used to caution youth against the habit of dawdling, which creeps in at every crevice of unoccupied time and often ruins a bright life. Your motto must be, he said, hoc age, do instantly. This is the only way to check the propensity to dawdling. How many hours have been wasted dawdling in bed, turning over and dreading to get up? Many a career has been crippled by it. Burton could not overcome this habit, and, convinced that it would ruin his success, made his servant promise before he went to bed to get him up at just such a time. The servant called and called and coaxed, but Burton would beg him to be left a little longer. The servant, knowing that he would lose his shilling if he did not get him up, then dashed cold water into the bed between the sheets, and Burton came up with a bound. When one asked a lazy young fellow what made him lie in bed so long, I am employed, said he, in hearing counsel every morning. Industry advises me to get up, sloth to lie still, and they give me twenty reasons for and against. It is my part, as an impartial judge, to hear all that can be said on both sides, and by the time the cause is over, dinner is ready. There is no doubt that, as a rule, great decision of character is usually accompanied by great constitutional firmness. Men who have been noted for great firmness of character have usually been strong and robust, there is no quality of the mind which does not sympathize with bodily weakness, and especially is this true with the power of decision, which is usually impaired or weakened from physical suffering or any great physical debility. As a rule, it is the strong physical man who carries weight and conviction. Any bodily weakness or lassitude or lack of tone and vigor is perhaps first felt in the weakened or debilitated power of decisions. Nothing will give greater confidence, and bring assistance more quickly from the bank or from a friend, than the reputation of promptness. The world knows that the prompt man's bills and notes will be paid on the day, and will trust him. Let it be your first study to teach the world that you are not wood and straw, that there is some iron in you. Let men know that what you say, you will do, that your decision, once made, is final. No wavering, that, once resolved, you are not to be allured or intimidated. 
some minds are so constructed that they are bewildered and dazed whenever a responsibility is thrust upon them. They have a mortal dread of deciding anything. The very effort to come to immediate and unflinching decision starts up all sorts of doubts, difficulties, and fears, and they cannot seem to get light enough to decide, nor courage enough to attempt to remove the obstacle. They know that hesitation is fatal to enterprise, fatal to progress, fatal to success. Yet somehow they seem fated with a morbid introspection which ever holds them in suspense. They have just energy enough to weigh motives, but nothing left for the momentum of action. They analyze and analyze, deliberate, weigh, consider, ponder, but never act. How many a man can trace his downfall in life to the failure to seize his opportunity at the favorable moment when it was within easy grasp, the nick of time which often does not present itself but once. It was said that Napoleon had an officer under him, who understood the tactics of war better than his commander, but he lacked that power of rapid decision and powerful concentration which characterized the greatest military leaders perhaps of the world. There were several generals under Grant who were as well skilled in war tactics, knew the country as well, were better educated, but they lacked that power of decision which made unconditional surrender absolutely imperative wherever he met the foe. Grant's decision was like inexorable fate. There was no going behind it, no opening it up for reconsideration. It was his decision which voiced itself in those memorable words in the wilderness. I propose to fight it out on these lines if it takes all summer, and which sent back the words unconditional surrender to General Buckner, who asked him for conditions of capitulation that gave the first confidence to the North that the rebellion was doomed. At last, Lincoln had a general who had the power of decision, and the North breathed easy for the first time. The man who would forge to the front in this competitive age must be a man of prompt and determined decision. Like Caesar, he must burn his ships behind him and make retreat forever impossible. When he draws his sword, he must throw the scabbard away, lest in a moment of discouragement and irresolution he be tempted to sheathe it. He must nail his colors to the mast as Nelson did in battle, determined to sink with his ship if he cannot conquer. Prompt decision and sublime audacity have carried many a successful man over perilous crises where deliberation would have been ruin. Hock Age End of Chapter 28 Decision Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 29 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 29 Observation as a Success Factor Henry Ward Beecher was not so foolish as to think that he could get on without systematic study and a thoroughgoing knowledge of the world of books. When I first went to Brooklyn, he said, men doubted whether I could sustain myself. I replied, give me uninterrupted time till nine o'clock every morning, and I do not care what comes after. He was a hard student during four hours every morning. Those who saw him after that imagined that he picked up the material for his sermons on the street. Yet, having said so much, it is true that much 
that was most vital in his preaching he did not pick up on the street. Where does Mr. Beecher get his sermons? Every ambitious young clergyman in the country was asking, and upon one occasion he answered, I keep my eyes open and ask questions. This is the secret of many a man's success, keeping his eyes open and asking questions. Although Beecher was an omnivorous reader, he did not care much for the writings of the theologians. The Christ was his great model, and he knew that he did not search the writings of the Sanhedrin for his sermons, but picked them up as he walked along the banks of the Jordan and over the hills and through the meadows and villages of Galilee. He saw that the strength of this great master's sermons was in their utter simplicity, their naturalness. Beecher's sermons were very simple, healthy, and strong. They pulsated with life. They had the vigor of bright red blood in them, because, like Christ's, they grew out of doors. He got them everywhere from life and nature. He picked them up in the marketplace, on Wall Street, in the stores. He got them from the brakeman, the mechanic, the blacksmith, the day laborer, the newsboy, the train conductor, the clerk, the lawyer, the physician, and the businessman. He did not watch the progress of the great human battle from his study, as many did. He went into the thick of the fight himself. He was in the smoke and din, where the battle of life raged fiercest. There he was, studying its great problems. Now it was the problem of slavery, again the problem of government, or commerce, or education, whatever touched the lives of men. He kept his hand upon the pulse of events. He was in the swim of things. The great, busy, ambitious world was everywhere throbbing for him. When he once got a taste of the power and helpfulness which comes from the study of real life, when he saw how much more forceful and interesting actual life stories were as they were being lived than anything he could get out of any book except the Bible, he was never again satisfied without illustrations fresh from the lives of the people he met every day. Beecher believed a sermon a failure when it does not make a great mass of hearers go away with a new determination to make a little more of themselves, to do their work a little better, to be a little more conscientious, a little more helpful, a little more determined to do their share in the world. This great observer was not only a student of human nature, but of all nature as well. I watched him many a time, completely absorbed in drinking in the beauties of the marvellous landscape, gathering grandeur and sublimity from the great white mountains which he loved so well and where he spent many summers. He always preached on Sunday at the hotel where he stayed, and great crowds came from every direction to hear him. There was something in his sermons that appealed to the best in everyone who heard him. They were full of pictures of beautiful landscapes, seascapes, and entrancing sunsets. The clouds, the rain, the sunshine, and the storm were reflected in them. The flowers, the fields, the brooks, the record of creation imprinted in the rocks and the mountains were intermingled with the ferry boats, the steam cars, orphans, calamities, accidents, all sorts of experiences and bits of life. Happiness and sunshine, birds and trees alternated with the direst poverty in the slums people on sick beds and death beds, in hospitals and in funeral processions, life pictures of successes and failures, of the discouraged, the despondent, the cheerful, 
the optimist and the pessimist, passed in quick succession and stamped themselves on the brains of his eager hearers. Wherever he went, Beecher continued his study of life through observation. Nothing else was half so interesting. To him, man was the greatest study in the world. To place the right values upon men, to emphasize the right thing in them, to be able to discriminate between the genuine and the false, to be able to pierce their masks and read the real man or woman behind them, he regarded as one of a clergyman's greatest accomplishments. Like Professor Agassiz, who could see wonders in the scale of a fish or a grain of sand, Beecher had an eye like the glass of a microscope, which reveals marvels of beauty in common things. He could see beauty and harmony where others saw only ugliness and discord, because he read the hidden meaning in things. Like Ruskin, he could see the marvelous philosophy, the divine plan, in the lowliest object. He could feel the divine presence in all created things. An exhaustive observation, says Herbert Spencer, is an element of all great success. There is no position in life where a trained eye cannot be made a great success asset. Let's leave it to Oslo, said the physicians at a consultation where a precious life hung by a thread. Then the great Johns Hopkins professor examined the patient. He did not ask questions. His experienced eye drew a conclusion from the slightest evidence. He watched the patient closely, his manner of breathing, the appearance of the eye. Everything was a tell-tale of the patient's condition, which he read as an open book. He saw symptoms which others could not see. He recommended a certain operation, which was performed, and the patient recovered. The majority of those present disagreed with him, but such was their confidence in his power to diagnose a case through symptoms and indications which escape most physicians, that they were willing to leave the whole decision to him. Professor Osler was called a living X-ray machine, with additional eyes in fingertips so familiar with the anatomy that they could detect a growth or displacement so small that it would escape ordinary notice. The power which inheres in a trained faculty of observation is priceless. The education which Beecher got through observation, by keeping his eyes, his ears, and his mind open, meant a great deal more to him and to the world than his college education. He was not a great scholar. He did not stand nearly as high in college as some of his classmates, whom he far outstripped in life, but his mind penetrated to the heart of things. Lincoln was another remarkable example of the possibilities of an education through reflection upon what he observed. His mind stopped and questioned, and extracted the meaning of everything that came within its range. Wherever he went, there was a great interrogation point before him. Everything he saw must give up its secret before he would let it go. He had a passion for knowledge. He yearned to know the meaning of things, the philosophy underlying the common everyday occurrences. Ruskin says, Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. I once travelled abroad with two young men, one of whom was all eyes. Nothing seemed to escape him, and the other never saw anything. The day after leaving a city, the latter could scarcely recall anything of interest, while the former had a genius for absorbing knowledge of every kind through the eye. Things so trivial that his companion did not notice them at all meant a great deal to him. He was a poor student, but he brought home rich treasures from over the sea. The other young man was comparatively rich 
and brought home almost nothing of value. When visiting Lou the Burbank, the wizard horticulturalist, in his famous garden recently, I was much impressed by his marvellous power of seeing things. He had observed the habits of fruits and flowers to such purpose that he has performed miracles in the fields of floriculture and horticulture. Stunted and ugly flowers and fruits, under the eye of this miracle worker, become marvels of beauty. George W. Cortelieu was a stenographer not long ago. Many people thought he would remain a stenographer, but he always kept his eyes open. He was after an opportunity. Promotion was always staring him in the face. He was always looking for the next step above him. He was a shrewd observer. But for this power of seeing things quickly, of absorbing knowledge, he would never have advanced. The youth who would get on must keep his eyes open, his ears open, his mind open. He must be quick, alert, ready. I know a young Turk who has been in this country only a year, yet he speaks our language fluently. He has studied the map of our country. He knows its geography and a great deal of our history, and much about our resources and opportunities. He said that when he landed in New York, it seemed to him that he saw more opportunities in walking every block of our streets than he had ever seen in the whole of Turkey. And he could not understand the lethargy, the lack of ambition, the indifference of our young men to our marvellous possibilities. The efficient man is always growing. He is always accumulating knowledge of every kind. He does not merely look with his eyes. He sees with them. He keeps his ears open. He keeps his mind open to all that is new and fresh and helpful. The majority of people do not see things. They just look at them. The power of keen observation is indicative of a superior mentality, for it is the mind, not the optic nerve, that really sees. Most people are too lazy, mentally, to see things carefully. Close observation is a powerful mental process. The mind is all the time working over the material which the eye brings it, considering, forming opinions, estimating, weighing, balancing, calculating. Careless, indifferent observation does not go back of the eye. If the mind is not focused, the image is not clean-cut, and is not carried with force and distinctness enough to the brain to enable it to get at the truth and to draw accurate conclusions. The observing faculty is particularly susceptible to culture, and is capable of becoming a mighty power. Few people realize what a tremendous success and happiness is possible through the medium of the eye. The telegraph, the sewing machine, the telephone, the telescope, the miracles of electricity, in fact, every great invention of the past or present, every triumph of modern labor-saving machinery, every discovery in science and art, is due to the trained power of seeing things. The whole secret of a richly stored mind is alertness, sharp, keen attention, and thoughtfulness. Indifference, apathy, mental lassitude and laziness are fatal to all effective observation. It does not take long to develop a habit of attention that seizes the salient points of things. It is a splendid drill for children to send them out on the street or out of doors anywhere, just for the purpose of finding out how many things they can see at a certain given time and how closely they can observe them. Just the effort to try to see how much they can remember and bring back is a splendid drill. Children often become passionately fond of this exercise, and it becomes of inestimable value in their lives. Other things equal, it is the keen observer who gets ahead. 
go into a place of business with the eye of an eagle. Let nothing escape you. Ask yourself why it is that the proprietor at fifty or sixty years of age is conducting a business which a boy of eighteen or twenty ought to be able to handle better. Study his employees. Analyze the situation. You will find, perhaps, that he never knew the value of good manners in clerks. He thought a boy, if honest, would make a good salesman, but perhaps, by gruff, uncouth manners, he is driving out of the door customers the proprietor is trying to bring in by advertisements. You will see by his show windows, perhaps, before you go into his store, that there is no business insight, no detection of the wants of possible buyers. If you keep your eyes open, you can, in a little while, find out why this man is not a greater success. You can see that a little more knowledge of human nature would have revolutionized his whole business, multiplied his receipts tenfold in a few years. You will see that this man has not studied men. He does not know them. No matter where you go, study the situation. Think why the man does not do better if he is not doing well. Why he remains in mediocrity all his life. If he is making a remarkable success, try to find out why. Keep your eyes open, your ears open. Make deductions from what you see and hear. Trace difficulties. Look up evidences of success or failure everywhere. It will be one of the greatest factors in your own success. End of chapter 29 Observation as a Success Factor Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 30 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 30 Self Help. I learned that no man in God's wide earth is either willing or able to help any other man. Pestalozzi. What I am, I have made myself. Humphrey Davy Be sure, my son, and remember that the best men always make themselves. Patrick Henry Hereditary bondsmen, know ye not, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Byron who waits to have his task marked out, shall die and leave his errand unfulfilled. Lowell Colonel Crockett makes room for himself, exclaimed a backwoods congressman, in answer to the exclamation of the White House usher to, Make room for Colonel Crockett! This remarkable man was not afraid to oppose the head of a great nation. He preferred being right to being president. Though rough, uncultured, and uncouth, Crockett was a man of great courage and determination. Poverty is uncomfortable, as I can testify, said James A. Garfield. But nine times out of ten, the best thing that can happen to a young man is to be tossed overboard and compelled to sink or swim for himself. In all my acquaintance, I have never known a man to be drowned who was worth the saving. Garfield was the youngest member of the House of Representatives when he entered, but he had not been in his seat sixty days before his ability was recognized and his place conceded. He stepped to the front with the confidence of one who belonged there. He succeeded because all the world in concert could not have kept him in the background, and because when once in the front... He played his part with an intrepidity and a commanding ease that were but the outward evidences 
of the immense reserves of energy on which it was in his power to draw. Take the place and attitude which belongs to you, says Emerson, and all men acquiesce. The world must be just. It leaves every man with profound unconcern to set his own rate. A person under the firm persuasion that he can command resources virtually has them, says Livy. Richard Arkwright, the thirteenth child in a hovel, with no education, no chance, gave his spinning model to the world, and put a sceptre in England's right hand, such as the Queen never wielded. Solario, a wandering gypsy tinker, fell deeply in love with the daughter of the painter called Antonio del Fiore, but was told that no one but a painter as good as the father should wed the maiden. Will you give me ten years to learn to paint, and so entitle myself to the hand of your daughter? Consent was given. Col Antonio, thinking that he would never be troubled further by the gypsy. About the time that the ten years were to end, the king's sister showed Col Antonio a Madonna and a child, which the painter extolled in terms of the highest praise. Judge of his surprise on learning that Solario was the artist. His great determination gained him his bride. Louis Philippe said he was the only sovereign in Europe fit to govern, for he could black his own boots. When asked to name his family coat of arms, a self-made president of the United States replied, A pair of shirt sleeves. It is not the men who have inherited most, except it be in nobility, of soul and purpose, who have risen highest, but rather the men with no start who have won fortunes and have made adverse circumstances a spur to goad them up the steep mount, where fame's proud temple shines afar. To such men every possible goal is accessible, and honest ambition has no height that genius or talent may tread, which has not felt the impress of their feet. You may leave your millions to your son, but have you really given him anything? You cannot transfer the discipline, the experience, the power which the acquisition has given you. You cannot transfer the delight of achieving, the joy felt only in growth, the pride of acquisition, the character which trained habits of accuracy, method, promptness, patience, dispatch, honesty of dealing, politeness of manner have developed. You cannot transfer the skill, sagacity, prudence, foresight, which lie concealed in your wealth. It meant a great deal for you, but means nothing to your heir. In climbing to your fortune, you developed the muscle, stamina, and strength which enabled you to maintain your lofty position, to keep your millions intact. You had the power which comes only from experience, and which alone enables you to stand firm on your dizzy height. Your fortune was experience to you, joy, growth, discipline, and character. To him it will be a temptation, an anxiety, which will probably dwarf him. It was wings to you, it will be a dead weight to him. To you it was education and expansion of your highest powers. To him it may mean inaction, lethargy, indolence, weakness, ignorance. You have taken the priceless spur, necessity, away from him. The spur which has goaded man to nearly all the great achievements in the history of the world. You thought it a kindness to deprive yourself in order that your son might begin where you left off, you thought to spare him the drudgery, the hardships, the deprivations, the lack of opportunities, the meagre education, 
which you had on the old farm. But you have put a crutch into his hand instead of a staff. You have taken away from him the incentive to self-development, to self-elevation, to self-discipline and self-help, without which no real success, no real happiness, no great character is ever possible. His enthusiasm will evaporate, his energy will be dissipated, his ambition, not being stimulated by the struggle for self-elevation, will gradually die away. If you do everything for your son and fight his battles for him, you will have a weakling on your hands at twenty-one. My life is a wreck, said the dying Cyrus W. Field. My fortune gone, my home dishonored. Oh, I was so unkind to Edward when I thought I was being kind. If I had only had firmness enough to compel my boys to earn their living, then they would have known the meaning of money. His table was covered with medals and certificates of honor from many nations, in recognition of his great work for civilization, in mooring two continents side by side in thought, of the fame he had won and could never lose. But grief shook the sands of life as he thought only of the son who had brought disgrace upon a name before unsullied. The wounds were sharper than those of a serpent's tooth. During the great financial crisis of 1857, Maria Mitchell, who was visiting England, asked an English lady what became of daughters when no property was left them. They live on their brothers, was the reply. But what becomes of the American daughters, asked the English lady, when there is no money left? They earn it, was Miss Mitchell's reply. Men who have been bolstered up all their lives are seldom good for anything in a crisis. When misfortune comes, they look around for somebody to lean upon. If the prop is not there, down they go. Once down, they are as helpless as capsized turtles or unhorsed men in armor. Many a frontier boy has succeeded beyond all his expectations simply because all props were early knocked out from under him, and he was obliged to stand upon his own feet. A man's best friends are his ten fingers, said Robert Collier, who brought his wife to America in the steerage. There is no manhood mill which takes in boys and turns out men. What you call no chance may be your only chance. Don't wait for your place to be made for you. Make it yourself. Don't wait for somebody to give you a lift. Lift yourself. Henry Ward Beecher did not wait for a call to a big church with a large salary. He accepted the first pastorate offered him in a little town near Cincinnati. He became literally the light of the church, for he trimmed the lamps, kindled the fires, swept the rooms, and rang the bell. His salary was only about two hundred dollars a year, but he knew that a fine church and a great salary cannot make a great man. It was work and opportunity that he wanted. He felt that if there were anything in him, work would bring it out. When Beethoven was examining the work of Moschelet's, he found written at the end, Finis with God's help. He wrote under it, Man, help yourself. A young man stood listlessly, watching some anglers on a bridge. He was poor and dejected. At length, approaching a basket filled with fish, he sighed, If now I had these, I would be happy. I could sell them and buy food and lodgings. I will give you just as many and just as good, said the owner, who chanced to overhear his words, if you will do me a trifling favor. And what is that? asked the other. Only tend this line 
till I come back. I wish to go on a short errand. The proposal was gladly accepted. The old man was gone so long that the young man began to get impatient. Meanwhile, the fish snapped greedily at the hook, and he lost all his depression in the excitement of pulling them in. When the owner returned, he had caught a large number, counting out from them as many as were in the basket, and presenting them to the youth, the old fisherman said, I fulfill my promise from the fish you have caught, to teach you whenever you see others earning what you need to, waste no time in foolish wishing, but cast a line for yourself. A white squall caught a party of tourists on a lake in Scotland and threatened to capsize the boat. When it seemed that the crisis had really come, the largest and strongest man in the party, in a state of intense fear, said, Let us pray. No, no, my man, shouted the bluff old boatman. Let the little man pray. You take the oar. The grandest fortunes ever accumulated or possessed on earth were and are the fruit of endeavour that had no capital to begin with save energy, intellect, and the will. From Croesus down to Rockefeller, the story is the same, not only in the getting of wealth, but also in the acquirement of eminence. Those men have won most who relied most upon themselves. The male inhabitants in the township of Loferdom, in the county of Hatework, says a printer's squib, found themselves laboring under great inconvenience for want of an easily travelled road between poverty and independence. They therefore petitioned the powers that be to levy a tax upon the property of the entire county for the purpose of laying out a macadamized highway, broad and smooth, and all the way downhill to the latter place. Everyone is the artificer of his own fortune, says Sallust. Man is not merely the architect of his own fate, but he must lay the bricks himself. Bayard Taylor, at twenty-three, wrote, I will become the sculptor of my own mind's statue. His biography shows how often the chisel and hammer were in his hands to shape himself into his ideal. Labor is the only legal tender in the world to true success. The gods sell everything for that, nothing without it. You will never find success marked down. The door to the temple of success is never left open. Everyone who enters makes his own door which closes behind him to all others. Circumstances have rarely favoured great men. They have fought their way to triumph over the road of difficulty and through all sorts of opposition. A lowly beginning and a humble origin are no bar to a great career. The farmer's boys fill many of the greatest places in legislatures, in business, at the bar, in pulpits, in congress, today. Boys of lowly origin have made many of the greatest discoveries, are presidents of our banks and our colleges, of our universities. Our poor boys and girls have written many of our greatest books and have filled the highest places as teachers and journalists. Ask almost any great man in our large cities where he was born and he will tell you it was on a farm or in a small country village. Nearly all of the great capitalists of the city came from the country. Isaac Rich, the founder of Boston University, left Cape Cod for Boston to make his way with a capital of only four dollars. Like Horace Greeley, he could find no opening for a boy. But what of that? He made an opening. He found a board, 
and made it into an oyster stand on the street corner. He borrowed a wheelbarrow and went three miles to an oyster smack, bought three bushels of oysters, and wheeled them to his stand. Soon his little savings amounted to one hundred and thirty dollars, and then he bought a horse and cart. Self-help has accomplished about all the great things of the world. How many young men falter, faint, and dally with their purpose, because they have no capital to start with, and wait and wait for some good luck to give them a lift. But success is the child of drudgery and perseverance. It cannot be coaxed or bribed. Pay the price, and it is yours. Where is the boy today who has less chance to rise in the world than Elihu Burit, apprenticed to a blacksmith, in whose shop he had to work at the forge all the daylight, and often by candlelight? Yet he managed, by studying with a book before him at his meals, carrying it in his pocket that he might utilize every spare moment, and studying at night and holidays to pick up an excellent education in the odds and ends of time which most boys throw away. While the rich boy and the idler were yawning and stretching and getting their eyes open, young Burit had seized the opportunity and improved it. At thirty years of age he was master of every important language in Europe and was studying those of Asia. What chance had such a boy for distinction? Probably not a single youth will read this book who has not a better opportunity for success. Yet he had a thirst for knowledge and a desire for self-improvement, which overcame every obstacle in his pathway. If the youth of America who are struggling against cruel circumstances to do something and be somebody in the world could only understand that 90% of what is called genius is merely the result of persistent, determined industry, in most cases of downright hard work, that it is the slavery to a single idea which has given to many a mediocre talent the reputation of being a genius, they would be inspired with new hope. It is interesting to note that the men who talk most about genius are the men who like to work the least. The lazier the man, the more he will have to say about great things being done by genius. The greatest geniuses have been the greatest workers. Sheridan was considered a genius, but it was found that the brilliance and offhand sayings with which he used to dazzle the House of Commons were elaborated, polished, and repolished, and put down in his memorandum book, ready for any emergency. Genius has been well defined as the infinite capacity for taking pains. If men who have done great things could only reveal to the struggling youth of today how much of their reputations was due to downright hard digging and plodding, what an uplift of inspiration and encouragement they would give how often I have wished that the discouraged, struggling youth could know of the heartaches, the headaches, the nerve aches, the disheartening trials, the discouraged hours, the fears and the despair involved in works which have gained the admiration of the world, but which have taxed the utmost powers of their authors. You can read in a few minutes or a few hours a poem or a book with only pleasure and delight. But the days and months of weary plodding over details and dreary drudgery, often required to produce it, would stagger belief. The greatest works in literature have been elaborated and elaborated, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, often rewritten a dozen times. The drudgery which literary men have put into the productions, which have stood the test of time, is almost incredible. Lucretius worked nearly a lifetime on one poem. 
it completely absorbed his life. It is said that Bryant rewrote Thanatopsis a hundred times, and even then was not satisfied with it. John Foster would sometimes linger a week over a single sentence. He would hack, split, prune, pull up by the roots, or practice any other severity on whatever he wrote, till it gained his consent to exist. Chalmers was once asked what Foster was about in London. Hard at it, he replied, at the rate of a line a week. Even Lord Bacon, one of the greatest geniuses that ever lived, at his death left large numbers of manuscripts filled with sudden thoughts set down for use. Hume toiled thirteen hours a day on his History of England. Lord Eldon astonished the world with his great legal learning. But when he was a student, too poor to buy books, he had actually borrowed and copied many hundreds of pages of large law books. Matthew Hale for years studied law sixteen hours a day. Speaking of Fox, someone declared that he wrote drop by drop. Rousseau says of the labor involved in his smooth and lively style, My manuscripts, blotted, scratched, interlined, and scarcely legible, attest the trouble they cost me. There is not one of them which I have not been obliged to transcribe four or five times before it went to press. Some of my periods I have turned or returned in my head for five or six nights before they were fit to be put to paper. Beethoven probably surpassed all other musicians in his painstaking fidelity and persistent application. There is scarcely a bar in his music that was not written and rewritten at least a dozen times. His favorite maxim was, The barriers are not yet erected which can say to aspiring talent and industry, thus far and no further. Gibbon wrote his autobiography nine times, and was in his study every morning, summer and winter at six o'clock, and yet youth who waste their evenings wonder at the genius which can produce the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, upon which Gibbon worked twenty years. Even Plato, one of the greatest writers that ever lived, wrote the first sentence in his Republic nine different ways before he was satisfied with it. Burke wrote the conclusion of his speech at the trial of Hastings sixteen times, and Butler his famous analogy twenty times. It took Virgil seven years to write his Georgics, and twelve years to write the Aeneid. He was so displeased with the latter that he attempted to rise from his deathbed to commit it to the flames. Hayden was very poor. His father was a coachman, and he, friendless and lonely, married a servant girl. He was sent away from home to act as errand boy for a music teacher. He absorbed a great deal of information, but he had a hard life of persecution until he became a barber in Vienna. Here he blacked boots for an influential man, who became a friend to him. In 1798 this poor boy's oratorio, The Creation, came upon the musical world like the rising of a new sun which never set. He was courted by princes and dined with kings and queens. His reputation was made. There was no more barbering, no more poverty, but of his 800 compositions, the creation eclipsed them all. He died while Napoleon's guns were bombarding Vienna, some of the shot falling in his garden. When a man like Lord Kavanagh, without arms or legs, manages to put himself into Parliament, when a man like Francis Joseph Campbell, a blind man, becomes a distinguished mathematician, a musician, and a great philanthropist. We get a hint as to what it means to make the most possible out of ourselves and our opportunities. 
perhaps ninety-nine of a hundred under such unfortunate circumstances would be content to remain helpless objects of charity for life. If it is your call to acquire money power instead of brain power, to acquire business power instead of professional power, double your talent just the same, no matter what it may be. A glover's apprentice of Glasgow, Scotland, who was too poor to afford even a candle or a fire, and who studied by the light of the shop windows in the streets, and when the shops were closed, climbed the lamp post, holding his book in one hand and clinging to the lamp post with the other. This poor boy, with less chance than almost any boy in America, became the most eminent scholar of Scotland. Francis Parkman, half blind, became one of America's greatest historians in spite of everything, because he made himself such. Personal value is a coin of one's own minting. One is taken at the worth he has put into himself. Franklin was but a poor printer's boy, whose highest luxury at one time was only a penny roll, eaten in the streets of Philadelphia. Michael Faraday was a poor boy, son of a blacksmith, who apprenticed him at the age of thirteen to a bookbinder in London. Michael laid the foundations of his future greatness by making himself familiar with the contents of the books he bound. He remained at night, after others had gone, to read and study the precious volumes. Lord Tenterden was proud to point out to his son the shop where he had shaved for a penny. A French doctor once taunted Fletcher, Bishop of Nismay, who had been a tallow chandler in his youth, with the meanness of his origin, to which he replied, If you had been born in the same condition that I was, you would still have been but a maker of candles. Edwin Chadwick, in his report to the British Parliament, stated that children, working on half-time, that is, studying three hours a day and working the rest of their time out of doors, really made the greatest intellectual progress during the year. Businessmen have often accomplished wonders during the busiest lives by simply devoting one, two, three or four hours daily to study or other literary work. James Watt received only the rudiments of an education at school, for his attendance was irregular on account of delicate health. He more than made up for all deficiencies, however, by the diligence with which he pursued his studies at home. Alexander V was a beggar. He was born mud and died marble. William Herschel, placed at the age of fourteen as a musician in the band of the Hanoverian Guards, devoted all his leisure to philosophical studies. He acquired a large fund of general knowledge, and in astronomy, a science in which he was wholly self-instructed, his discoveries entitled him to rank with the greatest astronomers of all time. George Washington was the son of a widow, born under the roof of a Westmoreland farmer. Almost from infancy his lot had been that of an orphan. No academy had welcomed him to its shade. No college crowned him with its honours. To read, to write, to cipher, these had been his degrees in knowledge. Shakespeare learned little more than reading and writing at school, but by self-culture he made himself the great master among literary men. Burns, too, enjoyed few advantages of education, and his youth was passed in almost abject poverty. James Ferguson, the son of a half-starved peasant, learned to read by listening to the recitations of one of his elder brothers. While a mere boy, he discovered several mechanical principles, made models of mills, and spinning wheels, and by means of beads on strings, worked out an excellent map of the heavens. 
Ferguson made remarkable things with a common penknife. How many great men have mounted the hill of knowledge by out-of-the-way paths? Gifford worked his intricate problems with a shoemaker's awl on a bit of leather. Rittenhouse first calculated eclipses on his plough handle. Columbus, while leading the life of a sailor, managed to become the most accomplished geographer and astronomer of his time. When Peter the Great, a boy of seventeen, became the absolute ruler of Russia, his subjects were little better than savages, and in himself even the passions and propensities of barbarism were so strong that they were frequently exhibited during his whole career. But he determined to transform himself and the Russians into civilized people. He instituted reforms with great energy, and at the age of twenty-six started on a visit to the other countries of Europe for the purpose of learning about their arts and institutions. At Sardom, Holland, he was so impressed with the sights of the great East India dockyard that he apprenticed himself to a shipbuilder and helped to build the St. Peter, which he promptly purchased. Continuing his travels, after he had learned his trade, he worked in England in paper mills, sawmills, rope yards, watchmakers' shops, and other manufactories, doing the work and receiving the treatment of a common laborer. While traveling, his constant habit was to obtain as much information as he could beforehand with regard to every place he was to visit, and he would demand, let me see all. When setting out on his investigations on such occasions, he carried his tablets in his hand, and whatever he deemed worthy of remembrance was carefully noted down. He would often leave his carriage if he saw the country people at work by the wayside as he passed along, and not only enter into conversation with them on agricultural affairs, but also accompany them to their homes, examine their furniture, and take drawings of their implements of husbandry. Thus he obtained much minute and correct knowledge, which he would scarcely have acquired by other means, and which he afterward turned to admirable account in the improvement of his own country. The ancients said, Know thyself. The twentieth century says, Help thyself. Self-culture gives a second birth to the soul. A liberal education is a true regeneration. When a man is once liberally educated, he will generally remain a man, not shrink to a mannequin, nor dwindle to a brute. But if he is not properly educated, if he has merely been crammed and stuffed through college, if he has merely a broken-down memory from trying to hold crammed facts enough to pass the examination, he will continue to shrink, shrivel, and dwindle, often below his original proportions, for he will lose both his confidence and self-respect as his crammed facts, which never became a part of himself, evaporate from his distended memory. Every bit of education or culture is of great advantage in the struggle for existence. The microscope does not create anything new, but it reveals marvels. To educate the eye adds to its magnifying power until it sees beauty where before it saw only ugliness. It reveals a world we never suspected and finds the greatest beauty even in the commonest things. The eye of an Agassiz could see worlds of which the uneducated eye never dreamed. The cultured hand can do a thousand things the uneducated hand cannot do. It becomes graceful, steady of nerve, strong, skillful. Indeed, it almost seems to think, so animated is it with intelligence. The cultured will can seize, grasp, and hold the possessor with irresistible power and nerve, 
to almost superhuman effort. The educated touch can almost perform miracles. The educated taste can achieve wonders almost past belief. When a contrast between the cultured, logical, profound, masterly reason of a Gladstone and that of the hod carrier who has never developed or educated his reason beyond what is necessary to enable him to mix mortar and carry brick. Be careful to avoid that over-intellectual culture which is purchased at the expense of moral vigor. An observant professor of one of our colleges has remarked that the mind may be so rounded and polished by education and so well balanced as not to be energetic in any one faculty. In other men not thus trained, the sense of deficiency and of the sharp, jagged corners of their knowledge leads to efforts to fill up the chasms, rendering them at last far better educated men than the polished, easy-going graduate who has just knowledge enough to prevent consciousness of his ignorance. While all the faculties of the mind should be cultivated, it is yet desirable that it should have two or three rough-hewn features of massive strength. Young men are too apt to forget the great end of life, which is to be and to do, not to read and brood over what other men have been and done. I repeat that my object is not to give him knowledge, but to teach him how to acquire it at need, said Rousseau. All learning is self-teaching. It is upon the working of the pupil's own mind that his progress in knowledge depends. The great business of the master is to teach the pupil to teach himself. Thinking, not growth, makes manhood, says Isaac Taylor. Accustom yourself, therefore, to thinking. Set yourself to understand whatever you see or read. To join thinking with reading is one of the first maxims and one of the easiest operations. How few think justly of the thinking few. How many never think, who think they do. End of chapter 30 Self-Help Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 31 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 31 The Self Improvement Habit. If you want knowledge, you must toil for it. Ruskin. We excuse our sloth under the pretext of difficulty. Quintilian. What sculpture is to a block of marble, education is to the human soul. Addison. A boy is better unborn than untaught. Gascogne. It is ignorance that wastes. It is knowledge that saves. An untaught faculty is at once quiescent and dead. N. D. Hillis. The plea that this or that man has no time for culture will vanish as soon as we desire culture, so much that we begin to examine seriously into our present use of time. Matthew Arnold Education, as commonly understood, is the process of developing the mind by means of books and teachers. When education has been neglected, either by reason of lack of of opportunity, or because advantage was not taken of the opportunities afforded, the one remaining hope is self-improvement. Opportunities for self-improvement surround us. The helps to self-improvement are abundant. 
and in this day of cheap books and free libraries, there can be no good excuse for neglect to use the faculties for mental growth and development which are so abundantly supplied. When we look at the difficulties which hindered the acquisition of knowledge fifty years to a century ago, the scarcity and the costliness of books, the value of the dimmest candlelight, the unremitting toil which left so little time for study, the physical weariness which had to be overcome to enable mental exertion in study, we may well marvel at the giants of scholarship those days of hardship produced. And when we add to educational limitations, physical disabilities, blindness, deformity, ill health, hunger and cold, we may feel shame as we contemplate the fullness of modern opportunity and the helps and incentives to study and self-development which are so lavishly provided for our use and inspiration and of which we make so little use. Self-improvement implies one essential feeling, the desire for improvement. If the desire exists, then improvement is usually accomplished only by the conquest of self, the material self, which seeks pleasure and amusement. The novel, the game of cards, the billiard cue, idle, whittling and storytelling will have to be eschewed, and every available moment of leisure turned to account. For all who seek self-improvement, there is a lion in the way the lion of self-indulgence, and it is only by the conquest of this enemy that progress is assured. Show me how a youth spends his evenings, his odd bits of time, and I will forecast his future. Does he look upon this leisure as precious, rich in possibilities, as containing golden material for his future life structure? Or does he look upon it as an opportunity for self-indulgence, for a light, flippant, good time. The way he spends his leisure will give the keynote of his life, will tell whether he is dead in earnest or whether he looks upon it as a huge joke. He may not be conscious of the terrible effects, the gradual deterioration of character, which comes from a frivolous wasting of his evenings and half-holidays, but the character is being undermined just the same. Young men are often surprised to find themselves dropping behind their competitors. But if they will examine themselves, they will find that they have stopped growing because they have ceased their effort to keep abreast of the times, to be widely read, to enrich life with self-culture. It is the right use of spare moments in reading and study which qualify men for leadership and in many historic cases the spare moments utilized for study were not spare in the sense of being the spare time of leisure. They were rather spared moments. Moments spared from sleep, from meal times, from recreation. Where is the boy today who has less chance to rise in the world than Elihu Burit, apprenticed at sixteen to a blacksmith, in his shop, he had to work at the forge all the daylight, and often by candlelight. Yet he managed, by studying with a book before him at his meals, carrying it in his pocket, that he might utilize every spare moment, and studying nights and holidays, to pick up an excellent education in the odds and ends of time which most boys throw away while the rich boy and the idler were yawning and stretching and getting their eyes open, young Burit had seized the opportunity and improved it. He had a thirst for knowledge and a desire for self-improvement, which overcame every obstacle in his pathway. A wealthy gentleman offered to pay his expenses at Harvard. But no, Elihu said he could get his education himself even though he had to work twelve or fourteen hours a day at the forge. Here was a determined boy. He snatched every spare moment at the anvil and forge 
as if it were gold. He believed with Gladstone that thrift of time would repay him in after years with usury, and that waste of it would make him dwindle. Think of a boy working nearly all the daylight in a blacksmith shop, and yet finding time to study seven languages in a single year. It is not lack of ability that holds men down, but lack of industry. In many cases the employee has a better brain, a better mental capacity than his employer, but he does not improve his faculties. He dulls his mind by cigarette smoking. He spends his money at the pool table, theatre, or dance, and as he grows old and the harness of perpetual service galls him, he grumbles at his lack of luck, his limited opportunity. The number of perpetual clerks is constantly being recruited by those who do not think it worth while as boys to learn to write a good hand or to master the fundamental branches of knowledge requisite in a business career. The ignorance common among young men and young women, in factories, stores, and offices, everywhere. In fact, in this land of opportunity, where youth should be well educated, is a pitiable thing in American life. On every hand we see men and women of ability occupying inferior positions because they did not think it worth while in youth to develop their powers and to concentrate their attention on the acquisition of sufficient knowledge. Thousands of men and women find themselves held back, handicapped for life, because of the seeming trifles which they did not think it worth while to pay attention to in their early days. Many a girl of good natural ability spends her most productive years as a cheap clerk, or in a mediocre position, because she never thought it worth while to develop her mental faculties, or to take advantage of opportunities within reach to fit herself for a superior position. Thousands of girls, unexpectedly thrown on their own resources, have been held down all their lives because of neglected tasks in youth, which at the time were dismissed with a careless, I don't think it worth while. They did not think it would pay to go to the bottom of any study at school, to learn to keep accounts accurately, or fit themselves to do anything in such a way as to be able to make a living by it. They expected to marry, and never prepared for being dependent on themselves, a contingency against which marriage, in many instances, is no safeguard. The trouble with most youths is that they are not willing to fling the whole weight of their being into their location. They want short hours, little work, and a lot of play. They think more of leisure and pleasure than of discipline and training in their great life specialty. Many a clerk envies his employer and wishes that he could go into business for himself, be an employer too. But it is too much work to make the effort to rise above a clerkship. He likes to take life easy and he wonders idly whether, after all, it is worth while to strain and strive and struggle and study to prepare oneself for the sake of getting up a little higher and making a little more money. The trouble with a great many people is that they are not willing to make present sacrifices for future gain. They prefer to have a good time as they go along, rather than spend time in self-improvement. They have a sort of vague wish to do something great, but few have that intensity of longing which impels them to make the sacrifice of the present for the future. Few are willing to work underground for years, laying a foundation for the life monument. They yearn for greatness, but their yearning is not the kind which is willing to pay any price in endeavor or make any sacrifice for its object. So in the majority, slide along, in mediocrity, 
all their lives. They have ability for something higher up, but they have not the energy and determination to prepare for it. They do not care to make necessary effort. They prefer to take life easier and lower down rather than to struggle for something higher. They do not play the game for all they are worth. If a man or woman has but the disposition for self-improvement and advancement, he will find opportunity to rise, or what he cannot find, create. Here is an example from the everyday life going on around us and in which we are all taking part. A young Irishman who had reached the age of 19 or 20 without learning to read or write and who left home because of the intemperance that prevailed there, learned to read a little by studying billboards, and eventually got a position as steward aboard a man of war. He chose that occupation and got leave to serve at the captain's table because of a great desire to learn. He kept a little table in his coat pocket, and whenever he heard a new word, wrote it down. One day an officer saw him writing and immediately suspected him of being a spy. When he and the other officers learned what the tablet was used for, the young man was given more opportunities to learn, and these led in time to promotions, until, finally, the sometime steward won a prominent position in the Navy. Success as a naval officer prepared the way for success in other fields. Self-help has accomplished about all the great things of the world. How many young men falter, faint, and dally with their purpose because they have no capital to start with and wait and wait for some good luck to give them a lift? But success is the child of drudgery and perseverance. It cannot be coaxed or bribed. Pay the price and it is yours. One of the sad things about the neglected opportunities for self-improvement is that it puts people of great natural ability at a disadvantage among those who are their mental inferiors. I know a member of one of our city legislatures, a splendid fellow, immensely popular, who has a great, generous heart and broad sympathies, but who cannot open his mouth without so murdering the English language that it is really painful to listen to him. There are a great many similar examples in Washington of men who have been elected to important positions because of their great natural ability and fine characters, but who are constantly mortified and embarrassed by their ignorance and lack of early training. One of the most humiliating experiences that can ever come to a human being is to be conscious of possessing more than ordinary ability, and yet be tied to an inferior position because of lack of early and intelligent training commensurate with his ability. To be conscious that one has ability to realize 80 or 90 percent of his possibilities, if he had only had the proper education and training, but because of this lack, to be unable to bring out more than 25% of it on account of ignorance is humiliating and embarrassing. In other words, to go through life conscious that you are making a botch of your capabilities just because of lack of training is a most depressing thing. Nothing else outside of sin causes more sorrow than that which comes from not having prepared for the highest career possible to one. There are no bitterer regrets than those which come from being obliged to let opportunities pass by, for which one never prepared himself. I know a pitiable case of a born naturalist, whose ambition was so suppressed, and whose education so neglected in youth, that later when he came to know more about natural history than almost any man of his day, he could not write a grammatical sentence, and could never make his ideas live in words, perpetuate them in books, because of his ignorance of even the rudiments of an education. 
His early vocabulary was so narrow and pinched, and his knowledge of his language so limited, that he always seemed to be painfully struggling for words to express his thought. Think of the suffering of this splendid man, who was conscious of possessing colossal scientific knowledge, and yet was absolutely unable to express himself grammatically. How often stenographers are mortified by the use of some unfamiliar word or term or quotation because of the shallowness of their preparation. It is not enough to be able to take dictation when ordinary letters are given, not enough to do the ordinary routine of office work. The ambitious stenographer must be prepared for the unusual demand, must have good reserves of knowledge to draw from in case of emergency. But if she is constantly slipping up upon her grammar, or is all at sea the moment she steps out of her ordinary routine, her employer knows that her preparation is shallow, that her education is very limited, and her prospects will be limited also. A young lady writes me that she is so handicapped by the lack of an early education that she fairly dreads to write a letter to anyone of education or culture for fear of making ignorant mistakes in grammar and spelling. Her letter indicates that she has a great deal of natural ability, yet she is much limited and always placed at a disadvantage because of this lack of an early education. It is difficult to conceive of a greater misfortune than always to be embarrassed and handicapped just because of the neglect of those early years. I am often pained by letters from people, especially young people, which indicate that the writers have a great deal of natural ability, that they have splendid minds, but a large part of their ability is covered up, rendered ineffectual by their ignorance. Many of these letters show that the writers are like diamonds in the rough, with only here and there a little facet ground off, just enough to let in the light and reveal the great hidden wealth within. I always feel sorry for these people who have passed the school age and who will probably go through life with splendid minds, handicapped by their ignorance, which, even late in life, they might largely or entirely overcome. It is such a pity that, a young man, for instance, who has the natural ability which would make him a leader among men, must, for the lack of a little training, a little preparation, work for somebody else, perhaps with but half of his ability, but with a better preparation, more education. Everywhere we see clerks, mechanics, employees in all walks of life who cannot rise to anything like positions which correspond with their natural ability because they have not had the education. They are ignorant. They cannot write a decent letter. They murder the English language and hence their superb ability cannot be demonstrated and remains in mediocrity. The parable of the talents illustrates and enforces one of nature's sternest laws. To him that hath shall be given. From him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Scientists call this law the survival of the fittest. The fittest are those who use what they have, who gain strength by struggle, and who survive by self-development by control of their hostile or helpful environment. The soil, the sunshine, the atmosphere are very liberal with the material for the growth of the plant or the tree. But the plant must use all it gets. It must work it up into flowers, into fruit, into leaf or fiber or something or the supply will cease. In other words, the soil will not send any more building material up the sap than is used for growth, 
and the faster this material is used, the more rapid the growth, the more abundantly the material will come. The same law holds good everywhere. Nature is liberal with us if we utilize what she gives us. But if we stop using it, if we do not transform what she gives us into power, if we do not do some building somewhere, if we do not transform the material which she gives us into force and utilize that force, we not only find the supply cut off, but we find that we are growing weaker, less efficient. Everything in nature is on the move, either one way or the other. It is either going up or down. It is either advancing or retrograding. We cannot hold without using. Nature withdraws muscle or brain if we do not use them. She withdraws skill the moment we stop drilling efficiently, the moment we stop using our power. The force is withdrawn when we cease exercising it. A college graduate is often surprised, years after he leaves the college, to find that about all he has to show for his education is his diploma. The power, the efficiency which he gained there has been lost because he has not been using them. He thought at the time that everything was still fresh in his mind after his examination, that his knowledge would remain with him. But it has been slipping away from him every minute since he stopped using it, and only that has remained and increased which he has used. The rest has evaporated. A great many college graduates ten years afterwards find that they have but very little left to show for their four years course because they have not utilized their knowledge. They have become weaklings without knowing it. They constantly say to themselves, I have a college education. I must have some ability. I must amount to something in the world. But the college diploma has no more power to hold the knowledge you have gained in college than a piece of tissue paper over a gas jet can hold the gas in the pipe. Everything which you do not use is constantly slipping away from you. Use it or lose it. The secret of power is use. Ability will not remain with us. Force will evaporate the moment we cease to do something with it. The tools for self-improvement are at your hand. Use them. If the axe is dull, the more strength must be put forth. If your opportunities are limited, you must use more energy, put forth more effort. Progress may seem slow at first, but perseverance assures success. Line upon line, and precept upon precept, is the rule of mental upbuilding and in due time ye shall reap if ye faint not. End of chapter 31 The Self-Improvement Habit Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 32 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 32 Raising of Values. Destiny is not about thee, but within. Thyself must make thyself. The world is no longer clay, but rather iron in the hands of its workers, says Emerson and men have got to hammer out a place for themselves by steady and rugged blows. To make the most of your stuff, be it cloth, iron, or character, this is success. Raising common stuff, 
to priceless value is great success. The man who first takes the rough bar of wrought iron may be a blacksmith who has only partly learned his trade and has no ambition to rise above his anvil. He thinks that the best possible thing he can do with his bar is to make it into horseshoes and congratulate himself upon his success. He reasons that the rough lump of iron is worth only two or three cents a pound, and that it is not worth while to spend much time or labor on it. His enormous muscles and small skill have raised the value of the iron from one dollar, perhaps, to ten dollars. Along comes a cutler with a little better education, a little more ambition, a little finer perception and says to the blacksmith, Is this all you can see in that iron? Give me a bar, and I will show you what brains and skill and hard work can make of it. He sees a little further into the rough bar. He has studied many processes of hardening and tempering. He has tools, grinding and polishing wheels, and annealing furnaces. The iron is fused, carbonized into steel, drawn out, forged, tempered, heated white-hot, plunged into cold water or oil to improve its temper, and ground and polished with great care and patience. When this work is done, he shows the astonished blacksmith two thousand dollars worth of knife blades, where the latter only saw ten dollars worth of crude horseshoes. The value has been greatly raised by the refining process. Knife blades are all very well, if you can make nothing better, says another artisan, to whom the cutler has shown the triumph of his art. But you haven't half brought out what is in that bar of iron. I see a higher and better use. I have made a study of iron and know what there is in it and what can be made of it. This artisan has a more delicate touch, a finer perception, a better training, a higher ideal, and superior determination, which enable him to look still further into the molecules of the rough bar, past the horseshoes, past the knife blades, and he turns the crude iron into the finest cambric needles with eyes cut with microscopic exactness. The production of the invisible points requires a more delicate process, a finer grade of skill, than the cutler possesses. This feat the last workman considers marvelous, and he thinks he has exhausted the possibilities of the iron. He has multiplied many times the value of the cutler's product. But behold! Another very skillful mechanic, with a more finely organized mind, a more delicate touch, more patience, more industry, a higher order of skill, and a better training, passes with ease by the horseshoes, the knife blades, and the needles, and returns the product of his bar in fine mainsprings for watches. Where the others saw horseshoes, knife blades, or needles, worth only a few thousand dollars, his penetrating eye saw a product worth one hundred thousand dollars. A higher artist, artisan, appears, who tells us that the rough bar has not even yet found its highest expression that he possesses the magic that can perform a still greater miracle in iron. To him, even mainsprings seem coarse and clumsy. He knows that the crude iron can be manipulated and coaxed into an elasticity that cannot even be imagined by one less trained in metallurgy. He knows that, if care enough be used in tempering the steel, it will not be stiff, trenchant, and merely a passive metal, but so full of its new qualities that it almost seems instinct with life, with penetrating, almost clairvoyant vision, 
this artist artisan sees how every process of mainspring making can be carried further and how at every stage of manufacture more perfection can be reached how the texture of the metal can be so much refined that even a fiber a slender thread of it can do marvelous work he puts his bar through many processes of refinement and fine tempering and in triumph turns his product into almost invisible coils of delicate hair springs after infinite toil and pain he has made his dream true he has raised the few dollars worth of iron to a value of one million dollars perhaps forty times the value of the same weight of gold still another workman whose processes are so almost infinitely delicate whose product is so little known by even the average educated man that his trade is unmentioned by the makers of dictionaries and encyclopedias takes but a fragment of one of the bars of steel and develops its higher possibilities with such marvelous accuracy such ethereal fineness of touch that even mainsprings and hairsprings are looked back upon as coarse crude and cheap when his work is done he shows you a few of the minutely barbed instruments used by dentists to draw out the finest branches of the dental nerves while a pound of gold roughly speaking is worth about two hundred and fifty dollars a pound of these slender barbed filaments of steel if a pound could be collected might be worth hundreds of times as much other experts may still further refine the product but it will be many a day before the best will exhaust the possibilities of a metal that can be subdivided until its particles will float in the air it sounds magical but the magic is only that wrought by the application of the homeliest virtues by the training of the eye the hand the perception by painstaking care by hard work and by determination and grit if a metal possessing only a few coarse material qualities is capable of such marvelous increase in value by mixing brains with its molecules who shall set bounds to the possibilities of the development of a human being that wonderful compound of physical mental moral and spiritual forces whereas in the development of iron a dozen processes are possible a thousand influences may be brought to bear upon mind and character while the iron is an inert mass acted upon by external influences only the human being is a bundle of forces acting and counteracting yet all capable of control and direction by the higher self the real dominating personality the difference in human attainment is due only slightly to the original material it is the ideal followed and unfolded the effort made the processes of education and experience undergone that fuse hammer and mold our life bar into its ultimate development life everyday life has counterparts of all the tortures the iron undergoes and through them it comes to its highest expression the blows of opposition the struggles amid want and woe the fiery trials of disaster and bereavement the crushings of iron circumstances the raspings of care and anxiety the grinding of constant difficulties the rebuffs that chill enthusiasm the weariness of years of dry dreary drudgery in education and discipline all these are necessary to the man who would reach the highest success the iron by this manipulation is strengthened refined made more elastic or more resistant and adapted to the use each artisan dreams of if every blow should fracture it 
if every furnace should burn the life out of it, if every roller should pulverize it, of what use would it be? It has that virtue, those qualities that withstand all, that draw profit from every test, and come out triumphant in the end. In the iron, the qualities are, in the main, inherent. But in ourselves, they are largely matters of growth, culture, and development, and all are subject to the dominating will. Just as each artisan sees in the crude iron some finished, refined product, so must we see in our lives glorious possibilities, if we would but realize them. If we see only horseshoes or knife blades, all our efforts and struggles will never produce hairsprings. We must realize our own adaptability to great ends. We must resolve to struggle, to endure trials and tests, to pay the necessary price, confident that the result will pay us for our suffering, our trials, and our efforts. Those who shrink from the forging, the rolling, and the drawing out are the ones who fail, the nobodies, the faulty characters, the criminals. Just as a bar of iron, if exposed to the elements, will oxidize and become worthless, so will character deteriorate if there is no constant effort to improve its form to increase its ductility, to temper it, or to better it in some way. It is easy to remain a common bar of iron, or comparatively so, by becoming merely a horseshoe. But it is hard to raise your life product to higher values. Many of us consider our natural gift bars poor, mean, and inadequate compared with those of others, but if we are willing, by patience, toil, study, and struggle, to hammer, draw out, and refine, to work on and up from clumsy horseshoes to delicate hairsprings, we can, by infinite patience and persistence, raise the value of the raw material to almost fabulous heights. It was thus that Columbus, the weaver, Franklin, the journeyman printer, Aesop, the slave, Homer, the beggar, Demosthenes, the cutler's son, Ben Jonson, the bricklayer, Cervantes, the common soldier, and Hayden, the poor wheelwright's son, developed their powers until they towered head and shoulders above other men. There is very little difference between the material given to a hundred average boys and girls at birth, yet one with no better means of improvement than the others, perhaps with infinitely poorer means, will raise his material in value a hundredfold, five hundredfold, ay, a thousandfold, while the ninety-nine will wonder why their material remains so coarse and crude, and will attribute their failure to hard luck. While one boy is regretting his want of opportunities, his lack of means to get a college education, and remains in ignorance, another, with half his chances, picks up a good education in the odds and ends of time which other boys throw away. From the same material, one man builds a palace and another a hovel. From the same rough piece of marble, one man calls out an angel of beauty which delights every beholder, another a hideous monster which demoralizes everyone who sees it. The extent to which you can raise the value of your life bar depends very largely upon yourself. Whether you go upward to the mainspring or hairspring stage depends very largely upon your ideal, your determination to be the higher thing, upon your having the grit to be hammered, 
to be drawn out, to be thrust from the fire into cold water or oil in order to get the proper temper. Of course, it is hard and painful, and it takes lots of stamina to undergo the processes that produce the finest product. But would you prefer to remain a rough bar of iron or a horseshoe all your life? End of chapter 32 Raising of Values Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 33 of Pushing to the Front by Arisen Sweat Marden This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 33 Self-Improvement Through Public Speaking It does not matter whether you want to be a public speaker or not. Everybody should have such complete control of himself, should be so self-centered and self-posed that he can get up in any audience, no matter how large or formidable, and express his thoughts clearly and distinctly. Self-expression in some manner is the only means of developing mental power. It may be in music, it may be on canvas, it may be through oratory, it may come through selling goods or writing a book, but it must come through self-expression. Self-expression in any legitimate form tends to call out what is in a man, his resourcefulness, inventiveness. But no other form of self-expression develops a man so thoroughly and so effectively, and so quickly unfolds all of his powers as expression before an audience. It is doubtful whether anyone can reach the highest standard of culture without studying the art of expression, especially public vocal expression. In all ages, oratory has been regarded as the highest expression of human achievement. Young people, no matter what they intend to be, whether blacksmith or farmer, merchant or physician, should make it a study. Nothing else will call out what is in a man so quickly and so effectively as the constant effort to do his best in speaking before an audience. When one undertakes to think on his feet and speak extemporaneously before the public, the power and the skill of the entire man are put to a severe test. The writer has the advantage of being able to wait for his moods. He can write when he feels like it, and he knows that he can burn his manuscript again and again if it does not suit him. There are not a thousand eyes upon him. He does not have a great audience criticizing every sentence, weighing every thought. He does not have to step upon the scales of every listener's judgment to be weighed, as does the orator. A man may write as listlessly as he pleases, use much or little of his brain or energy, just as he chooses or feels like doing. No one is watching him. His pride and vanity are not touched, and what he writes may never be seen by anyone. Then there is always a chance for revision. In conversation we do not feel that so much depends upon our words. Only a few persons hear them, and perhaps no one will ever think of them again. In music, whether vocal or instrumental, what one gives out is only partially one's own. The rest is the composer's. Yet anyone who lays any claim to culture should train himself to think on his feet, so that he can at a moment's notice rise and express himself intelligently. The occasions for little speaking are increasing enormously. A great many questions which used to be settled in the office are now discussed and settled at dinners. All sorts of business deals are now carried through at dinners. There was never before any such demand for dinner oratory as today. We know men who have, by the dint of hard work and persistent grit, lifted themselves into positions of prominence, 
and yet they are not able to stand on their feet in public, even to make a few remarks, or scarcely to put a motion without trembling like an aspen leaf. They had plenty of opportunities when they were young, at school, in debating clubs, to get rid of their self-consciousness, and to acquire ease and facility in public speaking. But they always shrank from every opportunity, because they were timid or felt that somebody else could handle the debate or questions better. There are plenty of businessmen today who would give a great deal of money if they could only go back and improve the early opportunities for learning to think and speak on their feet, which they threw away. Now they have money, they have position, but they are nobodies when called upon to speak in public. All they can do is to look foolish, blush, stammer out an apology, and sit down. Some time ago, I was at a public meeting when a man who stands very high in the community, who is king in his specialty, was called upon to give his opinion upon the matter under consideration, and he got up and trembled and stammered and could scarcely say his soul was his own. He could not even make a decent appearance. He had power and a great deal of experience, but there he stood as helpless as a child, and he felt cheap, mortified, embarrassed, and probably would have given anything if he had early in life trained himself to get himself in hand, so that he could think on his feet and say with power and effectiveness that which he knew. At the very meeting where this strong man, who had the respect and confidence of everybody who knew him, and who made such a miserable failure of his attempt to give his opinion upon an important public matter on which he was well posted, being so confused and self-conscious and stage-struck that he could say scarcely anything, a shallow-brained businessman in the same city who hadn't a hundredth part of the other man's practical power in affairs, got up and made a brilliant speech and strangers no doubt thought that he was much the stronger man. He had simply cultivated the ability to say his best thing on his feet, and the other man had not, and was placed at a tremendous disadvantage. A very brilliant young man in New York, who has climbed to a responsible position in a very short time, tells me that he has been surprised on several occasions when he has been called upon to speak at banquets, or on other public occasions, at the new discoveries he has made of himself, of power which he never before dreamed he possessed, and he now regrets more than anything else that he has allowed so many opportunities for calling himself out to go by in the past. The effort to express one's ideas in lucid, clean-cut, concise telling English tends to make one's everyday language choicer and more direct and improve one's diction generally in this and other ways speech making develops mental power and character this explains the rapidity with which a young man develops in school or college when he begins to take part in public debates or in debating societies every man says lord chesterfield may choose good words instead of bad ones, and speak properly instead of improperly. He may have grace in his motions and gestures, and may be a very agreeable man instead of disagreeable speaker, if he will take care and pains. It is a matter of painstaking and preparation. There is everything in learning what you wish to know. Your vocal culture, manner, and mental furnishing, are to be made a matter for thought and careful training. Nothing will tire an audience more quickly than monotony. Everything expressed on the same dead level. There must be variety. The human mind tires very quickly without it. This is especially true of a monotonous tone. 
it is a great art to be able to raise and lower the voice with sweet flowing cadences which please the ear gladstone said ninety-nine men in every hundred never rise above mediocrity because the training of the voice is entirely neglected and considered of no importance it was indeed said of a certain duke of devonshire that he was the only english statesman who ever took a nap during the progress of his own speech he was a perfect genius for dry uninteresting oratory moving forward with a monotonous droning and pausing now and then as if refreshing himself by slumber in thinking on one's feet before an audience one must think quickly vigorously effectively at the same time he must speak effectively through a properly modulated voice with proper facial and bodily expression and gesture this requires practice in early life in youth the would-be orator must cultivate robust health since force enthusiasm conviction will power are greatly affected by physical condition one too must cultivate bodily posture and have good habits at easy command what would have been the result of webster's reply to hayne the greatest oratorical effort ever made on this continent if he had sat down in the senate and put his feet on his desk think of a great singer like nordica attempting to electrify an audience while lounging on a sofa or sitting in a slouchy position an early training for effective speaking will make one careful to secure a good vocabulary by good reading and a dictionary one must know words there is no class of people put to such a severe test of showing what is in them as public speakers no other men who run such a risk of exposing their weak spots or making fools of themselves in the estimation of others as do orators public speaking thinking on one's feet is a powerful educator except to the thick-skinned man the man who has no sensitiveness or who does not care for what others think of him nothing else so thoroughly discloses a man's weaknesses or shows up his limitations of thought his poverty of speech his narrow vocabulary nothing else is such a touchstone of the character and the extent of one's reading the carefulness or carelessness of his observation close compact statement must be had learn to stop when you get through do not keep stringing out conversation or argument after you have made your point you only weaken your case and prejudice people against you for your lack of tact good judgment or sense of proportion do not neutralize all the good impression you have made by talking on and on long after you have made your point the attempt to become a good public speaker is a great awakener of all the mental faculties the sense of power that comes from holding attention stirring the emotions or convincing the reason of an audience gives self-confidence assurance self-reliance arouses ambition and tends to make one more effective in every particular one's manhood character learning judgment of his opinions all things that go to make him what he is are being unrolled like a panorama every mental faculty is quickened every power of thought and expression spurred thoughts rush for utterance words press for choice the speaker summons all his reserves of education of experience of natural or acquired ability and masses all his forces in the endeavor to capture the approval and applause of the audience such an effort takes hold of the entire nature beads the brow fires the eye flushes the cheek and sends the blood surging through the veins dormant impulses are stirred half-forgotten memories revived the imagination quickened to see figures and similes that would never come to calm thought 
this forced awakening of the whole personality has effects reaching much further than the oratorical occasion the effort to marshal all one's reserves in a logical and orderly manner to bring to the front all the power one possesses leaves these reserves permanently better in hand more readily in reach the debating club is the nursery of orators no matter how far you have to go to attend it or how much trouble it is or how difficult it is to get the time the drill you will get by it is the turning point lincoln wilson webster Choate, clay and patrick henry got their training in the old-fashioned debating society do not think that because you do not know anything about parliamentary law that you should not accept the presidency of your club or debating society this is just the place to learn and when you have accepted the position you can post yourself on the rules and the chances are that you will never know the rules until you are thrust into the chair where you will be obliged to give rulings join just as many young people's organizations especially self-improvement organizations as you can and force yourself to speak every time you get a chance if the chance does not come to you make it jump to your feet and say something upon every question that is up for discussion do not be afraid to rise to put a motion or to second it or give your opinion upon it do not wait until you are better prepared you never will be every time you rise to your feet will increase your confidence and after a while you will form the habit of speaking until it will be as easy as anything else and there is no one thing which will develop young people so rapidly and effectively as the debating clubs and discussions of all sorts a vast number of our public men have owed their advance more to the old-fashioned debating societies than anything else here they learned confidence self-reliance they discovered themselves it was here they learned not to be afraid of themselves to express their opinions with force and independence nothing will call a young man out more than the struggle in a debate to hold his own it is strong vigorous exercise for the mind as wrestling is for the body do not remain way back on the back seat go up front do not be afraid to show yourself this shrinking into a corner and getting out of sight and avoiding publicity is fatal to self-confidence it is so easy and seductive especially for boys and girls in school or college to shrink from the public debates or speaking on the ground that they are not quite well enough educated at present they want to wait until they can use a little better grammar until they have read more history and more literature until they have gained a little more culture and ease of manner the way to acquire grace ease facility the way to get poise and balance so that you will not feel disturbed in public gatherings is to get the experience do the thing so many times that it will become second nature to you if you have an invitation to speak no matter how much you may shrink from it or how timid or shy you may be resolve that you will not let this opportunity for self-enlargement slip by you we know of a young man who has a great deal of natural ability for public speaking and yet he is so timid that he always shrinks from accepting invitations to speak at banquets or in public because he is so afraid that he has not had experience enough he lacks confidence in himself he is so proud and so afraid that he will make some slip which will mortify him that he has waited and waited and waited until now he is discouraged and thinks that he will never be able to do anything in public speaking at all he would give anything in the world if he had only accepted all of the invitations he has had because then he would have profited by experience it would have been a thousand times better for him to have made a mistake or even to have broken down entirely a few times than to have missed the scores of opportunities 
which would undoubtedly have made a strong public speaker of him. What is technically called stage fright is very common. A college boy recited an address to the conscript fathers. His professor asked, Is that the way Caesar would have spoken it? Yes, he replied. If Caesar had been scared half to death, and as nervous as a cat, an almost fatal timidity seizes on an inexperienced person when he knows that all eyes are watching him, that everybody in his audience is trying to measure and weigh him, studying him, scrutinizing him, to see how much there is in him, what he stands for, and making up their minds whether he measures more or less than they expected. Some are constitutionally sensitive, and so afraid of being gazed at that they don't dare to open their mouths, even when a question in which they are deeply interested and on which they have strong views is being discussed. At debating clubs, meetings of literary societies, or gatherings of any kind, they sit dumb, longing, yet fearing to speak. The sound of their own voices, if they should get on their feet to make a motion or to speak in a public gathering, would paralyze them. The mere thought of asserting themselves, of putting forward their views or opinions on any subject as being worthy of attention, or as valuable as those of their companions, makes them blush and shrink more into themselves. This timidity is often, however, not so much the fear of one's audience as the fear lest one can make no suitable expression of his thought. The hardest thing for the public speaker to overcome is self-consciousness. Those terrible eyes which pierce him through and through, which are measuring him, criticizing him, are very difficult to get out of one's consciousness. But no orator can make a great impression until he gets rid of himself, until he can absolutely annihilate his self-consciousness, forget himself in his speech. While he is wondering what kind of an impression he is making, what people think of him, his power is crippled and his speech to that extent will be mechanical, wooden. Even a partial failure on the platform has good results, for it often arouses a determination to conquer the next time, which never leaves one. Demosthenes' heroic efforts and Israeli's the time will come when you will hear me, are historic examples. It is not the speech, but the man behind the speech, that wins away to the front. One man carries weight because he is himself the embodiment of power. He is himself convinced of what he says. There is nothing of the negative, the doubtful, the uncertain in his nature. He not only knows a thing, but he knows that he knows it. His opinion carries with it the entire weight of his being. The whole man gives consent to his judgment. He himself is in his conviction, in his act. One of the most entrancing speakers I have ever listened to, a man to hear whom people would go long distances and stand for hours to get admission to the hall where he spoke, never was able to get the confidence of his audience, because he lacked character. People liked to be swayed by his eloquence. There was a great charm in the cadences of his perfect sentences. But somehow they could not believe what he said. The orator must be sincere. The public is very quick to see through shams. If the audience sees mud at the bottom of your eye, that you are not honest yourself, that you are acting, they will not take any stock in you. It is not enough to say a pleasing thing, an interesting thing. The orator must be able to convince, and to convince others, he must have strong convictions. Great speeches have become the beacon lights of history. Those who are prepared acquire a worldwide influence when the fit occasion comes. 
very few people ever rise to their greatest possibilities, or ever know their entire power until confronted by some great occasion. We are as much amazed as others are when, in some great emergency, we outdo ourselves. Somehow the power that stands behind us in the silence, in the depths of our natures, comes to our relief, intensifies our faculties a thousandfold, and enables us to do things which before we thought impossible. It would be difficult to estimate the great part which practical drill in oratory may play in one's life. Great occasions, when nations have been in peril, have developed and brought out some of the greatest orators of the world. Cicero, Mirabeau, Patrick Henry, Webster, and John Bright might all be called to witness to this fact. The occasion had much to do with the greatest speech delivered in the United States Senate. Webster's reply to Hayne. Webster had no time for immediate preparation, but the occasion brought all the reserves in this giant, and he towered so far above his opponent that Hayne looked like a pygmy in comparison. The pen has discovered many a genius, but the process is slower and less effective than the great occasion that discovers the orator. Every crisis calls out ability, previously undeveloped, and perhaps unexpected. No orator living was ever great enough to give out the same power and force and magnetism to an empty hall, to empty seats, that he could give to an audience capable of being fired by his theme. In the presence of the audience lies a fascination, an indefinable magnetism that stimulates all the mental faculties and acts as a tonic and vitalizer. An orator can say before an audience what he could not possibly say before he went on the platform, just as we can often say to a friend in animated conversation things which we could not possibly say when alone. As when two chemicals are united, a new substance is formed from the combination, which did not exist in either alone. He feels surging through his brain the combined force of his audience, which he calls inspiration, a mighty power which did not exist in his own personality. Actors tell us that there is an indescribable inspiration which comes from the orchestra, the footlights, the audience which it is impossible to feel at a cold, mechanical rehearsal. There is something in a great sea of expectant faces, which awakens the ambition and arouses the reserves of power, which can never be felt except before an audience. The power was there just the same before, but it was not aroused. In the presence of the orator, the audience is absolutely in his power to do as he will. They laugh or cry as he pleases, or rise and fall at his bidding, until he releases them from the magic spell. What is oratory but to stir the blood of all hearers, to so arouse their emotions that they cannot control themselves a moment longer without taking the action to which they are impelled? His words are laws, may be well said of the statesmen, whose orations sway the world. What art is greater than that of changing the minds of men? Wendell Phillips so played upon the emotions, so changed the convictions of Southerners who hated him, but who were curious to listen to his oratory, that, for the time being, he almost persuaded them that they were in the wrong. I have seen him when it seemed to me that he was almost godlike in his power. With the ease of a master he swayed his audience. Some who hated him in the slavery days were there, and they could not resist cheering him. He warped their own judgment, and for the time took away their prejudice. When James Russell Lowell was a student, said Wetmore Story, he and Story went to Faneuil Hall to hear Webster. They meant to hoot him for his remaining in tireless cabinet. 
it would be easy, they reasoned, to get the three thousand people to join them. When he began, Lowell turned pale, and Story livid. His great eyes, they thought, were fixed on them. His opening words changed their scorn to admiration, and their contempt to approbation. He gave us a glimpse into the holy of holies, said another student, in relating his experience in listening to a great preacher. Is not oratory a fine art? The wellspring of eloquence, when up gushing as the very water of life, quenches the thirst of myriads of men, like the smitten rock of the wilderness, reviving the life of desert wanderers. End of chapter 33 Self-Improvement Through Public Speaking Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 34 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 34 The Triumphs of the Common Virtues The talent of success is nothing more than doing what you can do well, and doing well whatever you do, without a thought of fame. Longfellow It is not a question of what a man knows but what use he can make of what he knows. J. G. Holland Seest thou a man diligent in business? He shall stand before kings. Solomon The most encouraging truth that can be impressed upon the mind of youth is this. What man has done, man may do. Men of great achievements are not to be set on pedestals and reverenced as exceptions to the average of humanity. Instead, these great men are to be considered as setting a standard of success for the emulation of every aspiring youth. Their example shows what can be accomplished by the practice of the common virtues. Diligence, patience, thrift, self-denial, determination, industry, and persistence. We can best appreciate the uplifting power of these simple virtues, which all may cultivate and exercise, by taking some concrete example of great success, which has been achieved by patient plodding toward a definite goal. No more illustrious example of success, won by the exercise of common virtues, can be offered than Abraham Lincoln rail-splitter and president. Probably Lincoln has been the hero of more American boys during the last two generations than any other American character. Young people look upon him as a marvelous being, raised up for a divine purpose, and yet if we analyze his character, we find it made up of the humblest virtues, the commonest qualities, the poorest boys and girls who look upon him as a demigod possess these qualities. The strong thing about Lincoln was his manliness, his straightforward, downright honesty. You could depend upon him. He was ambitious to make the most of himself. He wanted to know something, to be somebody, to lift his head up from his humble environment and be of some account in the world. He simply wanted to better his condition. It is true that he had a divine hunger for growth, a passion for a larger and completer life than that of those about him. But there is no evidence of any great genius, any marvellous powers. He was a simple man, never straining after effect. His simplicity was his chief charm. Everybody who knew him felt that he was a man, a large-hearted, generous friend, always ready to help 
everybody and everything out of their troubles. Whether it was a pig stuck in the mire, a poor widow in trouble, or a farmer who needed advice, he had a helpful mind, open, frank, transparent. He never covered up anything, never had secrets. The door of his heart was always open, so that anyone could read his inmost thoughts. The ability to do hard work, and to stick to it, is the right hand of genius, and the best substitute for it. In fact, that is genius. If young people were to represent Lincoln's total success by one hundred, they would probably expect to find some brilliant faculty which would rank at least fifty per cent of the total. But I think that the verdict of history has given his honesty of purpose, his purity and unselfishness of motive, as his highest attributes, and certainly these qualities are within the reach of the poorest boy and the humblest girl in America. Suppose we rank his honesty, his integrity, twenty per cent of the total, his dogged persistence, his ability for hard work, ten per cent, his passion for wholeness, for completeness, for doing everything to a finish, ten more, his aspiration, his longing for growth, his yearning for fullness of life, ten more. The reader can see that it would be easy to make up the hundred per cent without finding any one quality which could be called genius, that the total of his character would be made up of the sum of the commonest qualities, the most ordinary virtues, within the reach of the poorest youth in the land. There is no one quality in his entire make-up so overpowering, so commanding, that it could be ranked as genius. What an inestimable blessing to the world, what an encouragement and inspiration to poor boys and poor girls that his great achievement can be accounted for by the triumphs in his character of those qualities which are beyond the reach of money, of family, of influence, but that are within the reach of the poorest and the humblest. In a speech to the people in Colorado Mountains, Roosevelt said, You think that my success is quite foreign to anything you can achieve. Let me assure you that the big prizes I have won are largely accidental. If I have succeeded, it is only as any one of you can succeed. Merely because I have tried to do my duty as I saw it, in my home and in my business, and as a citizen. If when I die, the ones who know me best believe that I was a thoughtful, helpful husband, a loving, wise, and painstaking father, a generous, kindly neighbor, and an honest citizen, that will be a far more real honor, and will prove my life to have been more successful than the fact that I have ever been President of the United States. Had a few events over which no one had control been other than they were, it is quite possible I might never have held the high office I now occupy. But no train of events could accidentally make me a noble character or a faithful member of my home and community. Therefore, each of you has the same chance to succeed in true success as I have had, and if my success in the end proves to have been as great as that achieved by many of the humblest of you, I shall be fortunate. McKinley did not start with great mental ability. There was nothing very surprising or startling in his career. He was not a great genius, not notable as a scholar. He did not stand very high in school. He was not a great lawyer. He did not make a great record in Congress. But he had a good, level head. He had the best substitute for genius, the ability for hard work and persistence. 
he knew how to keep plodding how to hang on and he knew that the only way to show what he was made of in congress was to stick to one thing and he made a specialty of the tariff following the advice of a statesman friend the biographies of the giants of the race are often discouraging to the average poor boy because the moment he gets the impression that the character he is reading about was a genius the effect is largely lost upon himself because he knows that he is not a genius and he says to himself this is very interesting reading but i can never do those things but when he reads the life of mckinley he does not see any reason why he should not do the same things himself because there were no great jumps no great leaps and bounds in his life from particular ability or special opportunity he had no very brilliant talents but he averaged well he had good common sense and was a hard worker he had tact and diplomacy and made the most of every opportunity nothing can keep from success the man who has iron in his blood and is determined that he will succeed when he is confronted by barriers he leaps over them tunnels through them or makes a way around them obstacles only serve to stiffen his backbone increase his determination sharpen his wits and develop his innate resources the record of human achievement is full of the truth there is no difficulty to him who wills all the performances of human art at which we look with praise and wonder says johnson are instances of the resistless force of perseverance it has been well said that from the same materials one man builds palaces another hovels one warehouses another villas bricks and mortar are mortar and bricks until the architect makes them something else the boulder which was an obstacle in the path of the weak becomes a stepping stone in the pathway of the resolute the difficulties which dishearten one man only stiffen the sinews of another who looks on them as a sort of mental springboard by which to vault across the gulf of failure to the sure solid ground of full success one of the greatest generals on the confederate side in the civil war stonewall jackson was noted for his slowness with this he possessed great application and dogged determination if he undertook a task he never let go till he had it done so when he went to west point his habitual class response was that he was too busy getting the lesson of a few days back to look at the one of the day he kept up this steady gait and from the least promising pleb came out seventeenth in a class of seventy distancing fifty-three who started with better attainments and better minds his classmates used to say that if the course was ten years instead of four he would come out first the world stands aside for the determined man you will find no royal road to your triumph there is no open door to the temple of success one of the commonest of common virtues is perseverance yet it has been the open sesame of more fast locked doors of opportunity than have brilliant tributes every man and woman can exercise this virtue of perseverance can refuse to stop short of the goal of ambition can decline to turn aside in search of pleasures that do but hinder progress the romance of perseverance under a special difficulty is one of the most fascinating subjects in history tenacity of purpose has been characteristic of all characters who have left their mark on the world perseverance it has been said is the statesman's brain 
the warrior's sword, the inventor's secret, the scholar's open sesame. Persistency is to talent what steam is to the engine. It is the driving force by which the machine accomplishes the work for which it was intended. A great deal of persistency, with a very little talent, can be counted on to go farther than a great deal of talent without persistency. You cannot keep a determined man from success. Take away his money, and he makes spurs of his poverty to urge him on. Lock him up in a dungeon, and he writes the immortal Pilgrim's Progress. Stick to a thing and carry it through in all its completeness and proportion, and you will become a hero. You will think better of yourself. Others will exalt you. Thoroughness is another of the common virtues which all may cultivate. The man who puts his best into every task will leave far behind the man who lets a job go with the comment, That's good enough. Nothing is good enough unless it reflects our best. Daniel Webster had no remarkable traits of character in his boyhood. He was sent to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, and stayed there only a short time when a neighbor found him crying on his way home, and asked the reason. Daniel said he despaired of ever making a scholar. He said the boys made fun of him, for always being at the foot of the class, and that he had decided to give up and go home. The friend said he ought to go back and see what hard study would do. He went back, applied himself to his studies with determination to win, and it was not long before he silenced those who had ridiculed him by reaching the head of the class and remaining there. Fidelity to duty has been a distinguishing virtue in men who have risen to positions of authority and command. It had been observed that the dispatches of Napoleon rang with the word glory. Wellington's dispatches centered around the common word duty. Nowadays people seem unwilling to tread the rough path of duty, and by patience and steadfast perseverance, step into the ranks of those the country delights to honor. Every little while I get letters from young men who say, if they were positively sure that they could be a Webster in law, they would devote all their energies to study, fling their whole lives into their work, or if they could be an Edison in invention, or a great leader in medicine, or a merchant prince like Wanamaker or Marshall Field, they could work with enthusiasm and zeal and power and concentration. They would be willing to make any sacrifice, to undergo any hardship, in order to achieve what these men have achieved. But many of them say they do not feel that they have the marvelous ability, the great genius, the tremendous talent exhibited by those leaders, and so they are not willing to make the great exertion. They do not realize that success is not necessarily doing some great thing, that it is not making a tremendous strain to do something great, but that it is just honestly, earnestly living the everyday simple life. It is by the exercise of the common everyday virtues. It is by trying to do everything one does to a complete finish. It is by trying to be scrupulously honest in every transaction. It is by always ringing true in our friendships, by holding a helpful, accommodating attitude toward those about us, by trying to be the best possible citizen, a good, accommodating, helpful neighbor, a kind, encouraging father. It is by all these simple things that we attain success. There is no great secret about success. 
it is just a natural persistent exercise of the commonest everyday qualities we have seen people in the country in the summer time trampling down the daisies and the beautiful violets the lovely wild flowers in their efforts to get a branch of showy flowers off a large tree which perhaps would not compare in beauty and delicacy and loveliness to the things they trampled under their feet in trying to procure it oh how many exquisite experiences delightful possible joys we trample under our feet in straining after something great in trying to do some marvellous thing that will attract attention and get our names in the papers we trample down the finer emotions we spoil many of the most delicious things in life in our scrambling and greed to grasp something which is unusual something showy that we can wave before the world in order to get its applause in straining for effect in the struggle to do something great and wonderful we miss the little successes the sum of which would make our lives sublime and often after all this straining and struggling for the larger for the grander things we miss them and then we discover to our horror what we have missed on the way up what sweetness what beauty what loveliness what a lot of common homely cheering things we have lost in the useless struggle great scientists tell us that the reason why the secrets of nature have been hidden from the world so long is because we are not simple enough in our methods of reasoning that investigators are always looking for unusual phenomena for something complicated that the principles of nature's secrets are so extremely simple that men overlook them in their efforts to see and solve the more intricate problems it is most unfortunate that so many young people get the impression that success consists in doing some marvelous thing that there must be some genius born in the man who achieves it else he could not do such remarkable things End of chapter 34 The Triumphs of the Common Virtues Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 35 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 35 Getting Aroused How's the boy getting on, Davis? asked Farmer John Field as he watched his son, Marshall, waiting upon a customer. "'Well, John, you and I are old friends,' replied Deacon Davis, as he took an apple from a barrel and handed it to Marshall's father as a peace offering. "'We are old friends, and I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I'm a blunt man, and dare I go to tell you the truth. Marshall is a good steady boy, all right, but he wouldn't make a merchant if he stayed in my store a thousand years. He weren't cut out for a merchant.' Take him back to the farm, John, and teach him how to milk cows. If Marshall Field had remained as clerk in Deacon Davis's store in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where he got his first position, he could never have become one of the world's merchant princes. But when he went to Chicago and saw the marvelous examples around him of poor boys who had won success, it aroused his ambition and fired him with a determination to be a great merchant himself. If others can do such wonderful things, he asked himself, why cannot I? Of course, there was the making of a great merchant in Mr. Field from the start, but circumstances and ambition-arousing environment 
had a great deal to do with stimulating his latent energy and bringing out his reserve force. It is doubtful if he would have climbed so rapidly in any other place than Chicago. In 1856, when young Field went there, this marvelous city was just starting on its unparalleled career. It had then only about 85,000 inhabitants. A few years before, it had been a mere Indian trading village. But the city grew by leaps and bounds, and always beat the predictions of its most sanguine inhabitants. Success was in the air. Everybody felt that there were great possibilities there. Many people seem to think that ambition is a quality born within us, that it is not susceptible to improvement, that it is something thrust upon us which will take care of itself. But it is a passion that responds very quickly to cultivation, and it requires constant care and education, just as the faculty for music or art does, or it will atrophy. If we do not try to realize our ambition, it will not keep sharp and defined. Our faculties become dull and soon lose their power if they are not exercised. How can we expect our ambition to remain fresh and vigorous through years of inactivity, indolence, or indifference, if we constantly allow opportunities to slip by us without making any attempt to grasp them? our inclination will grow duller and weaker. What I most need, as Emerson says, is somebody to make me do what I can. To do what I can, that is my problem. Not what a Napoleon or a Lincoln could do, but what I can do. It makes all the difference in the world to me whether I bring out the best thing in me or the worst whether I utilize 10, 15, 25, or 90 percent of my ability. Everywhere we see people who have reached middle life or later without being aroused. They have developed only a small percentage of their success possibilities. They are still in a dormant state. The best thing in them lies so deep that it has never been awakened. When we meet these people, we feel conscious that they have a great deal of latent power that has never been exercised. Great possibilities of usefulness and of achievement are, all unconsciously, going to waste within them. Some time ago, there appeared in the newspapers an account of a girl who had reached the age of 15 years, and yet had only attained the mental development of a small child. Only a few things interested her. She was dreamy, inactive, and indifferent to everything around her most of the time, until, one day, while listening to a hand organ on the street, she suddenly awakened to full consciousness. She came to herself. Her faculties were aroused, and in a few days, she leaped forward years in her development. Almost in a day, she passed from childhood to budding womanhood. Most of us have an enormous amount of power, of latent force, slumbering within us, as it slumbered in this girl, which could do marvels if we would only awaken it. The judge of the municipal court in a flourishing western city, one of the most highly esteemed jurists in his state, was in middle life before his latent power was aroused, an illiterate blacksmith. He is now sixty, the owner of the finest library in his city, with the reputation of being its best read man, and one whose highest endeavor is to help his fellow man. What caused the revolution in his life? The hearing of a single lecture on the value of education. This was what stirred the slumbering power within him, awakened his ambition, and set his feet 
in the path of self-development. I have known several men who never realized their possibilities until they reached middle life. Then they were suddenly aroused, as if from a long sleep, by reading some inspiring, stimulating book, by listening to a sermon or a lecture, or by meeting some friend, someone with high ideals, who understood, believed in, and encouraged them. It will make all the difference in the world to you, whether you are with people who are watching for ability in you, people who believe in, encourage, and praise you, or whether you are with those who are forever breaking your idols, blasting your hopes, and throwing cold water on your aspirations. The chief probation officer of the Children's Court in New York, in his report for 1905, says, Removing a boy or girl from improper environment is the first step in his or her reclamation. The New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, after thirty years of investigation of cases involving the social and moral welfare of over half a million of children, has also come to the conclusion that environment is stronger than heredity. Even the strongest of us are not beyond the reach of our environment. No matter how independent, strong-willed, and determined our nature, we are constantly being modified by our surroundings. Take the best-born child with the greatest inherited advantages, and let it be reared by savages, and how many of its inherited tendencies will remain, if brought up from infancy in a barbarous, brutal atmosphere? It will, of course, become brutal. The story is told of a well-born child who, being lost or abandoned as an infant, was suckled by a wolf with her own young ones, and who actually took on all the characteristics of the wolf, walked on all fours, howled like a wolf, and ate like one. It does not take much to determine the lives of most of us. We naturally follow the examples about us and, as a rule, we rise or fall according to the strongest current in which we live. The poet's, I am a part of all that I have met, is not a mere poetic flight of fancy, it is an absolute truth. Everything, every sermon or lecture or conversation you have heard, every person who has touched your life, has left an impress upon your character, and you are never quite the same person after the association or experience. You are a little different, modified somewhat from what you were before, just as Beecher was never the same man after reading Ruskin. Some years ago, a party of Russian workmen was sent to this country by a Russian firm of shipbuilders in order that they might acquire American methods and catch the American spirit. Within six months, the Russians had become almost the equals of the American artisans among whom they worked. They had developed ambition, individuality, personal initiative, and a marked degree of excellence in their work. A year after their return to their own country, the deadening, non-progressive atmosphere about them had done its work. The men had lost the desire to improve. They were again plodders, with no goal beyond the day's work. The ambition aroused by stimulating environment had sunk to sleep again. Our Indian schools sometimes publish side by side photographs of the Indian youths as they come from the reservation and as they look when they are graduated, well-dressed, intelligent, with the fire of ambition in their eyes. We predict great things for them, but the majority of those who go back to their tribes, after struggling a while to keep up their new standards, 
gradually drop back to their old manner of living. There are, of course, many notable exceptions, but these are strong characters, able to resist the downward dragging tendencies about them. If you interview the great army of failures, you will find that multitudes have failed because they never got into a stimulating, encouraging environment, because their ambition was never aroused, or because they were not strong enough to rally under depressing, discouraging, or vicious surroundings. Most of the people we find in prisons and poorhouses are pitiable examples of the influence of an environment which appealed to the worst instead of to the best in them. Whatever you do in life, make any sacrifice necessary to keep in an ambition-arousing atmosphere, an environment that will stimulate you to self-development. Keep close to people who understand you, who believe in you, who will help you to discover yourself and encourage you to make the most of yourself. This may make all the difference to you between a grand success and a mediocre existence. Stick to those who are trying to do something and to be somebody in the world. People of high aims, lofty ambition. Keep close to those who are dead in earnest. Ambition is contagious. You will catch the spirit that dominates in your environment. The success of those about you who are trying to climb upward, will encourage and stimulate you to struggle harder if you have not done quite so well yourself. There is a great power in a battery of individuals who are struggling for the achievement of high aims, a great magnetic force which will help you to attract the object of your ambition. It is very stimulating to be with people whose aspirations run parallel with your own. If you lack energy, if you are naturally lazy, indolent, or inclined to take it easy, you will be urged forward by the constant prodding of the more ambitious. End of chapter 35 Getting Aroused Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 36 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 36 The Man with an Idea. He who wishes to fulfill his mission must be a man of one idea, that is, of one great overmastering purpose overshadowing all his aims and guiding and controlling his entire life. Bait A healthful hunger for a great idea is the beauty and blessedness of life. Jean Ingelow A profound conviction raises a man above the feeling of ridicule. J. Stuart Mill Ideas go booming through the world, louder than cannon. Thoughts are mightier than armies. Principles have achieved more victories than horsemen or chariots. W. M. Paxton What are you bothering yourselves with a knitting machine for? asked Ari Davis of Boston, a manufacturer of instruments. Why don't you make a sewing machine? His advice had been sought by a rich man and an inventor, who had reached their wits' ends in the vain attempt to produce a device for knitting woolen goods. I wish I could, but it can't be done. Oh, yes, it can, said Davis. I can make one myself. Well, the capitalist replied, you do it and I'll insure you an independent fortune. The words of Davis were uttered in a spirit of jest, but
but the novel idea found lodgment in the mind of one of the workmen who stood by, a mere youth of twenty, who was thought not capable of a serious idea. But Elias Howe was not so rattle-headed as he seemed, and the more he reflected, the more desirable such a machine appeared to him. Four years passed, and with a wife and three children, to support in a great city on a salary of nine dollars a week, the light-hearted boy had become a thoughtful, plodding man. The thought of the sewing machine haunted him night and day, and he finally resolved to produce one. After months wasted in the effort to work a needle, pointed at both ends, with the eye in the middle, that should pass up and down through the cloth, suddenly the thought flashed through his mind that another stitch might be possible, and with almost insane devotion he worked night and day until he had made a rough model of wood and wire that convinced him of ultimate success. In his mind's eye he saw his idea, but his own funds and those of his father, who had aided him more or less, were insufficient to embody it in a working machine. But help came from an old schoolmate, George Fisher, a coal and wood merchant of Cambridge. He agreed to board Elias and his family and furnish five hundred dollars, for which he was to have one half of the patent if the machine proved to be worth patenting. In May 1845, the machine was completed, and in July, Elias Howe sewed all the seams of two suits of woolen clothes, one for Mr. Fisher and the other for himself. The sewing outlasted the cloth. This machine, which is still preserved, will sew three hundred stitches a minute, and is considered more nearly perfect than any other prominent invention at its first trial. There is not one of the millions of sewing machines now in use that does not contain some of the essential principles of this first attempt. When it was decided to try and elevate Chicago out of the mud by raising its immense blocks up to grade, the young son of a poor mechanic named George M. Pullman appeared on the scene and put in a bid for the great undertaking, and the contract was awarded to him. He not only raised the blocks, but did it in such a way that business within them was scarcely interrupted. All this time he was resolving in his mind his pet project of building a sleeping car, which would be adopted on all railroads. He fitted up two old cars on the Chicago and Alton Road with berths, and soon found they would be in demand. He then went to work on the principle that the more luxurious his cars were, the greater would be the demand for them. After spending three years in Colorado gold mines, he returned and built two cars which cost $18,000 each. Everybody laughed at Pullman's folly. But Pullman believed that whatever relieved the tediousness of long trips would meet with speedy approval, and he had faith enough in his idea to risk his all in it. Pullman was a great believer in the commercial value of beauty. The wonderful town which he built and which bears his name, as well as his magnificent cars, is an example of his belief in this principle. He counts it as a good investment to surround his employees with comforts and beauty and good sanitary conditions, and so the town of Pullman is a model of cleanliness, order, and comfort. It has ever been the man with an idea, which he puts into practical effort, who has changed the face of Christendom. The germ idea of the steam engine can be seen in the writings of the great philosophers, but it was not developed until more than two thousand years later. It was an English blacksmith, Newcomen, with no opportunities, who in the seventeenth century conceived the idea of moving a piston by the elastic force of steam. 
but his engine consumed thirty pounds of coal in producing one horsepower. The perfection of the modern engine is largely due to James Watt, a poor, uneducated Scotch boy, who at fifteen walked the streets of London in a vain search for work. A professor in the Glasgow University gave him the use of a room to work in, and while waiting for jobs he experimented with old vials for steam reservoirs and hollow canes for pipes, for he could not bear to waste a moment. He improved Newcomen's engine by cutting off the steam after the piston had completed a quarter or a third of its stroke and letting the steam already in the chamber expand and drive the piston the remaining distance. This saved nearly three-fourths of the steam. What suffered from pinching poverty and hardships, which would have disheartened ordinary men? But he was terribly in earnest, and his brave wife, Margaret, begged him not to mind her inconvenience, nor be discouraged. If the engine will not work, she wrote him while struggling in London, something else will. Never despair. I had gone to take a walk, said Watt, on a fine Sabbath afternoon, and had passed the old washing house, thinking upon the engine at the time, when the idea came into my head that, as steam is an elastic body, it would rush into a vacuum, and if a communication were made between the cylinder and an exhausted vessel, it would rush into it, and might be there condensed without cooling the cylinder. The idea was simple, but in it lay the germ of the first steam engine of much practical value. Sir James Mackintosh places this poor Scotch boy who began with only an idea, at the head of all inventors in all ages and all nations. See George Stevenson, working in the coal pits for sixpence a day, patching the clothes and mending the boots of his fellow workmen at night, to earn a little money to attend a night school, giving the first money he ever earned, one hundred and fifty dollars to his blind father to pay his debts. People say he is crazy. His roaring steam engine will set the house on fire with its sparks. Smoke will pollute the air. Carriage makers and coachmen will starve for want of work. For three days the committee of the House of Commons plies questions to him. This was one of them. If a cow get on the track of the engine travelling ten miles an hour, will it not be an awkward situation? Yes, very awkward, indeed, for the coup, replied Stevenson. A government inspector said that if a locomotive ever went ten miles an hour, he would undertake to eat a stewed engine for breakfast. What can be more palpably absurd and ridiculous? Then the prospect held out of locomotives travelling twice as fast as horses, asked a writer in the English Quarterly Review for March 1825. We should as soon expect the people of Woolwich to suffer themselves to be fired off upon one of Congreve's rockets, as to trust themselves to the mercy of such a machine going at such a rate. We trust that Parliament will, in all the railways it may grant, limit the speed to eight or nine miles an hour, which we entirely agree with Mr. Sylvester is as great as can be ventured upon. This article referred to Stevenson's proposition to use his newly invented locomotive instead of horses on the Liverpool and Manchester Railroad, then in process of construction. The company decided to lay the matter before two leading English engineers, who reported that steam would be desirable only when used in stationary engines one and a half miles apart, drawing the cars by means of ropes and pulleys. But Stevenson persuaded them to test his idea by offering a prize of about twenty-five 
hundred dollars for the best locomotive produced at a trial to take place october sixth eighteen twenty nine on the eventful day thousands of spectators assembled to watch the competition of four engines the novelty the rocket the perseverance and the sans pareil the perseverance could make but six miles an hour and so was ruled out as the conditions called for at least ten the sans pareil made an average of fourteen miles an hour but as it burst a water pipe it lost its chance the novelty did splendidly but also burst a pipe and was crowded out leaving the rocket to carry off the honors with an average speed of fifteen miles an hour the highest rate attained being twenty-nine this was stevenson's locomotive and so fully vindicated his theory that the idea of stationary engines on a railroad was completely exploded he had picked up the fixed engines which the genius of watt had devised and set them on wheels to draw men and merchandise against the most direful predictions of the foremost engineers of his day in all the records of invention there is no more sad or affecting story than that of john fitch poor he was in many senses poor in appearance poor in spirit he was born poor lived poor and died poor if there ever was a true inventor this man was one he was one of those eager souls that would coin their own flesh to carry their point he only uttered the obvious truth when he said one day in a crisis of his invention that if he could get one hundred pounds by cutting off one of his legs he would gladly give it to the knife he tried in vain both in this country and in france to get money to build his steamboat he would say you and i will not live to see the day but the time will come when the steamboat will be preferred to all other modes of conveyance when steamboats will ascend the western rivers from new orleans to wheeling and when steamboats will cross the ocean johnny fitch will be forgotten but other men will carry out his ideas and grow rich and great upon them poor ragged forlorn jeered at pitied as a madman discouraged by the great refused by the rich he kept on till in seventeen ninety he had the first vessel on the delaware that ever answered the purpose of a steamboat it ran six miles an hour against the tide and eight miles with it at noon on friday august fourth eighteen o seven a crowd of curious people might have been seen along the wharves of the hudson river they had gathered to witness what they considered a ridiculous failure of a crank who proposed to take a party of people up the hudson river to albany in what he called a steam vessel named the clermont did anybody ever hear of such a ridiculous idea as navigating against the current up the hudson in a vessel without sails the thing will bust says one it will burn up says another and they will all be drowned exclaims a third as he sees vast columns of black smoke shoot up with showers of brilliant sparks nobody present in all probability ever heard of a boat going by steam it was the opinion of everybody that the man who had tooled away his money and his time on the clermont was little better than an idiot and ought to be in an insane asylum but the passengers go on board the plank is pulled in and the steam is turned on the walking beam moves slowly up and down and the clermont floats out into the river it can never go upstream the spectators persist but it did go upstream and the boy 
who in his youth said there is nothing impossible, had scored a great triumph, and had given to the world the first steamboat that had any practical value. Notwithstanding that Fulton had rendered such great service to humanity, a service which has revolutionized the commerce of the world, he was looked upon by many as a public enemy. Critics and cynics turned up their noses when Fulton was mentioned. The severity of the world's censure, ridicule, and detraction has usually been in proportion to the benefit the victim has conferred upon mankind. As the Clermont burned pine wood, dense columns of fire and smoke belch forth from her smokestack while she glided triumphantly up the river, and the inhabitants along the banks were utterly unable to account for the spectacle. They rushed to the shore, amazed to see a boat on fire go against the stream so rapidly with neither oars nor sails. The noise of her great paddle-wheels increased the wonder. Sailors forsook their vessels, and fishermen rowed home as fast as possible to get out of the way of the fire-monster. The Indians were as much frightened as their predecessors were when the first ship approached their hunting-ground on Manhattan Island. The owners of sailing-vessels were jealous of the Clermont, and tried to run her down. Others, whose interests were affected, denied Fulton's claim to the invention, and brought suits against him. But the success of the Clermont soon led to the construction of other steamships all over the country. The government employed Fulton to aid in building a powerful steam frigate, which was called Fulton the First. He also built a diving boat for the government for the discharge of torpedoes. By this time, his fame had spread all over the civilized world and when he died in 1815, newspapers were marked with black lines, the legislature of New York wore badges of mourning, and minute guns were fired as the long funeral procession passed to old Trinity Churchyard. Very few private persons were ever honored with such a burial. True, Dr. Lardner had proved to scientific men that a steamboat could not cross the Atlantic. But in 1810, the Savannah from New York appeared off the coast of Ireland under sail and steam, having made this impossible passage. Those on shore thought that a fire had broken out below the decks, and a king's cutter was sent to her relief. Although the voyage was made without accident, it was nearly twenty years before it was admitted that steam navigation could be made a commercial success in ocean traffic. As Junius Smith impatiently paced the deck of a vessel sailing from an English port to New York on a rough and tedious voyage in 1832, he said to himself, Why not cross the ocean regularly in steamships? In New York and in London a deaf ear was turned to any such nonsense. Smith's first encouragement came from George Grote, the historian and banker, who said the idea was practicable, but it was the same old story. He would risk no money in it. At length Isaac Selby, a prominent businessman of London, agreed to build a steamship of 2,000 tons, the British Queen. An unexpected delay in fitting the engines led the projectors to charter the Sirius, a river steamer of 700 tons, and send her to New York. Learning of this, other parties started from Bristol four days later in the Great Western, and both vessels arrived at New York the same day. Soon after, Smith made the round trip between London and New York in thirty-two days. What a sublime picture of determination and patience was that of Charles Goodyear of New Haven, buried in poverty and struggling with hardships for eleven long years to make India rubber of practical use. 
see him in prison for debt, pawning his clothes and his wife's jewelry to get a little money to keep his children, who were obliged to gather sticks in the field for fire, from starving. Watch his sublime courage and devotion to his idea, when he had no money to bury a dead child, and when his other five were near starvation, when his neighbors were harshly criticizing him for his neglect of his family and calling him insane. But behold his vulcanized rubber, the result of that heroic struggle applied to over five hundred uses by one hundred thousand employees. What a pathetic picture was that of Palissy, plodding on through want and woe to rediscover the lost art of enameling pottery, building his furnaces with bricks carried on his back, seeing his six children die of neglect, probably of starvation, his wife in rags and despair over her husband's folly, despised by his neighbors for neglecting his family, worn to a skeleton himself, giving his clothes to his hired man because he could not pay him in money, hoping always, failing steadily, until at last his great work was accomplished and he reaped his reward. German unity was the idea engraven upon Bismarck's heart. What cared this Herculean despot for the diet chosen year after year, simply to vote down every measure he proposed? He was indifferent to all opposition. He simply defied and sent home every diet which opposed him. He could not play the game alone. To make Germany the greatest power in Europe, to make William of Prussia a greater potentate than Napoleon or Alexander, was his all-absorbing purpose. It mattered not what stood in his way, whether people, diet, or nation, all must bend to his mighty will. Germany must hold the deciding voice in the Areopagus of the world. He rode roughshod over everybody and everything that stood in his way, defiant of opposition, imperious, irrepressible. See the great Dante in exile, condemned to be burned alive on false charges of embezzlement. Look at his starved features, gaunt form, melancholy, a poor wanderer but he never gave up his idea. He poured out his very soul into his immortal poem, ever believing that right would at last triumph. Columbus was exposed to continual scoffs and indignities, being ridiculed as a mere dreamer and stigmatized as an adventurer. The very children, it is said, pointed to their foreheads as he passed, being taught to regard him as a kind of madman. An American was once invited to dine with Oaken, the famous German naturalist. To his surprise, they had neither meats nor dessert, but only baked potatoes. Oaken was too great a man to apologize for their simple fare. His wife explained, however, that her husband's income was very small, and that they preferred to live simply in order that he might obtain books and instruments for his scientific researches. Before the discovery of ether, it often took a week, in some cases a month, to recover from the enormous dose, sometimes five hundred drops of laudanum, given to a patient to deaden the pain during a surgical operation. Young Dr. Morton believed that there must be some means provided by nature to relieve human suffering during these terrible operations. But what could he do? He was not a chemist. He did not know the properties of chemical substances. He was not liberally educated. Dr. Morton did not resort to books, however, nor did he go to scientific men for advice, 
but immediately began to experiment with well-known substances. He tried intoxicants even to the point of intoxication, but as soon as the instruments were applied, the patient would revive. He kept on experimenting with narcotics in this manner, until at last he found what he sought in ether. What a grand idea Bishop Vincent worked out for the young world in the Chatuka Circle. Dr. Clark, in his worldwide Christian Endeavor movement, the Methodist Church in the Epworth League, Edward Everett Hale in his little bands of King's Daughters, and ten times one is ten. Here is Clara Barton who has created the Red Cross Society which is loved by all nations. She has noticed in our civil war that the Confederates were shelling the hospital. She thought it the last touch of cruelty to fight what couldn't fight back, and she determined to have the barbarous custom stopped. Of course the world laughed at this poor unaided woman, but her idea has been adopted by all nations and the enemy that aims a shot at the tent or building over which flies the white flag with the red cross has lost his last claim to human consideration. In all ages, those who have advanced the cause of humanity have been men and women possessed in the opinion of their neighbors. Noah in building the ark, Moses in espousing the cause of the Israelites or Christ, in living and dying to save a fallen race, incurred the pity and scorn of the rich and highly educated, in common with all great benefactors. Yet in every age and in every clime, men and women have been willing to incur poverty, hardship, toil, ridicule, persecution, or even death, if thereby they might shed light or comfort upon the path which all must walk from the cradle to the grave. In fact, it is doubtful whether a man can perform very great service to mankind who is not permeated with a great purpose, with an overmastering idea. Beecher had to fight every step of the way to his triumph through obstacles which would have appalled all but the greatest characters. Oftentimes, in these great battles for principles and struggles for truth, he stood almost alone, fighting popular prejudice, narrowness and bigotry, uncharitableness and envy even in his own church. But he never hesitated nor wavered when he once saw his duty. There was no shilly-shallying no hunting for a middle ground between right and wrong, no compromise on principles. He hewed close to the chalk line and held his line plumb to truth. He never pandered for public favor, nor sought applause. Duty and truth were his goal, and he went straight to his mark. Other churches did not agree with him, nor his, but he was too broad for hatred too charitable for revenge, and too magnanimous for envy. What tale of the Arabian Nights equals in fascination the story of such lives as those of Franklin, of Morse, Goodyear, Howe, Edison, Bell, Beecher, Gough, Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, Amos Lawrence, George Peabody, McCormick, Ho, and scores of others, each representing some great idea embodied in earnest action and resulting in an improvement of the physical, mental, and moral condition of those around them. There are plenty of ideas left in the world yet. Everything has not been invented. All good things have not been done. There are thousands of abuses to rectify, and each one challenges the independent soul, armed with a new idea. But how shall I get ideas? 
keep your wits open, observe, study, but above all, think, and when a noble image is indelibly impressed upon the mind, act. End of chapter 36 The Man with an Idea Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 37 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 37 Dare. The Spartans did not inquire how many the enemy are, but where they are. Aegis, too. What's brave, what's noble? Let's do it after the high Roman fashion, and make death proud to take us. Shakespeare Let me die facing the enemy. Bayard Who conquers me shall find a stubborn foe. Byron No great deed is done by falterers who ask for certainty. George Elliot. Fortune befriends the bold. Dryden. To stand with a smile upon your face against a stake from which you cannot get away, that no doubt is heroic. But the true glory is resignation to the inevitable. To stand unchained with perfect liberty to go away held only by the higher claims of duty, and let the fire creep up to the heart. This is heroism. F. W. Robertson Steady, men! Every man must die where he stands, said Colin Campbell to the 93rd Highlanders at Balaclava, as an overwhelming force of Russian cavalry came sweeping down. Ay, ay, Sir Colin, we'll do that, was the response from men, many of whom had to keep their word by thus obeying. Bring back the colours, shouted a captain at the Battle of the Alma, when an ensign maintained his ground in front, although the men were retreating. No, cried the ensign, bring up the men to the colours. To dare, and again to dare and without end to dare, was Danton's noble defiance to the enemies of France. The commons of France have resolved to deliberate, said Mirabeau to de Brézé, who brought an order from the king for them to disperse, June 23rd, 1789. We have heard the intentions that have been attributed to the king, and you, sir, who cannot be recognized as his organ in the National Assembly, you who have neither place, voice, nor right to speak, you are not the person to bring to us a message of his. Go, say, to those who sent you that we are here by the power of the people, and that we will not be driven hence, save by the power of the bayonet. When the assembled Senate of Rome begged Regulus not to return to Carthage, to fulfill an illegal promise, he calmly replied, Have you resolved to dishonor me? Torture and death are awaiting me, but what are these to the shame of an infamous act or the wounds of a guilty mind? Slave as I am to Carthage, I still have the spirit of a Roman. I have sworn to return. It is my duty. Let the gods take care of the rest. The courage which Cranmer had shown since the accession of Mary gave way the moment his final doom was announced. The moral cowardice which had displayed itself in his miserable compliance with the lust and despotism of Henry the Eighth displayed itself again 
in six successive recantations by which he hoped to purchase pardon but pardon was impossible and cranmer's strangely mingled nature found a power in its very weakness when he was brought into the church of saint mary at oxford on the twenty first of march to repeat his recantation on the way to the stake now ended his address to the hushed congregation before him now i come to the great thing that troubleth my conscience more than any other thing that ever i said or did in my life and that is the setting abroad of writings contrary to the truth which here i now renounce and refuse as things written by hand contrary to the truth which i thought in my heart and written for fear of death to save my life if it might be and for as much as my hand offended in writing contrary to my heart my hand therefore shall be the first punished for if i come to the fire it shall be the first burned this was the hand that wrote it he again exclaimed at the stake therefore it shall suffer first punishment and holding it steadily in the flame he never stirred nor cried till life was gone a woman's piercing shriek suddenly startled a party of surveyors at dinner in a forest of northern virginia on a calm sunny day in seventeen fifty the cries were repeated in quick succession and the men sprang through the undergrowth to learn their cause oh sir exclaimed the woman as she caught sight of a youth of eighteen but a man in stature and bearing you will surely do something for me make these friends release me my boy my poor boy is drowning and they will not let me go it would be madness she would jump into the river said one of the men who was holding her and the rapids would dash her to pieces in a moment throwing off his coat the youth sprang to the edge of the bank scanned for a moment the rocks and whirling currents and then at sight of part of the boy's dress plunged into the roaring rapids thank god he will save my child cried the mother and all rushed to the brink of the precipice there he is oh my boy my darling boy how could i leave you but all eyes were bent upon the youth struggling with strong heart and hope amid the dizzy sweep of the whirling currents far below now it seemed as if he would be dashed against a projecting rock over which the water flew in foam and anon a whirlpool would drag him in but from whose grasp escape would seem impossible twice the boy went out of sight but he had reappeared the second time although terribly near the most dangerous part of the river the rush of waters here was tremendous and no one had ever dared to approach it even in a canoe lest he should be dashed to pieces the youth redoubled his exertions three times he was about to grasp the child when some stronger eddy would toss it from him one final effort he makes the child is held aloft by his strong right arm but a cry of horror bursts from the lips of every spectator as boy and man shoot over the falls and vanish in the seething waters below there they are shouted the mother a moment later in a delirium of joy see they are safe great god i thank thee and sure enough they emerged unharmed from the boiling vortex and in a few minutes reached a low place in the bank and were drawn up by their friends the boy senseless but still alive and the youth almost exhausted god will give you a reward solemnly spoke the grateful woman he will do great things for you in return for this day's work and the blessings of thousands besides mine will attend you the youth was george washington your grace has not the organ of animal courage largely developed said a phrenologist who was examining wellington's head you are right replied the iron duke and but for my sense of duty 
I should have retreated in my first fight. That first fight on an Indian field was one of the most terrible on record. When General Jackson was a judge and was holding court in a small settlement, a border ruffian, a murderer and desperado, came into the courtroom with brutal violence and interrupted the court. The judge ordered him to be arrested. The officer did not dare to approach him. Call a pos, said the judge, and arrest him. But they also shrank in fear from the ruffian. Call me, then, said Jackson. This court is adjourned for five minutes. He left the bench, walked straight up to the man, and with his eagle eye actually cowed the ruffian, who dropped his weapons, afterwards saying, There was something in his eye I could not resist. One of the last official acts of President Carnot of France was the sending of a medal of the French Legion of Honor to a little American girl who lives in Indiana. While a train on the Panhandle Railroad, having on board several distinguished Frenchmen, was bound to Chicago and the World's Fair, Jenny Carey, who was then ten years old, discovered that a trestle was on fire, and that if the train which was nearby due entered it, a dreadful wreck would take place. Therefore she ran out upon the track to a place where she could be seen from some little distance. Then she took off her red flannel skirt, and, when the train came in view, waved it back and forth across the track. It was seen, and the train stopped. On board of it were seven hundred people, many of whom must have suffered death, but for Jenny's courage and presence of mind. When they returned to France, the Frenchman brought the occurrence to the notice of President Carnot, and the result was the sending of the medal of this famous French society, the purpose of which is the honoring of bravery and merit, wherever they may be found. It was the heroic devotion of an Indian girl that saved the life of Captain John Smith when the powerful King Powhatan had decreed his death. Ill could the struggling colony spare him at that time. On May 10th, 1796, Napoleon carried the bridge at Lodi in the face of the Austrian batteries. Fourteen cannon, some accounts say thirty, were trained upon the French end of the structure. Behind them were six thousand troops. Napoleon massed four thousand grenadiers at the head of the bridge. With a battalion of three hundred carbiniers in front. At the tap of the drum, the foremost assailants wheeled from the cover of the street wall under a terrible hail of grape and canister, and attempted to pass the gateway to the bridge. The front ranks went down like stalls of grain before a reaper. The column staggered and reeled backward, and the valiant grenadiers were appalled by the task before them. Without a word or a look of reproach, Napoleon placed himself at their head, and his aides and generals rushed to his side. Fought again, this time over heaps of dead that choked the passage, and a quick run, counted by seconds only, carried the column across two hundred yards of clear space, scarcely a shot from the Austrians taking effect beyond the point where the platoons wheeled for the first leap. So sudden and so miraculous was it all that the Austrian artillerists abandoned their guns instantly, and instead of rushing to the front and meeting the French onslaught, their supports fled in a panic. This Napoleon had counted on in making the bold attack. The contrast between Napoleon's slight figure and the massive grenadiers suggested the nickname little corporal when stephen of colonia fell into the hands of the base assailants they asked him in derision where is now your fortress here was his bold reply 
placing his hand upon his heart. After the Mexican War, General McClellan was employed as a topographical engineer in surveying the Pacific coast. From his headquarters at Vancouver, he had gone on an exploring expedition with two companions, a soldier and a servant, when one evening he received word that the chiefs of the Columbia River tribes desired to confer with him. From the messenger's manner, he suspected that the Indian chiefs meant mischief, and so he warned his companions that they must be ready to leave camp at a moment's notice. Mounting his horse, he rode boldly into the Indian village. About thirty chiefs were holding council. McClellan was led into the circle, and placed at the right hand of Saltees. He was familiar with the Chinook jargon, and could understand every word spoken in the council. Saltees made known the grievance of the tribes. Two Indians had been captured by a party of white pioneers and hanged for theft. Retaliation for this outrage seemed imperative. The chiefs pondered long, but had little to say. McClellan had been on friendly terms with them, and was not responsible for the forest executions. But still, he was a white man, and the chiefs had vowed vengeance against the race. The council was prolonged for hours before sentence was passed, and then Saltese, in the name of the head men of the tribes, decreed that McClellan should immediately be put to death. McClellan said nothing. He had known that argument and pleas for justice or mercy would be of no avail. He sat motionless, apparently indifferent to his fate. By his listlessness, he had thrown his captors off their guard. When the sentence was passed, he acted like a flash. Flinging his left arm round the neck of Saltese, he whipped out his revolver and held it close to the chief's temple. "'Revoke that sentence, or I shall kill you this instant!' he cried, with his fingers clicking the trigger. "'I revoke it!' exclaimed Saltese, fairly livid from fear. "'I must have your word that I can leave this council in safety.' "'You have the word of Saltese!' was the quick response. McClellan knew how sacred was the pledge which he had received. The revolver was lowered. Saltese was released from the embrace of the strong arm. McClellan strode out of the tent with his revolver in his hand. Not a hand was raised against him. He mounted his horse and rode to his camp, where his two followers were ready to spring into the saddle and to escape from the villagers. He owed his life to his quickness of perception, his courage, and to his accurate knowledge of Indian character. In 1856, Rufus Choait spoke to an audience of nearly 5,000 in Lowell, Massachusetts, in favor of the candidacy of James Buchanan for the presidency. The floor of the great hall began to sink, settling more and more as he proceeded with his address, until a sound of crackling timber below would have precipitated a stampede with fatal results, but for the coolness of B. F. Butler, who presided. Telling the people to remain quiet, he said that he would see if there were any cause for alarm. He found the supports of the floor in so bad a condition that the slightest applause would be likely to bury the audience in the ruins of the building. Returning rather leisurely to the platform, he whispered to Showate as he passed, We shall all be in, in five minutes. Then he told the crowd that there was no immediate danger if they would slowly disperse. The post of danger, he added, was on the platform, which was most weakly supported. Therefore, he and those with him would be the last to leave. No doubt many lives were saved by his coolness. Many distinguished foreign and American statesmen 
were present at a fashionable dinner party where wine was freely poured but Schuyler colfax then vice-president of the united states declined to drink from a proffered cup colfax dares not drink sneered a senator who had already taken too much you are right said the vice-president i dare not when grant was in houston many years ago he was given a rousing reception naturally hospitable and naturally inclined to like a man of grant's make-up the houstonites determined to go beyond any other southern city in the way of a banquet and other manifestations of their good will and hospitality they made lavish preparations for the dinner the committee taking great pains to have the finest wines that could be procured for the table that night when the time came to serve the wine the head waiter went first to grant without a word the general quietly turned down all the glasses at his plate this movement was a great surprise to the texans but they were equal to the occasion without a single word being spoken every man along the line of the long tables turned his glasses down and there was not a drop of wine taken that night two french officers at waterloo were advancing to charge a greatly superior force one observing that the other showed signs of fear said sir i believe you are frightened yes i am was the reply and if you were half as much frightened you would run away that's a brave man said wellington when he saw a soldier turn pale as he marched against a battery he knows his danger and faces it there are many cardinals and bishops at worms said a friend to luther and they will burn your body to ashes as they did that of john huss luther replied although they should make a fire that should reach from worms to wittenberg and that should flame up to heaven in the lord's name i would pass through it and appear before them he said to another i would enter worms though there were as many devils there as there are tiles upon the roofs of the houses another man said to him duke george will surely arrest you he replied it is my duty to go and i will go though it rain duke george's for nine days together a western paper recently invited the surviving union and confederate officers to give an account of the bravest act observed by each during the civil war colonel thomas wentworth higginson said that at a dinner at beaufort s c where wine flowed freely and ribald jests were bandied dr minor a slight boyish fellow he did not drink was told that he could not go until he had drunk a toast told a story or sung a song he replied i cannot sing but i will give a toast although i must drink it in water it is our mothers the men were so affected and ashamed that they took him by the hand and thanked him for displaying such admirable moral courage it takes courage for a young man to stand firmly erect while others are bowing and fawning for praise and power it takes courage to wear threadbare clothes while your comrades dress in broad cloth it takes courage to remain in honest poverty when others grow rich by fraud it takes courage to say no squarely when those around you say yes it takes courage to do your duty in silence and obscurity while others prosper and grow famous although neglecting sacred obligations it takes courage to unmask your true self to show your blemishes to a condemning world and to pass for what you really are it takes courage and pluck to be outvoted 
beaten, laughed at, scoffed, ridiculed, derided, misunderstood, misjudged, to stand alone with all the world against you. But they are slaves who dare not be in the right with two or three. An honest man is not the worse because a dog barks at him. We live ridiculously for fear of being thought ridiculous. Tis he is the coward who proves false to his vows, to his manhood, his honor, for a laugh or a sneer. The youth who starts out by being afraid to speak what he thinks will usually end by being afraid to think what he wishes. How we shrink from an act of our own. We live as others live. Custom or fashion, or your doctor or minister, dictates, and they in turn dare not depart from their schools. Dress, living, servants, carriages, everything must conform, or we are ostracized. Who dares conduct his household or business affairs in his own way? and snap his fingers at Dame Grundy. It takes courage for a public man not to bend the knee to popular prejudice. It takes courage to refuse to follow custom when it is injurious to his health and morals. How much easier for a politician to prevaricate and dodge an issue than to stand squarely on his feet like a man as the strongest man has a weakness somewhere, so the greatest hero is a coward somewhere. Peter was courageous enough to draw his sword to defend his master, but he could not stand the ridicule and the finger of scorn of the maidens in the high priest's hall, and he actually denied even the acquaintance of the master he had declared he would die for. Don't be like Uriah Heep, begging everybody's pardon for taking the liberty of being in the world. There is nothing attractive in timidity, nothing lovable in fear. Both are deformities and are repulsive. Manly courage is always dignified and graceful. Bruno, condemned to be burned alive in Rome, said to his judge, you are more afraid to pronounce my sentence than I am to receive it. Anne Askew, racked until her bones were dislocated, never flinched, but looked her tormentor calmly in the face and refused to adjure her faith. I should have thought fear would have kept you from going so far, said a relative who found the little boy Nelson wandering a long distance from home. Fear, said the future admiral. I don't know him. To think a thing is impossible is to make it so. Courage is victory, timidity's defeat. That simple shepherd lad, David, fresh from his flocks, marching unattended and unarmed, save with his shepherd's staff and sling, to confront the colossal Goliath with his massive armor, is the sublimest audacity the world has ever seen. Dent, I wish you would get down and see what is the matter with that leg there, said Grant, when he and Colonel Dent were riding through the thickest of a fire that had become so concentrated and murderous that his troops had all been driven back. "'I guess looking after your horse's legs can wait,' said Dent. "'It is simply murder for us to sit here.' "'All right,' said Grant. "'If you don't want to see to it, I will.' He dismounted, untwisted a piece of telegraph wire which had begun to cut the horse's leg, examined it deliberately, and climbed into his saddle. "'Dent,' he said, "'when you've got a horse,' that you think a great deal of, you should never take any chances with him. 
if that wire had been left there for a little time longer, he would have gone dead lame, and would perhaps have been ruined for life. Wellington said that at Waterloo the hottest of the battle raged round a farmhouse, with an orchard surrounded by a thick hedge, which was so important a point in the British position that orders were given to hold it at any hazard or sacrifice. At last the powder and ball ran short, and the hedges took fire, surrounding the orchard with a wall of flame. A messenger had been sent for ammunition, and soon two loaded wagons came galloping toward the farmhouse. The driver of the first wagon, with the reckless daring of an English boy, spurred his struggling and terrified horses through the burning heap, but the flames rose fiercely round and caught the powder, which exploded in an instant, sending wagon, horses, and rider in fragments into the air. For an instant, the driver of the second wagon paused, appalled by his comrade's fate. The next, observing that the flames, beaten back for the moment by the explosion, afforded him one desperate chance, sent his horses at the smouldering breach, and, amid the deafening cheers of the garrison, landed his terrible cargo safely within. Behind him the flames closed up and raged more fiercely than ever. At the Battle of Friedland, a cannonball came over the heads of the French soldiers, and a young soldier instinctively dodged. Napoleon looked at him and smilingly said, My friend, if that ball were destined for you, though you were to bury a hundred feet underground, it would be sure to find you there. When the mine in front of Petersburg was finished, the fuse was lighted, and the Union troops were drawn up ready to charge the enemy's works as soon as the explosion should make a breach. But seconds, minutes, and tens of minutes passed, without a sound from the mine, and the suspense became painful. Lieutenant Doty and Sergeant Rees volunteered to examine the fuse. Through the long subterranean galleries they hurried in silence, not knowing but that they were advancing to a horrible death. They found the defect, fired the train anew, and soon a terrible upheaval of earth gave the signal to march to victory. At the Battle of Copenhagen, as Nelson walked the deck slippery with blood and covered with the dead, he said, This is warm work, and this day may be the last to any of us in a moment. But, mark me, I would not be elsewhere for thousands. At the Battle of Trafalgar, when he was shot and was being carried below, he covered his face, that those fighting might not know their chief had fallen. In a skirmish at Salamanca, while the enemy's guns were pouring shot into his regiment, Sir William Napier's men became disobedient. He at once ordered a halt, and flogged four of the ringleaders under fire. The men yielded at once, and then marched three miles under a heavy cannonade, as coolly as if it were a review. Execute your resolutions immediately. Thoughts are but dreams until their effects be tried. Does competition trouble you? Work away. What is your competitor but a man? Conquer your place in the world, for all things serve a brave soul. Combat difficulty manfully. Sustain misfortune bravely. Endure poverty nobly. Encounter disappointment courageously. The influence of the brave man is contagious, and creates an epidemic of noble zeal in all about him. Every day sends to the grave obscure men who have only remained in obscurity because their timidity has prevented them from making a first effort, and who, if they could have been induced to begin, 
would in all probability have gone great lengths in the career of usefulness and fame. No great deed is done, says George Eliot, by falterers who ask for certainty. After the great inward struggle was over, and he had determined to remain loyal to his principles, Thomas More walked cheerfully to the block. His wife called him a fool for staying in a dark, damp, filthy prison when he might have his liberty by merely renouncing his doctrines, as some of the bishops had done. But Thomas More preferred death to dishonor. His daughter showed the power of love to drive away fear. She remained true to her father when all others, even her mother, had forsaken him. After his head had been cut off and exhibited on a pole on London Bridge, the poor girl begged it of the authorities and requested that it be buried in the coffin with her. Her request was granted, for her death soon occurred. When Sir Walter Raleigh came to the scaffold, he was very faint, and began his speech to the crowd by saying that during the last two days he had been visited by two org fits. If, therefore, you perceive any weakness in me, I beseech you ascribe it to my sickness rather than to myself. He took the axe and kissed the blade, and said to the sheriff, Tea is a sharp medicine, but a sound cure for all diseases. Don't waste time dreaming of obstacles you may never encounter, or in crossing bridges you have not reached. To half will and to hang forever in the balance is to lose your grip on life. Abraham Lincoln's boyhood was one long struggle with poverty, with little education, and no influential friends. When at last he had begun the practice of law, it required no little courage to cast his fortune with the weaker side in politics, and thus imperil what small reputation he had gained. Only the most sublime moral courage could have sustained him as president to hold his ground against hostile criticism and a long train of disaster, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, to support Grant and Stanton against the clamor of the politicians and the press. Lincoln never shrank from espousing an unpopular cause when he believed it to be right. At the time when it almost cost a young lawyer his bread and butter to defend the fugitive slave, and when other lawyers had refused, Lincoln would always plead the cause of the unfortunate whenever an opportunity presented. Go to Lincoln, people would say, when these hounded fugitives were seeking protection. He's not afraid of any cause if it's right. Then to side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust. Ere her cause bring fame and profit, and tis prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses, while the coward stands aside, doubting in his abject spirit, till his Lord is crucified. Lowell as Salmon P. Chase left the courtroom after an impassioned flea for the runaway slave girl Matilda, a man looked at him in surprise and said, There goes a fine young fellow who has just ruined himself. But in thus ruining himself, Chase had taken the first important step in a career in which he became governor of Ohio, United States senator from Ohio. Secretary of the United States Treasury, and Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. At the trial of William Penn, for having spoken at a Quaker meeting, the recorder, 
not satisfied with the first verdict, said to the jury, We will have a verdict by the help of God, or you shall starve for it. You are Englishmen, said Penn. Mind your privileges, give not away your right. At last the jury, after two days and two nights without food, returned a verdict of not guilty. The recorder fined them forty marks apiece for their independence. What cared Christ for the jeers of the crowd? The palsied hand moved, the blind saw, the leper was made whole, the dead spake, despite the ridicule and scoffs of the spectators. What cared Wendell Phillips for rotten eggs, derisive scorn, and hisses? In him, at last, the scornful world had met its match. Were Beecher and Goff to be silenced by the rude English mobs that came to extinguish them? No, they held their ground and compelled unwilling thousands to hear and to heed. Did Anna Dickinson leave the platform when the pistol bullets of the Molly Maguires flew about her head? She silenced those pistols by her courage and her arguments. What the world wants is a Knox, who dares to preach on with a musket leveled at his head, a garrison who is not afraid of a jail, or a mob, or a scaffold erected in front of his door. When General Butler was sent with nine thousand men to quell the New York riots, he arrived in advance of his troops and found the streets thronged with an angry mob which had already hanged several men to lamp posts without waiting for his men butler went to the place where the crowd was most dense overturned an ash barrel stood upon it and began delegates from five points fiends from hell you have murdered your superiors and the blood-stained crowd quailed before the courageous words of a single man in a city which Mayor Fernando Wood could not restrain with the aid of police and militia. "'Our enemies are before us,' exclaimed the Spartans at Thermopylae. "'And we are before them,' was the cool reply of Leonidas. "'Deliver your arms,' came the message from Xerxes. "'Come and take them,' was the answer Leonidas sent back. A Persian soldier said, You will not be able to see the sun for flying javelins and arrows. Then we will fight in the shade, replied a Lacedaemonian. What wonder that a handful of such men checked the march of the greatest host that ever trod the earth. It is impossible, said a staff officer when Napoleon gave directions for a daring plan? Impossible, thundered the great commander. Impossible is the adjective of fools. The courageous man is an example to the intrepid. His influence is magnetic. Men follow him, even to the death. Men who have dared have moved the world. Often before reaching the prime of life. It is astonishing what daring to begin and perseverance have enabled even youths to achieve. Alexander, who ascended the throne at twenty, had conquered the known world before dying at thirty three. Julius Caesar captured eight hundred cities, conquered three hundred nations, defeated three million men, became a great orator and one of the greatest statesmen known, and still was a young man. Washington was appointed adjutant general at nineteen, was sent at twenty-one, 
as an ambassador to treat with the French, and won his first battle as a colonel at twenty-two. Lafayette was made general of the whole French army at twenty. Charlemagne was master of France and Germany at thirty. Galileo was but eighteen when he saw the principle of the pendulum in the swing lamp in the cathedral at Pisa. Peel was in Parliament at twenty-one. Gladstone was in Parliament before he was twenty-two, and at twenty-four he was Lord of the Treasury. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was proficient in Greek and Latin at twelve, De Quincey at eleven. Robert Browning wrote at eleven poetry of no mean order. Cowley, who sleeps in Westminster Abbey, published a volume of poems at fifteen. Luther was but twenty-nine when he nailed his famous thesis to the door of the bishop and defied the pope. Nelson was a lieutenant in the British Navy before he was twenty. He was but forty-seven when he received his death wound at Trafalgar. At thirty-six, Cortez was the conqueror of Mexico. At thirty-two, Clive had established the British power in India. Hannibal, the greatest of military commanders, was only thirty when, at Cannae, he dealt an almost annihilating blow at the Republic of Rome, and Napoleon was only twenty-seven when, on the plains of Italy, he outgeneraled and defeated, one after another, the veteran marshals of Austria. Equal courage and resolution are often shown by men who have passed the allotted limit of life. Victor Hugo and Wellington were both in their prime after they had reached the age of threescore years and ten. Gladstone ruled England with a strong hand at eighty-four, and was a marvel of literary and scholarly ability. Shakespeare says, He is not worthy of the honeycomb that shuns the hive because the bees have stings. The brave man is not he who feels no fear, for that were stupid and irrational, but he whose noble soul its fear subdues, and bravely dares the danger nature shrinks from. Many a bright youth has accomplished nothing of worth to himself or the world simply because he did not dare to commence things. Begin, begin, begin. Whatever people may think of you, do that which you believe to be right. Be alike indifferent to censure or praise. Pythagoras I dare to do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. Shakespeare For man's great actions are performed in minor struggles. There are obstinate and unknown braves who defend themselves inch by inch in the shadows against the fatal invasion of want and turpitude. There are noble and mysterious triumphs which no eye sees, no renown rewards, and no flourish of trumpets salutes. Life, misfortune, isolation, abandonment, and poverty are battlefields which have their heroes. Victor Hugo Quit Yourselves like men. First Samuel, chapter four, verse nine. End of chapter thirty-seven. Dare. Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland. Chapter 38 of 
Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 38 The Will and the Way. I will find a way or make one. Nothing is impossible to the man who can will. Mirabeau. The iron will of one stout heart shall make a thousand quail. A feeble dwarf, dauntlessly resolved, will turn the tide of battle, and rally to a nobler strife the giants that had fled. Tupper. In the lexicon of youth, which fate reserves for a bright manhood, there is no such word as fail. Bulwer. When a firm and decisive spirit is recognized, it is curious to see how the space clears around a man and leaves him room and freedom. John Foster As well can the Prince of Orange pluck the stars from the sky, as bring the ocean to the wall of Leyden for your relief, was the derisive shout of the Spanish soldiers when told that the Dutch fleet would raise that terrible four-month siege of 1574. But from the parched lips of William, tossing on his bed of fever at Rotterdam, had issued the command, Break down the dikes! Give Holland back to ocean! And the people had replied, Better a drowned land than a lost land. They began to demolish dike after dike of the strong lines, ranged one within another for fifteen miles to their city of the interior. It was an enormous task. The garrison was starving, and the besiegers laughed in scorn at the slow progress of the puny insects who sought to rule the waves of the sea. But ever, as of old, heaven aids those who help themselves. On the first and second of October, a violent quinoctial gale rolled the ocean inland, and swept the fleet on the rising waters almost to the camp of the Spaniards. The next morning the garrison sailed out to attack their enemies, but the besiegers had fled in terror under cover of the darkness. The next day the wind changed, and a counter-tempest brushed the water, with the fleet upon it, from the surface of Holland. The outer dikes were replaced at once, leaving the North Sea within its old bounds. When the flowers bloomed the following spring, a joyous procession marched through the streets to found the University of Leyden in commemoration of the wonderful deliverance of the city. At a dinner party given in 1837 at the residence of Chancellor Kent in New York City, some of the most distinguished men in the country were invited and among them was a young and rather melancholy and reticent Frenchman. Professor Morse was also one of the guests, and during the evening he drew the attention of Mr. Gallatin, then a prominent statesman, to the stranger, observing that his forehead indicated a great intellect. Yes, replied Mr. Gallatin, touching his own forehead with his finger. There is a great deal in that head of his, but he has a strange fancy, can you believe it? He has the idea that he will one day be the Emperor of France. Can you conceive anything more absurd than that? It did seem absurd, for this reserved Frenchman was then a poor adventurer, an exile from his country, without fortune or powerful connections. And yet, fourteen years later, his idea became a fact, his dream of becoming Napoleon III was realized. True, before he accomplished his purpose there were long, dreary years of imprisonment, exile, disaster, and patient labor and hope. But he gained his ambition at last. He was not scrupulous as to the means employed to accomplish his ends, and yet he is a remarkable example of what pluck and energy can do. When Mr. Ingram, publisher of the Illustrated London News, began life as a news dealer at Nottingham, England, he walked ten miles to deliver a single paper rather than disappoint a customer. 
Does any one wonder that such a youth succeeded? Once he rose at two o'clock in the morning and walked to London to get some papers, because there was no post to bring them. He determined that his customers should not be disappointed. This is the kind of will that finds a way. There is scarcely anything in all biography grander than the saying of young Henry Fawcett, Gladstone's last postmaster general, to his grief-stricken father, who had put out both his eyes by birdshot during a game hunt. Never mind, father, blindness shall not interfere with my success in life. One of the most pathetic sights in London streets, long afterward, was Henry Fawcett, M.P., led everywhere by a faithful daughter, who acted as amanuensis as well as guide to her plucky father. Think of a young man, scarcely on the threshold of active life, suddenly losing the sight of both eyes, and yet, by mere pluck and almost incomprehensible tenacity of purpose, lifting himself into eminence in any direction, to say nothing of becoming one of the foremost men in a country noted for its great men. The courageous daughter who was eyes to her father was marvellous example of pluck and determination. For the first time in the history of Oxford College, which reaches back centuries, she succeeded in winning the post which had only been gained before by great men, such as Gladstone, the post of senior wrangler. This achievement had had no parallel in history up to that date, and attracted the attention of the whole civilized world. Not only had no woman ever held this position before, but with few exceptions, it had only been held by men who in afterlife became highly distinguished. Circumstances, says Milton, have rarely favored famous men. They have fought their way to triumph through all sorts of opposing obstacles. The true way to conquer circumstances is to be a greater circumstance yourself. Yet, while desiring to impress in the most forcible manner possible the fact that willpower is necessary to success, and that, other things being equal, the greater the willpower, the grander and more complete the success, we cannot endorse the theory that there is nothing in circumstances or environments, or that any man, simply because he has an indomitable will, may become a Bonaparte, a Pitt, a Webster, a Beecher, a Lincoln. We must temper determination with discretion, and support it with knowledge and common sense, or it will only lead us to run our heads against posts. We must not expect to overcome a stubborn fact merely by a stubborn will. We only have the right to assume that we can do anything within the limit of our utmost faculty, strength and endurance. Obstacles permanently insurmountable bar our progress in some directions, but in any direction we may reasonably hope and attempt to go, we shall find that, as a rule, they are either not insurmountable or else not permanent. The strong-willed, intelligent, persistent man will find or make a way where, in the nature of things, a way cannot be found or made. Every schoolboy knows that circumstances do give clients to lawyers and patients to physicians, place ordinary clergymen in extraordinary pulpits, place sons of the rich at the head of immense corporations and large houses when they have very ordinary ability and scarcely any experience, while poor young men with unusual ability, good education, good character, and large experience, often have to fight their way for years to obtain even very mediocre situations. That there are thousands of young men of superior ability, both in the city and in the country, who seem to be compelled by circumstances to remain in very ordinary positions for small pay, when others about them are raised by money or family influence into desirable places. In other words, we all know that the best men do not always get the best places. Circumstances do have a great deal to do with our position, 
our salaries, our station in life. Everyone knows there is not always a way where there is a will, that labor does not always conquer all things, that there are things impossible even to him that wills, however strongly, that one cannot always make anything of himself he chooses, that there are limitations in our very natures which no amount of willpower or industry can overcome. But while it is true that the willpower cannot perform miracles, yet that it is almost omnipotent and can perform wonders, all history goes to prove. As Shakespeare says, Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Show me a man who, according to popular prejudice, is a victim of bad luck, and I will show you one who has some unfortunate crooked twist of temperament that invites disaster. He is ill-tempered, conceited, or trifling, lacks character, enthusiasm, or some other requisite for success. Disraeli said that man is not the creature of circumstances, but that circumstances are the creatures of men. Believe in the power of will, which annihilates the sickly sentimental doctrine of fatalism. You must, but can't. You ought, but it is impossible. Give me the man who faces what he must, who breaks his birth's invidious bar, and grasps the skirts of happy chance, and breasts the blows of circumstance, and grapples with his evil star. The indomitable will, the inflexible purpose, will find a way or make one. There is always room for a man of force. He who has a firm will, says Goethe, molds the world to himself. People do not lack strength, says Victor Hugo. They lack will. He who resolves upon any great end by that very resolution has scaled the great barriers to it. And he who seizes the grand idea of self-cultivation and solemnly resolves upon it will find that idea, that resolution, burning like fire within him and ever putting him upon his own improvement. He will find it removing difficulties, searching out or making means, giving courage for despondency and strength for weakness. Nearly all great men, those who have towered high above their fellows, have been remarkable above all things else for their energy of will. Of Julius Caesar it was said by a contemporary that it was his activity and giant determination, rather than his military skill, that won his victories. The youth who starts out in life, determined to make the most of his eyes and let nothing escape him, which he can possibly use for his own advancement, who keeps his ears open for every sound that can help him on his way, who keeps his hands open that he may clutch every opportunity, who is ever on the alert for everything which can help him to get on in the world, who seizes every experience in life and grinds it up into paint for his great life's picture, who keeps his heart open that he may catch every noble impulse and everything which may inspire him, that youth will be sure to make his life successful. There are no ifs or ands about it. If he has his health, nothing can keep him from final success. No tyranny of circumstances can permanently imprison a determined will. The world always stands aside for the determined man. The general of a large army may be defeated, says Confucius, but you cannot defeat the determined mind of a peasant. The poor deaf pauper, Kitto, who made shoes in the almshouse, and who became the greatest of biblical scholars, wrote in his journal on the threshold of manhood, I am not myself a believer in impossibilities. I think that all the fine stories about natural ability, etc., are mere rigmarole, 
and that every man may, according to his opportunities and industry, render himself almost anything he wishes to become. Lincoln is probably the most remarkable example on the pages of history, showing the possibilities of our country. From the poverty in which he was born, through the rowdyism of a frontier town, the discouragement of early bankruptcy, and the fluctuations of popular politics, he rose to the championship of union and freedom. Lincoln's will made his way. When his friends nominated him as a candidate for the legislature, his enemies made fun of him. When making his campaign speeches, he wore a mixed jean coat so short that he could not sit down on it, flax and towel linen trousers, straw hat and pot metal boots. He had nothing in the world but character and friends. When his friends suggested law to him, he laughed at the idea of his being a lawyer. He said he had not brains enough. He read law barefoot under the trees, his neighbors said, and he sometimes slept on the counter in the store where he worked. He had to borrow money to buy a suit of clothes to make a respectable appearance in the legislature, and walked to take his seat at Vandalia, one hundred miles. See Thurwo Weed, defying poverty and wading through the snow two miles with rags for shoes, to borrow a book to read before the sap bushfire. See Locke, living on bread and water in a Dutch garret. See Hain, sleeping many a night on a barn floor with only a book for his pillow. See Samuel Drew, tightening his apron string in lieu of a dinner. History is full of such examples. He who will pay the price for victory need never fear final defeat. Paris was in the hands of a mob. The authorities were panic-stricken, for they did not dare to trust their underlings. In came a man who said, I know a young officer who has the courage and ability to quell this mob. Send for him, send for him, send for him, said they. Napoleon was sent for, came, subjugated the mob, subjugated the authorities, ruled France, and then conquered Europe. Success in life is dependent largely upon the willpower, and whatever weakens or impairs it diminishes success. The will can be educated. That which most easily becomes a habit in us is the will. Learn, then, to will decisively and strongly. Thus fix your floating life, and leave it no longer to be carried hither and thither like a withered leaf by every wind that blows. It is not talent that men lack. It is the will to labor. It is the purpose. It was the insatiable thirst for knowledge which held to his task, through poverty and discouragement. John Layden, a Scotch shepherd's son. Barefoot and alone, he walked six or eight miles daily to learn to read, which was all the schooling he had. His desire for an education defied the extremest poverty, and no obstacle could turn him from his purpose. He was rich when he discovered a little bookstore, and his thirsty soul would drink in the precious treasures from its priceless volumes for hours, perfectly oblivious of the scanty meal of bread and water which awaited him at his lowly lodging. Nothing could discourage him from trying to improve himself by study. It seemed to him that an opportunity to get at books and lectures was all that any man could need. Before he was nineteen, this poor shepherd boy with no chance had astonished the professors of Edinburgh by his knowledge of Greek and Latin. Hearing that a surgeon's assistant in the civil service was wanted, although he knew nothing, whatever, of medicine, he determined to apply for it. There were only six months before the place was to be filled, but nothing would daunt him, and he took his degree with honor. 
Walter Scott, who thought this one of the most remarkable illustrations of perseverance, helped to fit him out, and he sailed for India. Webster was very poor even after he entered Dartmouth College. A friend sent him a recipe for greasing his boots. Webster wrote and thanked him, and added, But my boots needs other doctoring, for they not only admit water, but even peas and gravel stones. Yet he became one of the greatest men in the world. Sidney Smith said, Webster was a living lie, because no man on earth could be as great as he looked. Carlyle said of him, One would incline at sight to back him against the world. What seemed to be luck followed Stephen Gerard all his life. No matter what he did, it always seemed to others to turn to his account. Being a foreigner, unable to speak English, short, stout, and with a repulsive face, blind in one eye. It was hard for him to get a start, but he was not the man to give up. He had begun as a cabin boy at thirteen, and for nine years sailed between Bordeaux and the French West Indies. He improved every leisure minute at sea, mastering the art of navigation. At the age of eight he had first discovered that he was blind in one eye. His father evidently thinking that he would never amount to anything, would not help him to an education beyond that of mere reading and writing, but sent his younger brothers to college. The discovery of his blindness, the neglect of his father, and the chagrin of his brother's advancement soured his whole life. When he began business for himself in Philadelphia, there seemed to be nothing he would not do for money. He bought and sold anything, from groceries to old junk. He bottled wine and cider, from which he made a good profit. Everything he touched prospered. He left nothing to chance. His plans and schemes were worked out with mathematical care. His letters written to his captains in foreign ports, laying out their routes and giving detailed instructions, are models of foresight and systematic planning. He never left anything of importance to others. He was rigidly accurate in his instructions, and would not allow the slightest departure from them. He used to say that while his captains might save him money by deviating from instructions once, yet they would cause loss in ninety-nine other cases. He never lost a ship, and many times that which brought financial ruin to many others, as the War of 1812, only increased his wealth. Everybody, especially his jealous brother merchants, attributed his great success to his luck, while undoubtedly he was fortunate in happening to be at the right place at the right time. Yet he was precision, method, accuracy, energy itself, what seemed luck with him was only good judgment and promptness in seizing opportunities, and the greatest care and zeal in improving them to their utmost possibilities. The mathematician tells you that if you throw the dice, there are thirty chances to one against your turning up a particular number, and a hundred to one against your repeating the same throw three times in succession, and so on in an augmenting ratio. Many a young man who has read the story of John Wanamaker's romantic career has gained very little inspiration or help from it toward his own elevation and advancement, for he looks upon it as the result of good luck, chance, or fate. What a lucky fellow, he says to himself as he reads. What a bonanza he fell into! But a careful analysis of Wanamaker's life only enforces the same lesson taught by the analysis of most great lives, namely, that a good mother, a good constitution, the habit of hard work, indomitable energy, determination which knows no defeat, 
decision which never wavers, concentration which never scatters its forces, courage which never falters, self-mastery which can say no and stick to it, strict integrity and downright honesty, a cheerful disposition, unbounded enthusiasm in one's calling, and a high aim and noble purpose, ensure a very large measure of success. Youth should be taught that there is something in circumstances, that there is such a thing as a poor pedestrian happening to find no obstruction in his way, and reaching the goal when a better walker finds the drawbridge up, the street blockaded, and so fails to win the race that wealth often does place unworthy sons in high positions, that family influence does gain a lawyer clients, a physician patients, an ordinary scholar a good professorship, but that, on the other hand, position, clients, patients, professorships, managers, and superintendents' positions do not necessarily constitute success. He should be taught that in the long run, as a rule, the best man does win the best place, and that persistent merit does succeed. There is about as much chance of idleness and incapacity winning real success or a high position in life as there would be in producing a paradise lost by shaking up promiscuously the separate words of Webster's Dictionary and letting them fall at random on the floor. Fortune smiles upon those who roll up their sleeves and put their shoulders to the wheel, upon men who are not afraid of dreary, dry, irksome drudgery, men of nerve and grit, who do not turn aside for dirt and detail. The youth should be taught that he alone is great, who, by a life heroic, conquers fate, that diligence is the mother of good luck, that nine times out of ten what we call luck or fate is but a mere bugbear of the indolent, the languid, the purposeless, the careless, the indifferent, that, as a rule, the man who fails does not see or seize his opportunity. Opportunity is coy, is swift, is gone before the slow, the unobservant, the indolent, or the careless can seize her. In idle wishes fools supinely stay, so there a will and wisdom finds a way. It has been well said that the very reputation of being strong-willed, plucky, and indefatigable is of priceless value. It often cows enemies and dispels at the start opposition to one's undertakings, which would otherwise be formidable. It is astonishing what men who have come to their senses late in life have accomplished by a sudden resolution. Arkwright was fifty years of age when he began to learn English grammar and improve his writing and spelling. Benjamin Franklin was past fifty before he began the study of science and philosophy. Milton, in his blindness, was past the age of fifty when he sat down to complete his world-known epic, and Scott, at fifty-five, took up his pen to redeem a liability of six hundred thousand dollars. Yet I am learning, said Michelangelo, when threescore years and ten were past, and he had long attained the highest triumphs of his art. Even brains are second in importance to will. The vacillating man is always pushed aside in the race of life. It is only the weak and vacillating who halt before adverse circumstances and obstacles. A man with an iron will, with a determination that nothing shall check his career, is sure, if he has perseverance and grit, to succeed. We may not find time for what we would like, but what we long for and strive for with all our strength we usually approximate if we do not fully reach. 
I wish it were possible to show the youth of America the great part that the will might play in their success in life, and in their happiness as well. The achievements of willpower are simply beyond computation. Scarcely anything in reason seems impossible to the man who can will strong enough and long enough. How often we see this illustrated in the case of a young woman who suddenly becomes conscious that she is plain and unattractive, who by prodigious exercise of her will and untiring industry resolves to redeem herself from obscurity and commonness, and who not only makes up for her deficiencies, but elevates herself into a prominence and importance which mere personal attractions could never have given her. Charlotte Cushman, without a charm of form or face, climbed to the very top of her profession. How many young men, stung by consciousness of physical deformity or mental deficiencies, have, by a strong, persistent exercise of willpower, raised themselves from mediocrity and placed themselves high above those who scorned them. History is full of examples of men and women who have redeemed themselves from disgrace, poverty, and misfortune by the firm resolution of an iron will, the consciousness of being looked upon as inferior, as incapable of accomplishing what others accomplish, the sensitiveness at being considered a dunce in school, has stung many a youth into a determination which has elevated him far above those who laughed at him, as in the case of Newton, of Adam Clark, of Sheridan, Wellington, Goldsmith, Dr. Chalmers, Curran, Disraeli, and hundreds of others. It is men like Mirabeau who trample upon impossibilities, like Napoleon, who do not wait for opportunities, but make them, like Grant, who has only unconditional surrender for the enemy, who change the very front of the world. I can't, it is impossible, said a foiled lieutenant to Alexander. Be gone, shouted the conquering Macedonian. There is nothing impossible to him who will try. Were I called upon to express in a word the secret of so many failures among those who started out in life with high hopes, I should say unhesitatingly they lacked willpower. They could not half will. What is a man without a will? He is like an engine without steam, a mere sport of chance, to be tossed about hither and thither, always at the mercy of those who have wills. I should call the strength of will the test of a young man's possibilities. Can he will strong enough and hold whatever he undertakes with an iron grip? It is the iron grip that takes the strong hold on life. The truest wisdom, said Napoleon, is a resolute determination. An iron will without principle might produce a Napoleon, but with character it would make a Wellington or a grant, untarnished by ambition or avarice. The undivided will, tis that compels the elements and rings a human music from the indifferent air. End of chapter 38 The Will and the Way Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 39 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 39 One Unwavering Aim. Life is an arrow, therefore you must know what mark to aim at, how to use the bow, then draw it to the head and let it go. Henry Van Dyke. The important thing in life is to have a great aim, 
and to possess the aptitude and perseverance to attain it. Goethe A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let everyone ascertain his special business and calling, and then stick to it if he would be successful. Franklin Why do you lead such a solitary life? asked a friend of Michelangelo. Art is a jealous mistress, replied the artist. She requires the whole man. During his labors at the Sistine Chapel, according to Disraeli, he refused to meet anyone, even at his own house. This day we sailed westward, which was our course, were the simple but grand words which Columbus wrote in his journal day after day. Hope might rise and fall, terror and dismay might seize upon the crew at the mysterious variations of the compass, but Columbus, unappalled, pushed due west and nightly added to his record the above words. Cut an inch deeper, said a member of the old guard to the surgeon probing his wound, and you will find the emperor, meaning his heart. By the marvellous power of concentrated purpose, Napoleon had left his name on the very stones of the capital, had burned it indelibly into the heart of every Frenchman, and had left it written in living letters all over Europe. France today has not shaken off the spell of that name. In the fair city on the Seine, the mystic N confronts you everywhere. Oh, the power of a great purpose to work miracles! It has changed the face of the world. Napoleon knew that there were plenty of great men in France, but they did not know the might of the unwavering aim by which he was changing the destinies of Europe. He saw that what was called the balance of power was only an idle dream, that, unless some mastermind could be found, which was a match for events, the millions would rule in anarchy. His iron will grasped the situation, and, like William Pitt, he did not loiter around balancing the probabilities of failure or success, or daily with his purpose. There was no turning to the right nor to the left, no dreaming away time, nor building air castles, but one look and purpose forward, upward, and onward, straight to his goal. His great success in war was due largely to his definiteness of aim. He always hit the bull's-eye. He was like a great burning glass, concentrating the rays of the sun upon a single spot. He burned a hole wherever he went. After finding the weak place in the enemy's ranks, he would mass his men and hurl them like an avalanche upon the critical point, crowding volley upon volley, charge upon charge, till he made a breach. What a lesson of the power concentration there is in this man's life. To succeed today, a man must concentrate all the faculties of his mind upon one unwavering aim, and have a tenacity of purpose which means death or victory. Every other inclination which tempts him from his aim must be suppressed. A man may starve on a dozen half-learned trades or occupations. He may grow rich and famous upon one trade thoroughly mastered, even though it be the humblest. Even Gladstone, with his ponderous yet active brain, said he could not do two things at once. He threw his entire strength upon whatever he did. The intensest energy characterized everything he undertook, even his recreation. If such concentration of energy is necessary for the success of a Gladstone, what can we common mortals hope to accomplish by scatteration? All great men have been noted for their power of concentration, which makes them oblivious of everything outside their aim. 
Victor Hugo wrote his Notre Dame during the revolution of 1830, while the bullets were whistling across his garden. He shut himself up in one room, locked his clothes up in another, lest they should tempt him to go out into the street, and spent most of that winter wrapped in a big grey comforter, pouring his very life into his work. Abraham Lincoln possessed such power of concentration that he could repeat quite correctly a sermon to which he had listened in his boyhood. A New York sportsman, in answer to an advertisement, sent twenty-five cents for a sure receipt to prevent a shotgun from scattering, and received the following. Dear Sir, to keep a gun from scattering, put in but a single shot. It is the men who do one thing in this world who come to the front. Who is the favorite actor? It is a Jefferson, who devotes a lifetime to a Rip Van Winkle. A Booth, an Irving, a Keane, who plays one character until he can play it better than any other man living, and not the shallow players who impersonate all parts. The great man is the one who never steps outside of his specialty, or dissipates his individuality. It is an Edison, a Morse, a Bell, a Howe, a Stevenson, a Watt. It is an Adam Smith, spending ten years on the wealth of nations. It is a Gibbon, giving twenty years to his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It is a Hume, writing thirteen hours a day on his History of England. It is a Webster, spending thirty-six years on his dictionary. It is a Bancroft, working twenty-six years on his History of the United States. It is a field, crossing the ocean fifty times to lay a cable, while the world ridicules. It is a Newton, writing his Chronology of Ancient Nations sixteen times. A one-talent man who decides upon a definite object accomplishes more than a ten-talent man who scatters his energies and never knows exactly what he will do. The weakest living creature, by concentrating his powers upon one thing, can accomplish something. The strongest, by dispersing his over many, may fail to accomplish anything. A great purpose is cumulative, and like a great magnet, it attracts all that is kindred along the stream of life. A Yankee can splice a rope in many different ways. An English sailor only knows one way, but that is the best one. It is the one-sided man, the sharp-eyed man, the man of single and intense purpose, the man of one idea, who cuts his way through obstacles and forges to the front. The time has gone forever when a bacon can span universal knowledge, or when, absorbing all the knowledge of the times, a Dante can sustain arguments against fourteen disputants in the University of Paris and conquer in them all. The day when a man can successfully drive a dozen callings abreast is a thing of the past. Concentration is the keynote of the century. Scientists estimate that there is energy enough in less than 50 acres of sunshine to run all the machinery in the world if it could be concentrated. But the sun might blaze out upon the earth forever without setting anything on fire. Although these rays focused by a burning glass would melt solid granite or even change a diamond into vapor, there are plenty of men who have ability enough. The rays of their faculties, taken separately, are all right, but they are powerless to collect them, to bring them all to bear upon a single spot. Versatile men, universal geniuses, are usually weak because they have no power to concentrate their talents upon one point, and this makes all the difference between success and failure. Chiseled upon the tomb of a disappointed, 
heartbroken king, Joseph II of Austria, in the royal cemetery of Vienna, a traveller tells us, is this epitaph. Here lies a monarch who, with the best of intentions, never carried out a single plan. Sir James Mackintosh was a man of remarkable ability. He excited in everyone who knew him the greatest expectations. Many watched his career with much interest, expecting that he would dazzle the world, but there was no purpose in his life. He had intermittent attacks of enthusiasm for doing great things, but his zeal all evaporated before he could decide what to do. This fatal defect in his character kept him balancing between conflicting motives, and his whole life was almost thrown away. He lacked power to choose one object and persevere with a single aim, sacrificing every interfering inclination. He, for instance, vacillated for weeks, trying to determine whether to use usefulness or utility in a composition. One talent utilized in a single direction will do infinitely more than ten talents scattered. A thimbleful of powder behind a ball in a rifle will do more execution than a carload of powder unconfined. The rifle barrel is the purpose that gives direct aim to the powder, which otherwise, no matter how good it might be, would be powerless. The poorest scholar in school or college often in practical life far outstrips the class leader or senior wrangler simply because what little ability he has he employs for a definite object while the other depending upon his general ability and brilliant prospects never concentrates his powers it is fashionable to ridicule the man of one idea but the men who have changed the front of the world would have been men of a single aim no man can make his mark on this age of specialties who is not a man of one idea, one supreme air, one master passion, the man who would make himself felt on this bustling planet, who would make a breach in the compact conservatism of our civilization, must play all his guns on one point. A wavering aim, a faltering purpose, has no place in the twentieth century. Mental shiftlessness is the cause of many a failure. The world is full of unsuccessful men who spend their lives letting empty buckets down into empty wells. Mr. A often laughs at me, said a young American chemist, because I have but one idea. He talks about everything, aims to excel in many things, but I have learned that, if I ever wish to make a breach, I must play my guns continually upon one point. This great chemist, when an obscure schoolmaster, used to study by the light of a pine knot in a log cabin. Not many years later he was performing experiments in electromagnetism before English earls, and subsequently he was at the head of one of the largest scientific institutes of this country. He was the late Professor Henry of the Smithsonian Institution, Washington. We should guard against a talent which we cannot hope to practice in perfection, says Goethe. Improve it as we may, we shall always, in the end, when the merit of the matter has become apparent to us, painfully lament the loss of time and strength devoted to such botching. An old proverb says, The master of one trade will support the wife and seven children and the master of seven will not support himself. It is the single aim that wins. Men with monopolizing ambitions rarely live in history. They do not focus their powers long enough to burn their names indelibly into the roll of honor. Edward Everett, even with his magnificent powers, disappointed the expectations of his friends. He spread himself over the whole field of knowledge and elegant culture, but the mention of the name of Everett does not call up any one great achievement, as does that of names like Garrison and Phillips. 
Voltaire called the Frenchman La Harpe, an oven which was always heating, but which never cooked anything. Hartley Coleridge was splendidly endowed with talent, but there was one fatal lack in his character. He had no definite purpose, and his life was a failure. Unstable as water, he could not excel. Southey, the uncle of Coleridge, says of him, Coleridge has two left hands. He was so morbidly shy from living alone in his dreamland that he could not open a letter without trembling. He would often rally from his purposeless life and resolve to redeem himself from the oblivion he saw staring him in the face. But, like Sir James Mackintosh, he remained a man of promise merely to the end of his life. The man who succeeds has a program. He fires his course and adheres to it. He lays his plans and executes them. He goes straight to his goal. He is not pushed this way and that every time a difficulty is thrown in his path. If he cannot get over it, he goes through it. Constant and steady use of the faculties under a central purpose gives strength and power, while the use of faculties without an aim or end only weakens them. The mind must be focused on a definite end, or, like machinery without a balance wheel, it will rack itself to pieces. This age of concentration calls, not for educated men merely, not for talented men, not for geniuses, not for jacks of all trades, but for men who are trained to do one thing as well as it can be done. Napoleon could go through the drill of his soldiers better than any one of his men. Stick to your aim. The constant changing of one's occupation is fatal to all success. After a young man has spent five or six years in a dry goods store, he concludes that he would rather sell groceries thereby throwing away five years of valuable experience, which will be of very little use to him in the grocery business. And so he spends a large part of his life drifting around from one kind of employment to another, learning part of each, but all of none, forgetting that experience is worth more to him than money, and that the years devoted to learning his trade or occupation are the most valuable half-learned trades, no matter if a man has twenty, will never give him a good living, much less a competency, while wealth is absolutely out of the question. How many young men fail to reach the point of efficiency in one line of work before they get discouraged and venture into something else? How easy to see the thorns in one's own profession or vocation and only the roses in that of another. A young man in business, for instance, seeing a physician riding about town in his carriage, visiting his patients, imagines that a doctor must have an easy, ideal life, and wonders that he himself should have embarked in an occupation so full of disagreeable drudgery and hardships. He does not know of the years of dry, tedious study which the physician has consumed, the months and perhaps years of waiting for patients, the dry detail of anatomy, the endless names of drugs and technical terms. There is a sense of great power in a vocation after a man has reached the point of efficiency in it, the point of productiveness, the point where his skill begins to tell and brings in returns. Up to this point of efficiency, while he is learning his trade, the time seems to have been almost thrown away. But he has been storing up a vast reserve of knowledge of detail, laying foundations, forming his acquaintances, gaining his reputation for truthfulness, trustworthiness, and integrity, and in establishing his credit. When he reaches this point of efficiency, all the knowledge and skill, character, influence, and credit thus gained come to his aid, and he soon finds that in what seemed almost thrown away lies the secret of his prosperity. The credit he established as a clerk, the confidence, the integrity, 
the friendships formed, he finds equal to a large capital when he starts out for himself and takes the highway to fortune, while the young man who half learned several trades got discouraged and stopped just short of the point of efficiency, just this side of success, is a failure because he didn't go far enough. He did not press on to the point at which his acquisition would have been profitable. In spite of the fact that nearly all very successful men have made a life work of one thing, we see on every hand hundreds of young men and women flitting about from occupation to occupation, trade to trade, in one thing today and another tomorrow, just as though they could go from one thing to another by turning a switch, as though they could run as well on another track as on to the one they have left, regardless of the fact that no two careers have the same gauge, that every man builds his own road upon which another man's engine cannot run either with speed or safety. This fickleness, this disposition to shift about from one occupation to another, seems to be peculiar to American life, so much so that, when a young man meets a friend who he has not seen for some time, the commonest question to ask is, What are you doing now? Showing the improbability or uncertainty that he is doing today what he was doing when they last met. Some people think that if they keep everlastingly at it, they will succeed. But this is not always so. Working without a plan is as foolish as going to sea without a compass. A ship which has broken its rudder in mid-ocean may keep everlastingly at it, may keep on a full head of steam, driving about all the time, but it never arrives anywhere, it never reaches any port unless by accident, and if it does find a haven, its cargo may not be suited to the people, the climate, or conditions. The ship must be directed to a definite port for which its cargo is adapted, and where there is a demand for it, and it must aim steadily for that port through sunshine and storm, through tempest and fog. So a man who would succeed must not drift about rudderless on the ocean of life. He must not only steer straight toward his destined port when the ocean is smooth, when the currents and winds serve, but he must keep his course in the very teeth of the wind and the tempest, and even when enveloped in the fogs of disappointment and mists of opposition. Atlantic liners do not stop for fogs or storms. They plough straight through the rough seas with only one thing in view, their destined port, and no matter what the weather is, no matter what obstacles they encounter, their arrival in port can be predicted to within a few hours. On the prairies of South America there grows a flower that always inclines in the same direction. If a traveller loses his way and has neither compass nor chart, by turning to this flower he will find a guide on which he can implicitly rely, for no matter how the rains descend or the winds blow, its leaves point to the north. So there are many men whose purposes are so well known, whose aims are so constant, that no matter what difficulties they may encounter or what opposition they may meet, you can tell almost to a certainty where they will come out. They may be delayed by headwinds and counter-currents, but they will always head for the port and will steer straight towards the harbour. You know to a certainty that whatever else they may lose, they will not lose their compass or rudder. Whatever may happen to a man of this stamp, even though his sails may be swept away and his mast stripped to the deck, though he may not be wrecked by the storms of life, the needle of his compass will still point to the north star of his hope. Whatever comes, his life will not be purposeless, even a wreck that makes its port is a greater success than a full-rigged ship, with all its sails flying, with every mast and every rope intact, which merely drifts along into an accidental harbour. 
to fix a wandering life and give it direction is not an easy task but a life which has no definite aim is sure to be frittered away in empty and purposeless dreams listless triflers busy idlers purposeless busybodies are seen everywhere a healthy definite purpose is a remedy for a thousand ills which attend aimless lives discontent and dissatisfaction flee before a definite purpose what we do begrudgingly without a purpose becomes a delight with one and no work is well done nor healthily done which is not enthusiastically done mere energy is not enough it must be concentrated on some steady unwavering aim what is more common than unsuccessful geniuses or failures with commanding talents indeed the term unrewarded genius has become a proverb every town has unsuccessful educated and talented men but education is of no value talent is worthless unless it can do something achieve something men who can do something at everything and a very little at anything are not wanted in this age what this age wants is young men and women who can do one thing without losing their identity or individuality or becoming narrow cramped or dwarfed nothing can take the place of an all-absorbing purpose education cannot genius cannot talent cannot industry cannot willpower cannot the purposeless life must ever be a failure what good are powers faculties unless we can use them for a purpose what good would a chest of tools do a carpenter unless he could use them a college education a head full of knowledge are worth little to the men who cannot use them to some definite end the man without a purpose never leaves his mark upon the world he has no individuality he is absorbed in the mass lost in the crowd weak wavering and incompetent consider my lord said rowland hill to the prime minister of england that a letter to ireland and the answer back would cost thousands upon thousands of my affectionate countrymen more than a fifth of their week's wages if you shut the post office to them which you do now you shut out warm hearts and generous affections from home kindred and friends the lad learned that it cost to carry a letter from london to edinburgh four hundred and four miles one eighteenth of a cent while the government charged for a simple folded sheet of paper twenty eight cents and twice as much if there was the smallest enclosure against the opposition and contempt of the post office department he at length carried his point and on january tenth eighteen forty penny postage was established throughout great britain mr hill was chosen to introduce the system at a salary of fifteen hundred pounds a year his success was most encouraging but at the end of two years a tory minister dismissed him without paying for his services as agreed the public was indignant and at once contributed sixty five thousand dollars and at the request of queen victoria parliament voted him one hundred thousand dollars cash together with ten thousand dollars a year for life it is a great purpose which gives meaning to life it unifies all our powers binds them together in one cable and makes strong and united what was weak separated scattered smatterers are weak and superficial of what use is a man who knows a little of everything and not much of anything it is the momentum of constantly repeated acts that tells the story let thine eyes look straight before thee ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established turn not to the right hand nor to the left one great secret of saint paul's power lay in his strong purpose 
nothing could daunt, nothing intimidate him. The Roman emperor could not muzzle him. The dungeon could not appall him. No prison suppress him. Obstacles could not discourage him. This one thing I do was written all over his work. The quenchless zeal of his mighty purpose burned its way down through the centuries, and its contagion will never cease to fire the hearts of men. Try and come home, somebody, said his mother to Gambetta, as she sent him off to Paris to school. Poverty pinched this lad hard in his little garret study, and his clothes were shabby. But what of that? He had made up his mind to get on in the world. For years he was chained to his desk and worked like a hero. At last his opportunity came. Jules Favre was to plead a great cause on a certain day, but, being ill, he chose this young man, absolutely unknown, rough and uncouth, to take his place. For many years Gambetta had been preparing for such an opportunity, and he was equal to it. He made one of the greatest speeches that up to that time had ever been made in France. That night all the papers in Paris were sounding the praises of this ragged, uncouth bohemian, and soon all France recognized him as the Republican leader. This sudden rise was not due to luck or accident. He had been steadfastly working and fighting his way up against oppositions and poverty for just such an occasion. Had he not been equal to it, it would only have made him ridiculous. What a stride! Yesterday, poor and unknown, living in a garret. Today, deputy-elect in the city of Marseille, and the great Republican leader. When Louis Napoleon had been defeated at Sedan, and had delivered his sword to William of Prussia, and when the Prussian army was marching on Paris, the brave Gambetta went out of this besieged city in a balloon barely grazed by the Prussian guns, landed in Amiens, and by almost superhuman skill, raised three armies of 800,000 men, provided for their maintenance, and directed their military operations. A German officer said, This colossal energy is the most remarkable event of modern history, and will carry down Gambetta's name to remote posterity. This youth, who was poring over his books in an attic while other youths were promenading, the Champs Elysees, although but thirty two years old, was now virtually dictator of France, and the greatest orator in the Republic. What a striking example of the great reserve of personal power, which, even in dissolute lives, is sometimes called out by a great emergency or sudden sorrow, and ever after leads the life to victory. When Gambetta found that his first speech had electrified all France, his great reserve rushed to the front. He was suddenly weaned from dissipation and resolved to make his mark in the world. Nor did he lose his head in his quick leap into fame. He still lived in the upper room in the musty Latin quarter and remained a poor man without stain of dishonor though he might easily have made himself a millionaire. When he died, the Figaro said, The Republic has lost its greatest man. American boys should study this great man, for he loved our country and took our Republic as the pattern for France. There is no grander sight in the world than that of a young man fired with a great purpose, dominated by one unwavering aim. He is bound to win. The world stands to one side and lets him pass. It always makes way for the man with a will in him. He does not have one half the opposition to overcome that the undecided, purposeless man has 
who, like driftwood, runs against all sorts of snags to which he must yield simply because he has no momentum to force them out of his way. What a sublime spectacle it is to see a youth going straight to his goal, cutting his way through difficulties and surmounting obstacles which dishearten others, as though they were but stepping stones. Defeat, like a gymnasium, only gives him new power. Opposition only doubles his exertions. Dangers only increase his courage. No matter what comes to him, sickness, poverty, disaster, he never turns his eye from his goal. Duos qui secitur lepores neutrum capit. End of chapter 39 One Unwavering Aim Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 40 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 40 Work and Wait What we do upon some great occasion will probably depend on what we already are, and what we are will be the result of previous years of self-discipline. H. P. Lydon I consider a human soul without education like marble in a quarry, which shows none of its inherent beauties until the skill of the polisher sketches out the colors, makes the surface shine, and discovers every ornamental cloud, spot, and vein that runs throughout the body of it. Addison Use your gifts faithfully and they shall be enlarged. Practice what you know, and you shall attain to higher knowledge. Arnold Haste trips up its own heels, fetters and stops itself. Seneca The more you know, the more you can save yourself and that which belongs to you, and to do more work with less effort. Charles Kingsley I was a mere cipher in that vast sea of human enterprise, said Henry Bessemer, speaking of his arrival in London in 1831. Although but eighteen years old, and without an acquaintance in the city, he soon made work for himself by inventing a process of copying bas-reliefs on cardboard. His method was so simple that one could learn in ten minutes how to make a die from an embossed stamp for a penny. Having ascertained later that in this way the raised stamps on all official papers in England could easily be forged, he set to work and invented a perforated stamp, which could not be forged nor removed from a document. At the public stamp office, he was told by the chief that the government was losing one hundred thousand pounds a year through the custom of removing stamps from old parchments and using them again. The chief also fully appreciated the new danger of easy counterfeiting, so he offered Bessemer a definite sum for his process of perforation or an office for life at eight hundred pounds a year. Bessemer chose the office, and hastened to tell the good news to a young woman with whom he had agreed to share his fortune. In explaining his invention, he told how it would prevent anyone from taking a valuable stamp from a document a hundred years old and using it a second time. Yes, said his betrothed, I understand that. 
But surely, if all stamps had a date put upon them, they could not at a future time be used without detection. This was a very short speech, and of no special importance, if we omit a single word of four letters. But like the schoolboy's pins, which saved the lives of thousands of people annually, by not getting swallowed, that little word, by keeping out of the ponderous minds of the British revenue officers, had for a long period saved the government the burden of caring for an additional income of one hundred thousand pounds a year. And the same little word, if published in its connection, would render Bessemer's perforation device of far less value than a last year's bird's nest. He felt proud of the young woman's ingenuity, and promptly suggested the improvement at the stamp office. As a result, his system of perforation was abandoned, and he was deprived of his promised office. The government coolly making use from that day to this, without compensation, of the idea conveyed by that little insignificant word. So Bessemer's financial prospects were not very encouraging, but, realizing that the best capital a young man can have is a capital wife, he at once entered into a partnership which placed at his command the combined ideas of two very level heads. The result, after years of thought and experiment, was the Bessemer process of making steel cheaply, which has revolutionized the iron industry throughout the world. His method consists simply in forcing hot air from below into several tons of melted pig iron, so as to produce intense combustion, and then adding enough Spiegel eisen, looking glass iron, an ore rich in carbon, to change the whole mass to steel. He discovered this simple process only after trying in vain much more difficult and expensive methods. All things come round to him who will but wait. The great lack of the age is want of thoroughness. How seldom you find a young man or woman who is willing to take time to prepare for his life work. A little education is all they want, a little smattering of books, and then they are ready for business. Can't wait is characteristic of the century, and is written on everything, on commerce, on schools, on society, on churches. Can't wait for a high school, seminary, or college. The boy can't wait to become a youth nor the youth a man. Youth rush into business with no great reserve of education or drill. Of course they do poor, feverish work, and break down in middle life, and many die of old age in the forties. Everybody is in a hurry. Buildings are rushed up so quickly that they will not stand, and everything is made to sell. Not long ago a professor in one of our universities had a letter from a young woman in the West, asking him if he did not think she could teach elocution if she could come to the university and take twelve lessons. Our young people of today are not willing to lay broad, deep foundations. The weary years in preparatory school and college dishearten them. They only want to smattering of an education. But, as Pope says, A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep, or taste not, the Pyrian spring. There shallow draughts intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. The shifts to cover up ignorance and the constant trembling, lest some blunder should expose one's emptiness, are pitiable. Shortcuts and abridged methods are the demand of the hour. 
but the way to shorten the road to success is to take plenty of time to lay in your reserve power. Hard work, a definite aim, and faithfulness will shorten the way. Don't risk a life's superstructure upon a day's foundation. Patience is nature's motto. She works ages to bring a flower to perfection. What will she not do for the greatest of her creation? Ages and aeons are nothing to her. Out of them she has been carving her great statue, a perfect man. Johnson said, A man must turn over half a library to write one book. When an authoress told Wordsworth she had spent six hours on a poem, he replied that he would have spent six weeks. Think of Bishop Hall spending thirty years on one of his works. Owens was working on the commentary to the epistle to the Hebrews for twenty years. Moore spent several weeks on one of his musical stanzas, which reads as if it were a dash of genius. Carlyle wrote with the utmost difficulty, and never executed a page of his great histories, till he had consulted every known authority, so that every sentence is the quintessence of many books, the product of many hours of drudging research in the great libraries. Today, Sartor Rosatus is everywhere. You can get it for a mere trifle at almost any bookseller's, and hundreds of thousands of copies are scattered over the world. But when Carlyle brought it to London in 1851, it was refused almost contemptuously by three prominent publishers. At length he managed to get it into Fraser's Magazine, the editor of which conveyed to the author the pleasing information that his work had been received with unqualified disapprobation. Henry Ward Beecher sent half a dozen articles to the publisher of a religious paper to pay for his subscription, but they were respectfully declined. The publishers of the Atlantic Monthly returned Miss Alcott's manuscript, suggesting that she had better stick to teaching. One of the leading magazines ridiculed Tennyson's first poems, and consigned the young poet to temporary oblivion. Only one of Ralph Waldo Emerson's books had remunerative sale. Washington Irving was nearly seventy years old before the income from his books paid the expenses of his household. In some respects, it is very unfortunate that the old system of binding boys out to a trade has been abandoned. Today, very few boys learn any trade. They pick up what they know, as they go along, just as a student crams for a particular examination, just to get through, without any effort to see how much he may learn on any subject. Think of an American youth spending ten years with da Vinci on the model of an equestrian statue that he might master the anatomy of the horse. Most young American artists would expect, in a quarter of that time, to sculpture an Apollo Belvidere. A rich man asked Howard Burnett to do a little something for his album. Burnett complied and charged a thousand francs but it took you only five minutes, objected the rich man. Yes, but it took me thirty years to learn how to do it in five minutes. What the age wants is men who have the nerve and the grit to work and wait, whether the world applaud or hiss. A Mirabeau, who can struggle on for forty years 
before he has a chance to show the world his vast reserve, destined to shake an empire. A Farrago, a von Moltke, who have the persistence to work and wait for half a century for their first great opportunities. A Grant, fighting on an heroic silence, when denounced by his brother generals and politicians everywhere. A Michelangelo, working seven long years, decorating the Sistine Chapel with his matchless creation and the Last Judgment, refusing all remuneration, therefore, lest his pencil might catch the taint of avarice. A Thurlow Weed, walking two miles through the snow with rags tied around his feet for shoes, to borrow the history of the French Revolution, and eagerly devouring it before the sap-bush fire. A Milton, elaborating Paradise Lost, in a world he could not see. A Thackeray, struggling on cheerfully after his vanity fair, was refused by a dozen publishers. A Balzac, toiling and waiting in a lonely garret. Men whom neither poverty, debt, nor hunger could discourage or intimidate, not daunted by privations, not hindered by discouragements. It wants men who can work and wait. When a young lawyer, Daniel Webster, once looked in vain through all the law libraries near him, and then ordered at an expense of fifty dollars the necessary books to obtain authorities and precedents in a case in which his client was a poor blacksmith. He won his case, but, on account of the poverty of his client, only charged fifteen dollars, thus losing heavily on the books bought, to say nothing of his time. Years after, as he was passing through New York City, he was consulted by Aaron Burr on an important but puzzling case, then pending before the Supreme Court. He saw in a moment that it was just like the blacksmith's case, an intricate question of title, which he had solved so thoroughly that it was to him now as simple as the multiplication table. Going back to the time of Charles the Second, he gave the law and precedents involved with such readiness and accuracy of sequence that Burr asked in great surprise if he had been consulted before in the case. Most certainly not, he replied. I never heard of your case till this evening. Very well, said Burr. Proceed. And when he had finished, Webster received a fee that paid him liberally for all the time and trouble he had spent for his early client. Albert Beertstad first crossed the Rocky Mountains with a band of pioneers in 1859, making sketches for the paintings of western scenes for which he had become famous. As he followed the trail to Pike's Peak, he gazed in wonder upon the enormous herds of buffaloes which dotted the plains as far as the eye could reach, and thought of the time when they would have disappeared before the march of civilization. The thought haunted him, and found its final embodiment in The Last of the Buffaloes in 1890. To perfect this great work, he had spent twenty years. Everything which endures, which will stand the test of time, must have a deep, solid foundation. In Rome, the foundation is often the most expensive part of an edifice. So deep must they dig to build on the living rock. Fifty feet of Bunker Hill Monument is underground, unseen and unappreciated by those who tread about that historic shaft. 
But it is this foundation, apparently thrown away, which enables it to stand upright, true to the plumb line, through all the tempests that lash its granite sides. A large part of every successful life must be spent in laying foundation stones underground. Success is the child of drudgery and perseverance, and depends upon knowing how long it takes to succeed. Endurance is a much better test of character than any one act of heroism, however noble. The pianist Thalberg said he never ventured to perform one of his celebrated pieces in public until he had played it at least fifteen hundred times. He laid no claim whatever to genius. He said it was all a question of hard work. The accomplishments of such industry, such perseverance, would put to shame many a man who claims genius. Before Edmund Keane would consent to appear in that character which he acted with such consummate skill, the gentleman villain. He practiced constantly before a glass, studying expression for a year and a half. When he appeared upon the stage, Byron, who went with Moore to see him, said he never looked upon so fearful and wicked a face. As the great actor went on to delineate the terrible consequences of sin, Byron fainted. For years I was in my place of business by sunrise, said a wealthy banker, who had begun without a dollar. And often I did not leave it for fifteen or eighteen hours. Patience, it is said, changes the mulberry leaf to satin. The giant oak on the hillside was detained months or years in its upward growth while its root took a great turn around some rock, in order to gain a hold by which the tree was anchored to withstand the storms of centuries. Da Vinci spent four years on the head of Mona Lisa, perhaps the most beautiful ever painted, but he left therein an artistic thought for all time. Said Captain Bingham, you can have no idea of the wonderful machine that the German army is, and how well it is prepared for war. A chart is made out which shows just what must be done in the case of wars with the different nations, and every officer's place in the scheme is laid out beforehand. There is a schedule of trains which will supersede all other schedules the moment war is declared and this is so arranged that the commander of the army here could telegraph to any officer to take such a train and go to such a place at a moment's notice. A learned clergyman was thus accosted by an illiterate preacher who despised education. Sir, you have been to college, I presume? Yes, sir, was the reply. I am thankful, said the former that the Lord opened my mouth without any learning. A similar event, retorted the clergyman, happened in Balaam's time. A young man just graduated told the president of Trinity College that he had completed his education and had come to say good-bye. Indeed, said the president, I have just begun my education. Many an extraordinary man has been made out of a very ordinary boy, but in order to accomplish this, we must begin with him while he is young. It is simply astonishing what training will do for a rough, uncouth, even dull lad, if he has good material in him, and comes under the tutelage of a skilled educator before his habits become fixed or confirmed. Even a few weeks or months' drill of the rawest 
and roughest recruits in the late Civil War, so straightened and dignified, stooping and uncouth soldiers, and made them manly, erect, and courteous in their bearing, that their own friends scarcely knew them. If this change is so marked in the youth who has grown to maturity, what a miracle is possible in the lad who is taken early and put under a course of drill and systematic training, both physical, mental, and moral. How often a man who is in the penitentiary, in the poorhouse, or among the tramps, or living out a miserable existence in the slums of our cities, rough, slovenly, has slumbering within the rags possibilities which would have developed him into a magnificent man, an ornament to the human race, instead of a foul blot and ugly scar. Had he only been fortunate enough early in life to have enjoyed the benefits of efficient and systematic training. Laziness begins in cobwebs and ends in iron chains. Edison described his repeated efforts to make the phonograph reproduce an aspirated sound, and added, From eighteen to twenty hours a day, for the last seven months, I have worked on this single word, specia. I said into the phonograph, specia, specia, specia. But the instrument responded, Pacia, Pacia, Pacia. It was enough to drive one mad. But I held firm, and I have succeeded. The road to distinction must be paved with years of self-denial and hard work. Horace Mann, the great author of the common school system of Massachusetts, was a remarkable example of that pluck and patience which can work and wait. His only inheritance was poverty and hard work, but he had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and a determination to get on in the world. He braided straw to earn money, to buy books, for which his soul thirsted. Gladstone was bound to win, although he had spent many years of preparation for his life work, in spite of the consciousness of marvellous natural endowments, which would have been deemed sufficient by many young men. Notwithstanding, he had gained the coveted prize of a seat in Parliament, yet he decided to make himself master of the situation, and amid all his public and private duties, he not only spent eleven terms more in the study of the law, but also studied Greek, constantly, and read every well-written book or paper he could obtain, so determined was he that his life should be rounded out to its fullest measure, and that his mind should have broad and liberal culture. Ali Bull said, If I practice one day, I can see the result. If I practice two days, my friends can see it. If I practice three days, the great public can see it. The habit of seizing every bit of knowledge, no matter how insignificant it may seem at the time, every opportunity, every occasion, and grinding them all up into experience, cannot be overestimated. You will find use for all of it. Webster once repeated with effect, an anecdote which he had heard fourteen years before, and which he had not thought of in the meantime. It exactly fitted the occasion. It is an ill mason that rejects any stone. Webster was once urged to speak on a subject of great importance, but refused, saying he was very busy and had no time to master the subject. But, replied his friend, a very few words from you would do much to awaken public attention to it. Webster replied, 
if there be so much weight in my words, it is because I do not allow myself to speak on any subject until my mind is imbued with it. On one occasion, Webster made a remarkable speech before the Phi Beta Kappa Society at Harvard, when a book was presented to him. But after he had gone, his impromptu speech, carefully written out, was found in the book which he had forgotten to take away. Demosthenes was once asked to speak on a great and sudden emergency, but replied, I am not prepared. In fact, it was thought by many that Demosthenes did not possess any genius whatever, because he never allowed himself to speak on any subject without thorough preparation. In any meeting or assembly, when called upon, he would never rise even to make remarks, it was said, without previously preparing himself. Alexander Hamilton said, Men give me credit for genius. All the genius I have lies just in this. When I have a subject in hand, I study it profoundly. Day and night it is before me. I explore it in all its bearings. My mind becomes pervaded with it. Then the effort which I make, the people are pleased to call the fruit of genius. It is the fruit of labor and thought. The law of labor is equally binding on genius and mediocrity. Nelaton, the great surgeon, said that if he had four minutes in which to perform an operation on which a life depended, he would take one minute to consider how best to do it. Many men, says Longfellow, do not allow their principles to take root, but pull them up every now and then, as children do flowers they have planted, to see if they are growing. We must not only work, but also wait. The spruce young spark, says Sizer, who thinks chiefly of his mustache and boots and shiny hat, of getting along nicely and easily during the day, and talking about the theatre, the opera, or a fast horse, ridiculing the faithful young fellow who came to learn the business and make a man of himself because he will not join in wasting his time in dissipation, will see the day, if his useless life is not earlier blasted by vicious indulgences, when he will be glad to accept a situation from the fellow clerk, whom he now ridicules and affects to despise, when the latter shall stand in the firm, dispensing benefits and acquiring fortune. I have been watching the careers of young men by the thousand in this busy city of New York for over thirty years, said Dr. Kyler, and I find that the chief difference between the successful and the failures lies in the single element of staying power. Permanent success is oftener won by holding on than by sudden dash, however brilliant. The easily discouraged are pushed back by a straw, are all the time dropping to the rear, to perish, or to be carried along on the stretcher of charity. They who understand and practice Abraham Lincoln's homely maxim of pegging away have achieved the solidest success. The Duke of Wellington became so discouraged because he did not advance in the army, that he applied for a much inferior position in the customs department, but was refused. Napoleon had applied for every vacant position for seven years before he was recognized, but meanwhile he studied with all his might, supplementing what was considered a thorough military education by researches and reflections which in later years enabled him easily to teach the art of war 
to veterans who had never dreamed of his novel combinations. Reserves which carry us through great emergencies are the result of long working and long waiting. Dr. Collier declares that reserves mean to a man also achievement. The power to do the grandest thing possible to your nature when you feel you must or some precious thing will be lost to do well always but best in the crisis on which all things turn to stand the strain of a long fight and still find you have something left and so to never know you are beaten because you never are beaten he only is independent in action who has been earnest and thorough in preparation and self-culture. Not for school, but for life, we learn. And our habits of promptness, earnestness, and thoroughness, or of tardiness, fickleness, and superficiality, are the things acquired most readily and longest retained. To vary the language of another, the three great essentials to success in mental and physical labor are practice, patience, and perseverance, but the greatest of these is perseverance. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor, and to wait. End of chapter 40 Work and Wait Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 41 of Pushing to the Front by Arisen Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 41 The Might of Little Things. Think not a trifle, though it small appear. Small sands the mountain, moments make the year and trifles, life. Young. It is but the littleness of man that sees no greatness in trifles. Wendell Phillips. He that despiseth small things shall fall by little and little. Ecclesiasticus. The creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. Emerson Men are led by trifles. Napoleon A pebble on the streamlet scant has turned the course of many a river. The bad thing about a little sin is that it won't stay little. Arletta's pretty feet glistening in the brook made her the mother of William the Conqueror, says Paul Graves' History of Normandy and England. Had she not thus fascinated Duke Robert, the liberal of Normandy, Harold would not have fallen at Hastings. No Anglo-Norman dynasty could have arisen. No British empire. We may tell which way the wind blew before the deluge by marking the ripple and cupping of the rain in the petrified sand, now preserved forever. We tell the very path by which gigantic creatures, whom man never saw, walked to the river's edge to find their food. It was little Greece that rolled back the overflowing tide of Asiatic luxury and despotism, giving instead to Europe and America models of the highest political freedom yet attained and germs of limitless mental growth. 
a different result at Plataea would have delayed the progress of the human race more than ten centuries. Among the lofty Alps, it is said, the guides sometimes demand absolute silence, lest the vibration of the voice bring down an avalanche. The power of observation in the American Indian would have put many an educated man to shame. Returning home, an Indian discovered that his venison, which had been hanging up to dry, had been stolen. After careful observation, he started to track the thief through the woods. Meeting a man on the route, he asked him if he had seen a little old white man with a short gun and with a small bobtailed dog. The man told him he had met such a man, but was surprised to find that the Indian had not even seen the one he described, and asked him how he could give such a minute description of the man he had never seen. "'I knew the thief was a little man,' said the Indian, "'because he rolled up a stone to stand on in order to reach the venison. "'I knew he was an old man by his short steps.' I knew he was a white man by his turning out his toes in walking, which an Indian never does. I knew he had a shotgun by the market left on the tree when he had stood it up. I knew the dog was small by his tracks and short steps, and that he had a bobtail by the market left in the dust where he sat. Two drops of rain falling side by side were separated a few inches by a gentle breeze. Striking on opposite sides of the roof of the courthouse in Wisconsin, one rolled southward through the Rock River and the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico, while the other entered successively the Fox River, Green Bay, Lake Michigan, the Straits of Mackinac, Lake Huron, St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, Detroit River, Lake Erie, Niagara River, Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence River, and finally reached the Gulf of St. Lawrence. How slight the influence of the breeze, yet such was the formation of the continent, that a trifling cause was multiplied almost beyond the power of figures to express its momentous effect upon the destinies of these companion raindrops. Who can calculate the future of the smallest trifle when a mud crack swells to an Amazon and the stealing of a penny may end on the scaffold? The act of a moment may cause a life's regret. A trigger may be pulled in an instant, but the soul returns never. A spark falling upon some combustibles, led to the invention of gunpowder. A few bits of seaweed and driftwood, floating on the waves, enabled Columbus to stay a mutiny of his sailors, which threatened to prevent the discovery of a new world. There are moments in history which balance years of ordinary life. Dana could interest a class for hours on a grain of sand, and from a single bone, such as no one had ever seen before. Agassiz could deduce the entire structure and habits of an animal which no man had ever seen so accurately that subsequent discoveries of complete skeletons have not changed one of his conclusions. A cricket once saved a military expedition from destruction. The commanding officer and hundreds of his men were going to South America on a great ship, and, through the carelessness of the watch, they would have been dashed upon a ledge of rock had it not been for a cricket which a soldier had brought on board. When the little cricket scented the land, it broke its long silence by a shrill note, and thus warned them of their danger. By gnawing through a dike, even a rat may drown a nation. A little boy in Holland saw water trickling from a small hole near the bottom of the dike. He realized that the leak would rapidly become larger if the water were not checked, 
so he held his hand over the hole for hours on a dark and dismal night until he could attract the attention of passers-by. His name is still held in grateful remembrance in Holland. The beetling chalk cliffs of England were built by rhizopods, too small to be clearly seen without the aid of a magnifying glass. What was so unlikely as that throwing an empty wine flask in the fire should furnish the first notion of a locomotive, or that the sickness of an Italian chemist's wife and her absurd craving for reptiles for food should begin the electric telegraph. Madame Galvani noticed the contraction of the muscles of a skinned frog, which was accidentally touched at the moment her husband took a spark from an electric machine. She gave the hint which led to the discovery of galvanic electricity, now so useful in the arts and in transmitting vocal or written language. The fate of a nation, says Gladstone, has often depended upon the good or bad digestion of a fine dinner. A stamp act to raise sixty thousand pounds produced the American Revolution, a war that cost England one hundred million pounds, a war between France and England costing more than a hundred thousand lives grew out of a quarrel as to which of two vessels should first be served with water. The quarrel of two Indian boys over a grasshopper led to the Grasshopper War. What mighty contests rise from trivial things! A young man once went to India to seek his fortune, but, finding no opening, he went to his room, loaded his pistol, put the muzzle to his head, and pulled the trigger but it did not go off. He went to the window to point it in another direction and try it again, resolved that if the weapon went off he would regard it as a providence that he was spared. He pulled the trigger, and it went off the first time. Trembling with excitement, he resolved to hold his life sacred, to make the most of it, and never again to cheapen it. This young man became General Robert Clive, who, with but a handful of European soldiers, secured to the East India Company, and afterwards to Great Britain, a great and rich country with two hundred millions of people. The cackling of a goose aroused the sentinels and saved Rome from the Gauls, and the pain from a thistle warned a Scottish army of the approach of the Danes. Henry Ward Beecher came within one vote of being elected superintendent of a railway. If he had had that vote, America would probably have lost its greatest preacher. What a little thing fixes destiny! Trifles, light as air, often suggest to the thinking mind ideas which have revolutionized the world. A famous ruby was offered to the English government. The report of the crown jeweller was that it was the finest he had ever seen or heard of, but that one of the facets was slightly fractured. That invisible fracture reduced the value of the ruby thousands of dollars, and it was rejected from the regalia of England. It was a little thing for the janitor to leave a lamp swinging in the cathedral at Pisa. But in that steady swaying motion, the boy Galileo saw the pendulum and conceived the idea of thus measuring time. I was singing to the mouthpiece of a telephone, said Edison, when the vibrations of my voice caused a fine steel point to pierce one of my fingers held just behind it. That set me to thinking. If I could record the motions of the point and send it over the same surface afterward, I saw no reason why the thing would not talk. 
I determined to make a machine that would work accurately, and gave my assistants the necessary instructions, telling them what I had discovered. That's the whole story. The phonograph is the result of the pricking of a finger. It was a little thing for a cow to kick over a lantern left in a shanty, but it laid Chicago in ashes and rendered homeless a hundred thousand people. Some little weakness, some self-indulgence, a quick temper, want of decision, are little things, you say, when placed beside great abilities. But they have wrecked many a career. The Parliament of Great Britain, the Congress of the United States, and representative governments all over the world have come from King John signing the Magna Charter. Bentham says, the turn of a sentence has decided many a friendship, and for aught we know, the fate of many a kingdom. Perhaps you turned a cold shoulder but once, and made one stinging remark. Yet it may have cost you a friend forever. The sight of a stranded cuttlefish led Cuvier to an investigation which made him one of the greatest natural historians in the world. The web of a spider suggested to Captain Brown the idea of a suspension bridge. A missing marriage certificate kept the hod carrier of Hugh Miller from establishing his claim to the earldom of Crawford. The masons would call out, John, Earl of Crawford, bring us another hod of lime. The absence of a comma in a bill which passed through Congress years ago cost our government a million dollars. A single misspelled word prevented a deserving young man from obtaining a situation as instructor in a New England college. I cannot see that you have made any progress since my last visit, said a gentleman to Michelangelo. But, said the sculptor, I have retouched this part, polished that, softened that feature, brought out that muscle, given some expression to this lip, more energy to that limb, etc. But they are trifles, exclaimed the visitor. It may be so, replied the great artist, but trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. That infinite patience which made Michael Angelo spend a week in bringing out a muscle in a statue, with more vital fidelity to truth, or Gerhard Dow a day in giving the right effect to a dewdrop on a cabbage leaf makes all the difference between success and failure. The cry of the infant Moses attracted the attention of Pharaoh's daughter and gave the Jews a lawgiver. A bird alighting on the bough of a tree at the mouth of the cave where Mahomet lay hid turned aside his pursuers, and gave a profit to many nations. A flight of birds probably prevented Columbus from discovering this continent. When he was growing anxious, Martin Alonso Pinzon persuaded him to follow a flight of parrots toward the southwest, for to the Spanish seamen of that day it was good luck to follow in the wake of a flock of birds when on a voyage of discovery. But for his change of course, Columbus would have reached the coast of Florida. Never, wrote Humboldt, had the flight of birds more important consequences. The children of a spectacle-maker placed two or more pairs of the spectacles before each other in play, and told their father that distant objects looked larger. From this hint came the telescope. Every day is a little life, and our whole life but a day repeated. 
Those that dare lose a day are dangerously prodigal. Those that dare misspend it, desperate. What is the happiness of your life made up of? Little courtesies, little kindnesses, pleasant words, genial smiles, a friendly letter, good wishes, and good deeds. One in a million, once in a lifetime, may do a heroic action. Napoleon was a master of trifles. To details which his inferior officers thought too microscopic for their notice, he gave the most exhaustive consideration. Nothing was too small for his attention. He must know all about the provisions, the horse fodder, the biscuits, the camp kettles, the shoes. When the bugle sounded for the march to battle, every officer had his orders as to the exact route which he should follow, the exact day he was to arrive at a certain station, and the exact hour he was to leave. And they were all to reach the point of destination at a precise moment. It is said that nothing could be more perfectly planned than his memorable march, which led to the victory of Austerlitz, and which sealed the fate of Europe for many years. He would often charge his absent officers to send him perfectly accurate returns, even to the smallest detail. When they are sent to me, I give up every occupation in order to read them in detail and to observe the difference between one monthly return and another. No young girl enjoys her novel as much as I do these returns. Napoleon left nothing to chance, nothing to contingency, so far as he could possibly avoid it. Everything was planned to a nicety before he attempted to execute it. Wellington, too, was great in little things. He knew no such things as trifles. While other generals trusted to subordinates, he gave his personal attention to the minutest detail. The history of many a failure could be written in three words. Lack of detail. How many a lawyer has failed from the lack of details in deeds and important papers, the lack of little words which seemed like surplusage, and which involved his clients in litigation, and often great losses. How many wills are contested from the carelessness of lawyers in the omission or shading of words or ambiguous use of language? Not even Helen of Troy, it is said, was beautiful enough to spare the tip of her nose. And if Cleopatra's had been an inch shorter, Mark Antony might never have become infatuated with her wonderful charms, and the blemish would have changed the history of the world. Anne Boleyn's fascinating smile split the great Church of Rome in twain, and gave a nation an altered destiny. Napoleon, who feared not to attack the proudest monarchs in their capitals, shrank from the political influence of one independent woman in private life, Madame de Stael. Cromwell was about to sail for America when a law was passed prohibiting emigration. At that time he was a profligate, having squandered all his property, but when he found that he could not leave England, he reformed his life. Had he not been detained, who can tell what the history of Great Britain would have been? From the careful and persistent accumulation of innumerable facts, each trivial in itself, but in the aggregate forming a mass of evidence, a Darwin extracts his law of evolution and Linnaeus constructs the science of botany. A pan of water 
and two thermometers were the tools by which Dr. Black discovered latent heat, and a prism, a lens, and a sheet of pasteboard enabled Newton to unfold the composition of light and the origin of colors. An eminent foreign savant called on Dr. Wollaston and asked to be shown over those laboratories of his in which science had been enriched by so many great discoveries. When the doctor took him into a little study and, pointing to an old tea tray on the table, on which stood a few watch glasses, test papers, a small balance, and a blowpipe, said, There is my laboratory. A burnt stick and a barn door served Wilkie in lieu of pencil and paper. A single potato, carried to England by Sir Walter Raleigh in the sixteenth century, has multiplied into food for millions, driving famine from Ireland again and again. It seemed a small thing to drive William Brewster, John Robinson, and the poor people of Osterfield and Scrooby into perpetual exile, but as pilgrims they became the founders of a mighty people. A few immortal sentences from Garrison and Phillips, a few poems from Lowell and Whittier, and the leaven is at work which would not cease its action until the whipping post and bodily servitude are abolished forever. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. And all, says poor Richard, for want of a horseshoe nail. A single remark dropped by an unknown person in the street led to the successful story of the breadwinners. A hymn chanted by the barefooted friars in the temple of Jupiter at Rome led to the famous decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Words are things, says Byron, and a small drop of ink falling like dew upon a thought produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, think. I give these books for the founding of a college in this colony. Such were the words of ten ministers who, in the year 1700, assembled at the village of Branford, a few miles east of New Haven. Each of the worthy fathers deposited a few books upon the table around which they were sitting. Such was the founding of Yale College. Great men are noted for their attention to trifles. Goethe once asked a monarch to excuse him during an interview, while he went to an adjoining room to jot down a stray thought. Hogarth would make sketches of rare faces and characteristics upon his fingernails, upon the streets. Indeed, to a truly great mind there are no little things, trifles light as air suggest to the keen observer the solution of mighty problems. Bits of glass arranged to amuse children led to the discovery of the kaleidoscope. Goodyear discovered how to vulcanize rubber by forgetting, until it became red-hot, a skillet containing a compound which he had before considered worthless. A shipworm, boring a piece of wood, suggested to Sir Isambard Brunel the idea of a tunnel under the Thames to London. Tracks of extinct animals in the old red sandstone led Hugh Miller on and on until he became the greatest geologist of his time. Sir Walter Scott once saw a shepherd boy plodding sturdily along and asked him to ride. This boy was George Kemp, who became so enthusiastic in his study of sculpture 
that he walked fifty miles and back to see a beautiful statue. He did not forget the kindness of Sir Walter, and, when the latter died, threw his soul into the design of the magnificent monument erected in Edinburgh to the memory of the author of Waverley. A poor boy applied for a situation at a bank in Paris, but was refused. As he left the door, he picked up a pin. The bank president saw this, called the boy back, and gave him a situation from which he rose until he became the greatest banker of Paris, Lafitte. A Massachusetts soldier in the Civil War observed a bird hulling rice and shot it. Taking its bill for a model, he invented a hulling machine which has revolutionized the rice business. The eye is a perpetual camera imprinting upon the sensitive mental plates and packing away into the brain for future use every face, every tree, every plant, flower, hill, stream, mountain, every scene upon the street, in fact, everything which comes within its range. There is a phonograph in our natures which catches, however thoughtless and transient, every syllable we utter and registers forever the slightest enunciation, and renders it immortal. These notes may appear a thousand years hence, reproduced in our descendants, in all their beautiful or terrible detail. Least of all seeds, greatest of all harvests, seems to be one of the great laws of nature. All life comes from microscopic beginnings. In nature there is nothing small. The microscope reveals as great a world below as the telescope above. All of nature's laws govern the smallest atoms, and a single drop of water is a miniature ocean. The strength of a chain lies in its weakest link, however large and strong all the others may be. We are all inclined to be proud of our strong points while we are sensitive and neglectful of our weaknesses. Yet it is our greatest weakness which measures our real strength. A soldier who escapes the bullets of a thousand battles may die from the scratch of a pin, and many a ship has survived the shocks of icebergs and the storms of ocean, only to founder in a smooth sea from holes made by tiny insects. Small things become great when a great soul sees them. A single, noble, or heroic act of one man has sometimes elevated a nation. Many an honorable career has resulted from a kind word spoken in season, or the warm grasp of a friendly hand. It is the little rift within the lute that by and by will make the music mute, and, ever widening, slowly silence all. Tennyson It was only a glad good morning, as she passed along the way, but it spread the morning's glory over the livelong day. Only a thought in passing a smile or encouraging word has lifted many a burden no other gift could have stirred. End of chapter 41 The Might of Little Things Recording by Luke Sartor Brisbane, Queensland Chapter 42 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter 42 The Salary You Do Not Find In Your Pay Envelope The quality which you put into your work will determine the quality of your life. The habit of insisting upon the best of which you are capable, of always demanding of yourself the highest, never accepting the lowest or second best, no matter how small your remuneration, will make all the difference to you between failure and success. If the laborer gets no more than the wages his employer offers him, he is cheated. He cheats himself. A boy or a man who works simply for his salary and is actuated by no higher motive is dishonest, and the one whom he most defrauds is himself. He is cheating himself in the quality of his daily work, of that which all the after years, try as he may, can never give him back. If I were allowed but one utterance on this subject, so vital to every young man starting on the journey of life, I would say, don't think too much of the amount of salary your employer gives you at the start. Think, rather, of the possible salary you can give yourself in increasing your skill, in expanding your experience, in enlarging and ennobling yourself. A man's or a boy's work is material with which to build character and manhood. It is life's school for practical training of the faculties, stretching the mind and strengthening and developing the intellect, not a mere mill for grinding out a salary of dollars and cents. Bismarck was said to have really founded the German Empire when working for a small salary as secretary to the German legation in Russia, for in that position he absorbed the secrets of strategy and diplomacy which later were used so effectively for his country. He worked so assiduously, so efficiently, that Germany prized his services more than those of the ambassador himself. If Bismarck had earned only his salary, he might have remained a perpetual clerk, and Germany a tangle of petty states. I have never known an employee to rise rapidly, or even to get beyond mediocrity, whose pay envelope was his goal, who could not see infinitely more in his work than what he found in the envelope on Saturday night. That is necessity, but the larger part of the real pay of a real man's work is outside of the pay envelope. One part of this outside salary is the opportunity of the employee to absorb the secrets of his employer's success and to learn from his mistakes while he is being paid for learning his trade or profession. The other part, and the best of all, is the opportunity for growth, for development, for mental expansion, the opportunity to become a larger, broader, more efficient man. The opportunity for growth in a disciplinary institution, where the practical faculties, the executive faculties, are brought into systematic, vigorous exercise at a definite time and for a definite number of hours, is an advantage beyond computation. There is no estimating the value of such training. It is the opportunity my employee friend, that will help you to make a large man of yourself, which perhaps you could not possibly do without being employed in some kind of an institution, which has the motive, the machinery, the patronage to give you the disciplining and training you need to bring out your strongest qualities. And instead of paying for the opportunity of unfolding and developing from a green, ignorant boy into a strong, level-headed, efficient man. You are paid. 
the youth who is always haggling over the question of how many dollars and cents he will sell his services for, little realizes how he is cheating himself by not looking at the larger salary he can pay himself in increasing his skill, in expanding his experience, and in making himself a better, stronger, more useful man. The few dollars he finds in his pay envelope are to this larger salary as the chips which fly from the sculptor's chisel are to the angel which he is trying to call out of the marble. You can draw from the faithfulness of your work, from the grand spirit which you bring to it, the high purpose which emanates from you in its performance, a recompense so munificent that what your employer pays you will seem insignificant beside it. He pays you in dollars, you pay yourself in valuable experience, in fine training, in increased efficiency, in splendid discipline, in self-expression, in character building. Then, too, the ideal employer gives those who work for him a great deal that is not found in the pay envelope. He gives them encouragement, sympathy. He inspires them with the possibility of doing something higher, better. How small and narrow and really blind to his own interests must be the youth who can weigh a question of salary against all those privileges he receives in exchange for the meagre services he is able to render his employer. Do not fear that your employer will not recognize your merit and advance you as rapidly as you deserve. If he is looking for efficient employees, and what employer is not, it will be to his own interest to do so, just as soon as it is profitable. W. Burke Cochrane, himself a remarkable example of success, says, The man who brings to his occupation a loyal desire to do his best is certain to succeed. By doing the thing at hand surpassingly well, he shows that it would be profitable to employ him in some higher form of occupation, and when there is profit in his promotion. He is pretty sure to secure it. Do you think that kings of business, like Andrew Carnegie, John Wanamaker, Robert C. Ogden, and other lesser powers in the commercial world, would have attained their present commanding success had they hesitated and haggled about a dollar or two of salary when they began their life work? If they had, they would now probably be working on comparatively small salaries for other people. It was not salary, but opportunity that each wanted. A chance to show what was in him, to absorb the secrets of the business. They were satisfied with a dollar or two apiece a week, hardly enough to live on, while they were learning the lessons that made them what they are today. No, the boys who rise in the world are not those who, at the start, split hairs about salaries. Often we see bright boys who have worked, perhaps for years, on small salaries, suddenly jumping, as if by magic, into high and responsible positions. Why? Simply because, while their employers were paying them but a few dollars a week, they were paying themselves vastly more in the fine quality of their work, in the enthusiasm, determination, and high purpose they brought to their tasks, and in increased insight into business methods. Colonel Robert C. Clary, President of the Western Union Telegraph Company, worked without pay as a messenger boy for months for experience which he regarded as worth infinitely more than salary. And scores of our most successful men have cheerfully done the same thing. A millionaire merchant of New York told me the story of his rise. I walked from my home in New England to New York, he said, where I secured a place to sweep out a store for three dollars and a half a week. 
at the end of a year, I accepted an offer from the firm to remain for five years at a salary of seven dollars and a half a week. Long before this time had expired, however, I had a proposition from another large concern in New York to act as its foreign representative at a salary of three thousand dollars a year. I told the manager that I was then under contract, but that, when my time should be completed, I should be glad to talk with him in regard to his proposition. When his contract was nearly up, he was called into the office of the head of the house, and a new contract with him for a term of years at three thousand dollars a year was proposed. The young man told his employers that the manager of another house had offered him that amount a year or more before, but that he did not accept it because he wouldn't break his contract. They told him they would think the matter over and see what they could do for him. Incredible as it may seem, they notified him a little later that they were prepared to enter into a ten-year contract with him at ten thousand dollars a year and the contract was closed. He told me that he and his wife lived on eight dollars a week in New York during a large part of this time, and that, by saving and investments, they laid up one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. At the end of his contract, he was taken into the firm as a partner and became a millionaire. Suppose that this boy had listened to his associates, who probably said to him many times, What a fool you are, George, to work here overtime to do the things which others neglect. Why should you stay here nights and help pack goods, and all that sort of thing, when it is not expected of you? Would he then have risen above them, leaving them in the ranks of perpetual employees, no, but the boy who walked one hundred miles to New York to get a job saw in every opportunity a great occasion, for he could not tell when fate might be taking his measure for a larger place. The very first time he swept out the store, he felt within himself the ability to become a great merchant, and he determined that he would be. He felt that the opportunity was the salary, the chance actually to do with his own hands the thing which he wanted to learn, to see the way in which princely merchants do business, to watch their methods, to absorb their processes, to make their secrets his own. This was his salary, compared with which the three dollars and fifty cents looked contemptible. He put himself into training, always looking out for the main chance. He never allowed anything of importance to escape his attention. When he was not working, he was watching others, studying methods, and asking questions of everybody he came in contact with in the store. So eager was he to learn how everything was done. He told me that he did not go out of New York City for twelve years, that he preferred to study the store and to absorb every bit of knowledge that he could, for he was bound some day to be a partner, or to have a store of his own. It is not difficult to see a proprietor in the boy who sweeps the store or waits on customers if the qualities that make a proprietor are in him, by watching him work for a single day. You can tell by the spirit which he brings to his task whether there is in him the capacity for growth, expansion, enlargement, an ambition to rise, to be somebody, or an inclination to shirk, to do as little as possible for the largest amount of salary. When you get a job, just think of yourself as actually starting out in business for yourself, as really working for yourself. Get as much salary as you can, 
but remember that that is a very small part of the consideration. You have actually gotten an opportunity to get right into the very heart of the great activities of a large concern, to get close to men who do things, an opportunity to absorb knowledge and valuable secrets on every hand, an opportunity to drink in through your eyes and your ears knowledge wherever you go in the establishment, knowledge that will be invaluable to you in the future. Every hint and every suggestion which you can pick up, every bit of knowledge you can absorb, you should regard as a part of your future capital, which will be worth more than money capital when you start out for yourself. Just make up your mind that you are going to be a sponge in that institution, and absorb every particle of information and knowledge possible. Resolve that you will call upon all of your resourcefulness, your inventiveness, your ingenuity, to devise new and better ways of doing things, that you will be progressive, up to date, that you will enter into your work with a spirit of enthusiasm and a zest which knows no bounds, and you will be surprised to see how quickly you will attract the attention of those above you. This striving for excellence will make you grow. It will call out your resources, call out the best thing in you. The constant stretching of the mind over problems which interest you, which are to mean everything to you in the future, will help you expand to a broader, larger, more effective man. If you work with this spirit, you will form a like habit of accuracy, of close observation, a habit of reading human nature, a habit of adjusting means to ends, a habit of thoroughness, of system, a habit of putting your best into everything you do, which means the ultimate attainment of your maximum efficiency. In other words, if you give your best to your employer, the best possible comes back to you in skill, training, shrewdness, acumen, and power. Your employer may pinch you on salary, but he cannot close your eyes and ears. He cannot shut off your perceptive faculties. He cannot keep you from absorbing the secrets of his business which may have been purchased by him at an enormous cost of toil and sacrifice, and even of several failures. On the other hand, it is impossible for you to rob your employer by clipping your hours, shirking your work, by carelessness or indifference, without robbing yourself of infinitely more, of capital which is worth vastly more than money capital the chance to make a man of yourself, the chance to have a clean record behind you instead of a smirched one. If you think you are being kept back, if you are working for too small a salary, if favoritism puts someone into a position above you which you have justly earned, never mind. No one can rob you of your greatest reward, the skill, the efficiency, the power you have gained, the consciousness of doing your level best, of giving the best thing in you to your employer, all of which advantages you will carry with you to your next position, whatever it may be. Don't say to yourself, I am not paid for doing this extra work, I do not get enough salary anyway and it is perfectly right for me to shirk when my employer is not in sight, or to clip my hours when I can. For this means a loss of self-respect. You will never again have the same confidence in your ability to succeed. You will always be conscious that you have done a little, mean thing, and no amount of juggling with yourself can induce that inward monitor which says, Right to the well-done thing and wrong to the botched work, to alter its verdict in your favor. 
there is something within you that you cannot bribe, a divine sense of justice and right that cannot be blindfolded. Nothing will ever compensate you for the loss of faith in yourself. You may still succeed when others have lost confidence in you, but never when you have lost confidence in yourself. If you do not respect yourself, if you do not believe in yourself, your career is at an end so far as its upward tendency is concerned. Then again, an employee's reputation is his capital. In the absence of money capital, his reputation means everything. It not only follows him around from one employer to another, but it also follows him when he goes into business for himself, and is always either helping or hindering him, according to its nature. Contrast the condition of a young man starting out for himself, who has called upon his position as a sacred trust, a great opportunity, backed, buttressed, and supported by a splendid past, an untarnished reputation, a reputation for being a dead-in-earnest hard worker, square, loyal, and true to his employer's interests, with that of another young man of equal ability, starting out for himself, who has done just as little work for his salary as possible, and who has gone on the principle that the more he could get out of an employer, the more salary he could get with less effort, the shrewder, smarter man he was. The very reputation of the first young man is splendid credit. He is backed up by the good opinion of everybody that knows him. People are afraid of the other. They cannot trust him. He beats his employer. Why should not he beat others? Everybody knows that he has not been honest at heart with his employer. Not loyal or true. He must work all the harder to overcome the handicap of a bad reputation, a smirched record. In other words, he is starting out in life with a heavy handicap, which, if it does not drag him down to failure, will make his burden infinitely greater, and success, even a purely commercial success, so much the harder to attain. There is nothing like a good solid substantial reputation, a clean record, an untarnished past. It sticks to us through life, and is always helping us. We find it waiting at the bank when we try to borrow money, or at the jobbers when we ask for credit. It is always backing us up and helping us in all sorts of ways. Young men are sometimes surprised at their rapid advancement. They cannot understand it, because they do not realize the tremendous power of a clean name, of a good reputation, which is backing them. I know a young man who came to New York, got a position in a publishing house at fifteen dollars a week, and worked five years before he received thirty-five dollars a week. The other employees and his friends called him a fool for staying at the office after hours and taking work home nights and holidays for such a small salary. But he told them that the opportunity was what he was after, not the salary. His work attracted the attention of a publisher who offered him sixty dollars a week and very soon advanced him to seventy-five. But he carried with him to the new position the same habits of painstaking hard work, never thinking of the salary, but regarding the opportunity as everything. Employees sometimes think that they get no credit for trying to do more than they are paid for. But here is an instance of a young man who attracted the attention of others. Even outside of the firm he worked for, just because he was trying to earn a great deal more than he was paid for doing. The result was 
that in less than two years from the time he was receiving sixty dollars a week, he went to a third large publishing house at ten thousand dollars a year, and also with an interest in the business. The salary is of very little importance to you in comparison with the reputation for integrity and efficiency you have left behind you and the experience you have gained while earning the salary. These are the great things. In olden times, boys had to give years of their time in order to learn a trade, and often would pay their employer for the opportunity. English boys used to think it was a great opportunity to be able to get into a good concern, with a chance to work without salary for years in order to learn their business or trade. Now the boy is paid for learning his trade. Many employees may not think it is so very bad to clip their hours, to shirk at every opportunity, to sneak away and hide during business hours, to loiter when out on business for their employer, to go to their work in the morning all used up from dissipation. But often when they try to get another place, their reputation has gone before them, and they are not wanted. Others excuse themselves for poor work on the ground that their employer does not appreciate their services and is mean to them. A youth might just as well excuse himself for his boorish manners and ungentlemanly conduct on the ground that other people were mean and ungentlemanly to him. My young friends, you have nothing to do with your employer's character or his method of doing things. You may not be able to make him do what is right, but you can do right yourself. You may not be able to make him a gentleman, but you can be one yourself, and you cannot afford to ruin yourself and your whole future just because your employer is not what he ought to be. No matter how mean and stingy he may be, your opportunity for the time is with him, and it rests with you whether you will use it or abuse it, whether you will make of it a stepping stone or a stumbling block. The fact is that your present position, your way of doing your work, is the key that will unlock the door above you. Slighted work, botched work, will never make a key to unlock the door to anything but failure and disgrace. There is nothing else so valuable to you as an opportunity to build a name for yourself. Your reputation is the foundation for your future success, and if you slip rotten hours and slighted, botched work into the foundation, your superstructure will topple. The foundation must be clean, solid, and firm. The quality which you put into your work will determine the quality of your life. The habit of insisting upon the best of which you are capable, of always demanding of yourself the highest, never accepting the lowest or second best, no matter how small your remuneration, will make all the difference to you between mediocrity or failure, and success. If you bring to your work the spirit of an artist instead of an artisan, a burning zeal, an absorbing enthusiasm, these will take the drudgery out of it and make it a delight. Take no chances of marring your reputation by the picayune and unworthy endeavor to get square with a stingy or mean employer. Never mind what kind of a man he is. Resolve that you will approach your task in the spirit of a master, that whether he is a man of high ideals or not, you will be one. Remember that you are a sculptor, and that every act is a chisel blow upon life's marble block. You cannot afford to strike false blows which may mar the angel that sleeps in the stone. Whether it is beautiful or hideous, divine or brutal, 
the image you evolve from the block must stand as an expression of yourself, of your ideals. Those who do not care how they do their work, if they can only get through with it and get their salary for it, pay very dearly for their trifling. They cut very sorry figures in life. Regard your work as a great life school for the broadening, deepening, rounding into symmetry, harmony, beauty of your God-given faculties, which are uncut diamonds, sacredly entrusted to you for the polishing and bringing out of their hidden wealth and beauty. Look upon it as a man-builder, a character-builder, and not as a mere living-getter. Regard the living-getting, money-making part of your career as a mere incidental, as compared with the man-making part of it. The smallest people in the world are those who work for salary alone. The little money you get in your pay envelope is a pretty small, low motive for which to work. It may be necessary to secure your bread and butter, but you have something infinitely higher to satisfy than that. That is, your sense of the right, the demand in you to do your level best, to be a man, to do the square thing, the fair thing. These should speak so loud in you that the mere bread and butter question will be insignificant in comparison. Many young employees, just because they do not get quite as much salary as they think they should, deliberately throw away all of the other, larger, grander remuneration possible for them outside of their pay envelope for the sake of getting square with their employer. They deliberately adopt a shirking, do as little as possible policy, and instead of getting this larger, more important salary, which they can pay themselves, they prefer the consequent arrested development and become small, narrow, inefficient, rutty men and women, with nothing large or magnanimous, nothing broad, noble, progressive in their nature. Their leadership faculties, their initiative, their planning ability, their ingenuity and resourcefulness, inventiveness, and all the qualities which make the leader, the large, full, complete man, remain undeveloped. While trying to get square with their employer by giving him pinched service, they blight their own growth, strangle their own prospects, and go through life half men instead of full men, small, narrow, weak men, instead of the strong, grand, complete men they might be. I have known employees actually to work harder in scheming, shirking, trying to keep from working hard in the performance of their duties, than they would have worked if they had tried to do their best and had given the largest, the most liberal service possible to their employers. The hardest work in the world is that which is grudgingly done. Start out with a tacit understanding with yourself that you will be a man, that you will express in your work the highest thing in you, the best thing in you. You cannot afford to debase or demoralize yourself by bringing out your mean side, the lowest and most despicable thing in you. Never mind whether your employer appreciates the high quality of your work or not, or thinks more of you for your conscientiousness. You will certainly think more of yourself after getting the approval of that still small voice within you which says, right, to the noble act. The effort always to do your best will enlarge your capacity for doing things and will encourage you to push ahead toward larger triumphs. Everywhere we see people who are haunted by the ghosts of half-finished jobs, the dishonest work done away back in their youth, 
These covered up defects are always coming back to humiliate them later, to trip them up and to bar their progress. The great failure army is full of people who have tried to get square with their employers for the small salary and lack of appreciation. No one can respect himself or have that sublime faith in himself which makes for high achievement, while he puts half-hearted, mean service into his work. The man who has not learned to fling his whole soul into his task, who has not learned the secret of taking the drudgery out of his work by putting the best of himself into it, has not learned the first principles of success or happiness. Let other people do the poor jobs, the botched work, if they will. Keep your standard up. It is a lofty ideal that redeems the life from the curse of commonness and imparts a touch of nobility to the personality. No matter how small your salary or how unappreciative your employer bring the entire man to your task be all there fling your life into it with all the energy and enthusiasm you can muster poor work injures your employer a little but it may ruin you be proud of your work and go to it every morning superbly equipped Go to it in the spirit of a master, of a conqueror. Determine to do your level best, and never to demoralize yourself by doing your second best. Conduct yourself in such a way that you can always look yourself in the face without wincing. Then you will have a courage born of conviction, of personal nobility and integrity which have never been tarnished. What your employer thinks of you, what the world thinks of you, is not half as important as what you think of yourself. Others are with you comparatively little through life. You have to live with yourself day and night through your whole existence, and you cannot afford to tie that divine thing in you to a scoundrel. End of chapter 42 The Salary You Do Not Find in Your Pay Envelope Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland